Welcome to Rabbi Moshe Chaim Luzato's Da'at Tvunat, or The Knowing Hearts. Um, this will be an audio book, word for word, about the philosophy of God's oneness. Um, this is presented as a dialogue between the intellect and the soul. The soul will be read by Rabbi Moshiach Kelati, and I, Michael Kelati, will be reading the intellect. And this goes backwards and forwards. The soul is seeking guidance and advice and wisdom from the intellect. And the intellect will, over this, period, this quite difficult book, will try to describe the philosophy of God's oneness. And uh, since this is an audio book, I'm not going to make, we're not going to make any commentary. We are just going to read the book word for word as it is. And I hope you all enjoy this very special composition. So we start with the soul. I yearn and desire to be resolved concerning some of those matters of which it is written in Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 39 and I quote and return it to your heart that the Lord he is God end quote those principles of our faith the knowledge of which every man is required to pursue to the extent of his understanding the intellect what specifically would you like to know there are 13 central principles of faith which do you wish to consider the soul. I believe in all of the 13 principles without any reservation whatsoever. There are some, however, which I believe and understand well and others which, although I believe them, are not entirely clear to me through understanding and comprehension. The intellect. Which do you hold through belief alone and which through reason as well? The soul. God's existence, his oneness, his eternal endurance, his incorporeality, and his freedom from all the accidents of matter, creatio ex nihilo, prophecy, the prophecy of Moses, the heavenly origin and the eternal immutability of Torah, all of these I believe in and understand, and I require no further explanation of them. But divine providence, reward and punishment, the coming of the Messiah, and the resurrection, I certainly believe in these as articles of faith, but I would like to reach a satisfying understanding of them. The intellect, what makes them difficult to understand? The soul. Those great recurrent happenings which ostensibly always seem to indicate the very opposite of divine providence, God forbid, and how much more does reason seem powerless to fathom the ultimate ends of these occurrences? What does the Lord want of his creatures? Towards what is he leading them? What is the final unfolding of everything? For the acts of God seem so broad that no heart can contain them. I would like you to teach me the proper way to see the rightness of these things, without veering right or left. The intellect. But included in these are some very difficult and deep matters, such as the suffering of the righteous and the prosperity of the wicked, which perplex the greatest of sages and prophets, even Moses, our teacher, which simply cannot be understood. The soul. Those details which I cannot understand, I will not pursue. But let me have at least a cogent understanding of general principles so that I will possess, in any event, some counsel and rationale in the broad spectrum of these matters. And as to what I cannot understand, I will say to myself, the labour is not yours to complete. Intellect. That the Holy One, blessed be He, has founded His universe on justice, and that He conducts it in righteousness and faithful justice, you will find to be absolutely clear beyond any doubt whatsoever, as the faithful shepherd Moses has testified in Deuteronomy 
32 verse 4 and I quote, The rock, his work is complete. For all his ways are justice. A God of truth without wrong. He is righteous and just. The soul. The righteousness of this justice and the depth of this complete design that you've mentioned is what I would like to have clearly explained by you point by point. Intellect. What must first be explained in order to comprehend the desired end in all of this is the idea of man's existence and the task incumbent upon him. The soul. This certainly is a subject which requires careful deliberation if it is to be currently correctly understood in all of its details. Intellect. The prime foundation upon which the entire structure stands is that the Almighty desired that man perfect himself and all that was created for his sake, and this in itself will be his merits and his reward. His merits in that he will have laboured and striven to attain this perfection, which, when achieved, he will enjoy as the fruit of his labour and the prize of all his toil. His reward in that he will finally have attained this perfection and will rejoice in goodliness for all eternity. So, this is a many-faceted foundation, and I wait to hear what you will build upon it, for then I will understand retroactively what it includes. But first I'd like to ask you a general question. Is there any reason as to why the heavenly will desired this? Intellect. The answer is simple and hinges on the answer to a different question, namely, why did the Creator desire a creation? So, give then an answer that applies to both. Intellect, what we can understand here is the following. The blessed Creator is the very essence of good. It is the nature of good to bestow good. That is why the Lord created men so that he could bestow good upon them. For where there is no receiver, there is no bestowal of good. In his sublime wisdom, however, he knew that for this good to be complete, it should be received as the fruits of one's labor. For then the recipient would feel himself the proprietor of that good and would not be shamefaced in receiving it as if he were receiving charity. As it is said, and I quote from Talmud Yerushalmi, all are one three. One who does not eat of his own is ashamed to look at his benefactor. Oh, that makes sense. Please go on. Our introductory remarks have furnished us with a central theme to reflect upon, imperfection and its perfection. Now, we must know the nature of imperfection and its consequences, the manner in which it may be corrected so that the creation is perfected through it the manner in which this correction is implemented and the manner of attaining this correction and its consequences. It appears to me that what should be understood is the nature of the perfection that is achieved when one has completed his task and rested from his labours. For then we could understand retroactively all that has been mentioned. For would not man's ultimate attainment constitute, in effect, what he lacked in the beginning, because of which lack he was constrained to strive for this attainment in the first place. You're right. In our present state, however, we can understand perfection only in a general way and not in detail. In coming to know it in this general manner, though, we shall be able to deduce the original defects in detail. For, whatever the case, any defect will resolve itself into a lack of that perfection. Say then, whatever you can, of that perfection. The perfection I speak of is implicit in scripture and in reason. It is, being joined to the holiness of the Blessed One, and enjoying the apprehension of His glory, without hindrance, barrier, or impediment. In scripture, and I quote from Yeshaya 58, Verse 14, you will then regale in the Lord. And from Psalms 140 verse 14, the just will sit before your countenance. Also from Psalms 16 verse 11, sated with the joys of your countenance. And many, many others in a similar vein. 
The prophets and hagiographs are replete with these for all to see. Consult the book of the Lord and read. And in the words of our sages of blessed memory, from Rachot 17a, in the world to come there is neither eating nor drinking, but the righteous sit with their crowns on their heads and bask in the splendor of the divine presence. In reason, the soul is nothing other than a portion of the Lord on high. Being so, its only desire is to return and cleave to its source and apprehend it, just as it is the nature of any generated object to aspire to its source, and the soul has no rest until it has achieved this union. But as to the exact nature of this attachment and this union, we are powerless to understand this, as long as we are in the midst of imperfection. But this very fact permits us to discriminate our imperfections. For just as we understand that perfection is this union, so we understand that imperfection is any removal from it, and any barrier that comes between ourselves and the Blessed One, which keeps us from uniting with Him as we could in its absence. And this is the defect that we must strive to rid ourselves of in order to attain the aforementioned perfection. Here, however, we are in need of a vital preface. What is it? That the Holy One, blessed be He, could certainly have created man and the entire creation completely perfect. What is more, this is what He would have been expected to do. For inasmuch as He is the quintessence of perfection, it is only natural that His acts be perfect in themselves. But since His wisdom decreed the man be allowed to perfect himself, he created him imperfect, constraining, as it were, his own perfection and his exceeding goodness from manifesting themselves in full measure vis-à-vis -vis these creations. Instead, he shaped them in that format which would further the end desired by his exalted wisdom. And herein is subsumed another idea, as formulated by our sages. Shaddai, the name of the Lord, who said unto his word, die or enough, at the time of creation, the heavens continued stretching outwards until he rebuked them, as it is stated in the Midrash. That is, he certainly could have created more creatures than he did, and he certainly could have made them a far greater size than he did, and if he had desired to have them correspond in magnitude to that of the Creator, they would have no limit, just as there is no limit to him and to his ability, but he created them in accordance with the intended nature of the object. That is, he apportioned them in accordance with the measure and character commensurate with the desired end. In so doing, he circumscribed, as it were, his great, infinite ability, so that it not realize itself in his creatures to its full extent but only within the limits of the creatures generated by it. This must certainly be so, for it is a tenet of our faith that the Blessed Lord is in all, all powerful, and his ability admits of no boundary or limit. And every particular limitation that we noted in his creatures reflects not the extent of his ability, God forbid, but what his will decreed. Let us summarize the principle and then go on to another vital preface. This is the principle. The Blessed Lord, as it were, circumscribed himself. That is, he circumscribed his ability in fashioning his creatures so that they were formed not in accordance with his powers, but in accordance with his desired end. He created them imperfect so that they should perfect themselves and so that their perfection be their reward in the merit of their having laboured for it. All this in his desire to bestow complete good. Now let us hear this preface that you spoke of. We must now understand whence man is to derive the power to perfect the imperfections he was created with. But we are now venturing into a great broad sea but we must deal with many weighty propositions before we come to the end of our subject. 
and you must consider matters patiently in their proper order. For this is the way of wisdom, to acquire ideas one after the other until, in the end, there emerges one complete concept for which all of the prefaces were necessary. Speak your words in their proper order and I will listen with all the necessary patience and deliberation. First, you must know that although we have already said that the Holy One, blessed be He, desired to provide a perception of the grandness of His perfection to His cre creations, it is certain that it is not His intention to provide them with a perception of all His perfection, which has no bounds, limits or end of any kind. But to the contrary, it was His intent to reveal to them only a minute facet of His perfection, the apprehension of which would constitute all of their pleasure, as we have mentioned. And this only stands to reason, for it is impossible for created objects such as we to apprehend all of the perfection of the Holy One, Blessed be He, as it is written in Job 11 verse 7, Will you find the reaches of the Lord? Will you attain to the end of Shaddai? All then that man can attain will not amount to even a drop in the great sea of perfection of the Holy One, blessed be He. This is self-evident to all who are wise of heart, as it has been stated already in Psalms, uh, capital 106, verse 2, Who shall speak of the strength of the Lord? Now, when we consider the entire pattern of the Blessed One's deeds, the greatness of what He has wrought since placing man on earth, and all that He has promised us, through his holy prophets. What emerges clearly from all this is the essential oneness of the Blessed One. It is to be seen that all the other attributes of his unbounded perfection are not clear to us at all, for we lack the power to apprehend them. For example, we know that he is wise, but we cannot plumb the depths of his wisdom. We know that he knows, but we cannot conceptualize his knowledge. It is in this regard that our sages stated in Tikkun Zohar, and I quote, You are wise, but unfathomed by wisdom. You are understanding, but unfathomed by understanding. And since we cannot attain these qualities, it follows that we are forbidden to probe them, falling as they do under the injunction of, and I quote from Chagiga 13a, What is removed from you, do not probe. What is concealed from you, do not seek out. And similarly, in Sefer Yetzirah, one, if your heart runs ahead, return to your place. But as to his oneness, to the contrary, this can become manifest and absolutely clear to us. It follows that it is not sufficient that it be clear to us, but we must transfer this understanding to our heart and implant it there firmly, firmly with no reservation whatsoever. And it is precisely this that Moses, our teacher, commanded us by word of God in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 39. And you shall know this day and you shall return it to your heart, that the Lord is God in the heavens above and on earth below. There is none else. And the mouth of the Most High itself testifies and proclaims that the net sum of all his great workings in this world is the revelation of this absolute oneness, as is stated in Deuteronomy 32 verse 39. See now that I, I am he, and there is no God with me. Now this verse is stated after an account of all that is destined to transpire in the world, all of this being implicit in the Ha'azinu song, as is clear from even a superficial reading of the verses themselves. And the vision concludes, and I quote from Yeshaya 43 verse 10, See now that I, I am he, and in the words of the prophet Yeshaya, it is stated explicitly, so that you will know and believe in me, and you will understand that I am he. Before me, no God was created, and there will, no, will be no other than me. I, I am the Lord, and there is no Saviour beside me. Also from Yeshaya 44 verse 6, I am the first, and I am the last, and there is no God beside me. Furthermore, from Yeshaya 45 verses 6 to 7, 
so that they know from the east of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, that there is no other. I fashion light and create darkness, make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these. Now, so that they know, quote, so that they will know and understand, quote, implies that God wants us to know with knowledge and understanding. And the very sum of all the success that he promises Israel is the manifestation of his oneness in the presence of all. As mentioned countless times in the writings of our prophets of blessed memory, and I quote from Yeshayahu 2, Isaiah 2 verse 11, and the Lord alone will be elevated on that day. Zechariah 49, and the Lord will be king. On that day the Lord will be one, and his name will be one. Zephaniah 3 verse 9, For then I will revert to the nations, so that all will call in the name of the Lord and serve him with one resolve. In sum, our constant daily testimony, and I quote from Deuteronomy 6 verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. It emerges then that all that is really manifest to us is God's consummate, infinite perfection is his perfect oneness. For when we closely scrutinize all that is done under the heavens, we witness the perpetual workings of a uniform process, the end of which is the revelation of this truth alone. We must now understand this oneness and its implication. As scripture states, and I quote from Deuteronomy 4 verse 39, and return it to your heart, that the Lord, he is God. The implication being that this understanding requires judicious consideration and proper counsel. As I have already stated, this is a great wide sea upon which we must set sail with all the fullness of our souls. What understanding is needed for this? Oneness implies that the Holy One, blessed be he, is absolutely one and that there is none beside him. Yes, this is certainly true in general, but there is more to it than that. And this is precisely the intent of the verse in Deuteronomy 4 verse 35. It has been revealed to you that you may know that the Lord is God, there is none beside him. Upon which our sages have commented in Sanhedrin 67b, even as regards witchcraft, that is, when we say that the Holy One, blessed be He, is one, it is not enough that we understand Him to be one in being, i.e. that there is no necessary being but Him, and that there is no creator but Him. But we must also understand that there is no authority or ruler but Him, and no conductor of His world or of any being in His world but Him. And there is no checking of His power or restraining of His will. And all this because of the oneness and absoluteness of his authority. This is the intent of the verse from Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 39. See now that I, I am he, and there is no God with me. I kill and I bring life. I wound and I heal. And there is no escaping my hand. And from Job 23, verse 13. And he is one, and who can turn him aside? And so we acknowledge before him also from Job, chapter 9, verse 12, who can say to him, what will you do? Know this to be a major tenet of our absolute faith, as we shall explain further with God's help. Indeed, the primary import of this understanding is the discountenancing of certain false conceptions which have intruded themselves into the hearts of men, some into the hearts of idol worshippers, some into the hearts of the unlearned population at large, some into the hearts of the Gentiles, and some into the hearts of the first corrupt sinners amongst the Jews. The idol worshippers were two kinds. The first kind regarded the Holy One, blessed be he, as above mundane things and oblivious to them. They regarded others beneath him, such as the stars of heaven and their constellations, their ruling powers and all their hosts, as superintending the affairs of the world. Accordingly, they established forms of worship for them, 
and erected altars to them upon which they slaughtered and offered up sacrifices to call their beneficent influence down upon themselves. The second kind said, God forbid, there are two powers, one working good and the other evil, contending as they did that there was nothing without its opposites, and the Blessed One being the essence of goods, there must be a corresponding deity, the essence of evil. And from these two sources, they said, arise the exigences of this world, some for good and some for bad. This is what is alluded to in the heretic statements to Amemar, and I quote from Sanhedrin 39a, the upper half of man is governed by Hormes, and the lower half by Ahormes. The third conception is that, the, that of the population at large, who see the affairs of this world as proceeding from natural laws implanted by the Creator in terrestrial objects. Accordingly, they regard their own exertion and zeal as the constructive factor, and their own lethargy as the destructive, in the spirit of, and I quote from Deuteronomy 8, verse 17, My power and the strength of my hand have wrought me this gain. They are also given to saying that everything depends upon the stars, that there is one destiny for all, that all is nature, and no more, whether for good or for bad. The fourth conception is that of the Gentiles, who say Israel has sinned, there is no salvation for them in the Lord. They branded them despised currency, saying that God chose them and gave them the choice of being righteous or evil, but they sinned. They thereby prevented the Holy One, as it were, from continuing to benefit them, in accordance with Deuteronomy 32 verse 18, you have weakened the rock of your birth. They forced him to abandon them and exchange them for another nation, it having been impossible for him to save them. The length of the exile ostensibly seems to bear this out and cast fear into the hearts of those who are not strong in the true faith. The fifth conception is that of the corrupt sinners amongst the Jews who recognize their Creator, but presume to rebel against Him, such as Ammon, who said, and I quote from Sanhedrin 103b, Have I any other intention but to anger God? And similarly, Isaiah 3 verse 8, to spite the presence of His glory, thinking as they did, that they could act against God's will, God forbid, and anger Him with their evil acts, as one who angers his friend against his will. Others amongst them, thought to strengthen themselves through magic and charms, and others through a knowledge of the ministering angels and their functions, as in their saying to Jeremiah, and I quote from Midrash Echarabah, by invoking the names of the ministering angels, I will surround Jerusalem with a wall of water, I will surround Jerusalem with a wall of fire. However, one who believes in God's oneness and understands its implications must believe that the Holy One, blessed be He, is one, single and unique, being subject to no impediment or restraint whatsoever, in any manner whatsoever, he, all, he alone dominating all. And not only is there no power contrary to His, God forbid, but He Himself is the creator of good and evil, as stated in Yeshaya. 45.7. I fashion light and create darkness, make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these. There is no other beneath him who exercises any dominion in the world. That is, there is no deputy or secondary power, as the idol worshippers imagine. And what is more, he alone supervises all of his creatures individually and nothing transpires in his world except through his will and agency, not through chance, not through nature, and not through constellation. But he governs all of the earth and all that is in it, decreeing all that it is to be done in the higher and lower spheres, through all of the levels of the entire creation. And it is the very oneness of his dominion which negates the existence of any external force or pressure whatsoever. All of the ordinances and laws which he decreed be subject to his will, and he being entirely independent of them. When he so desires, he subjects his will, as it were, to the deeds of men, as we learnt in Puke Avos, chapter 3, Mishnah 19, 
and all is in accordance with the preponderance of deeds. And when he so desires, he pays no heed whatsoever to deeds, and in his goodness benefits whom he will. As he revealed to Moses a blessed memory, and I quote from Brachot 7a on Exodus 33:19, and I shall be gracious to whom I shall be gracious, though he not be deserving. And also quoted from Job 35 verse 6, If you sin, how will you affect him? And if your offences increase, what will you do to him? And further it is stated in Jeremiah 50 verse 20, The sin of Israel will be sought but not found, for I shall forgive whom I cause to remain. And from Isaiah 48 verse 11, For my sake, for my sake shall I do, for how can it be abided? And also from Yeshaya 43 verse 25, I, I erase your offences for my sake, and I will not bring your sins to mind. And also quoted from Zechariah chapter 3 verse 9, And I will remove the sin of that land in one day. This is our consolation in our affliction, that he will not judge us according to our deeds, and he will not wait for our merits, or exchange us for another nation, because we are wanting in deeds. But because of the oath which he swore, and the covenant which he entered into, even if there is no merit in Israel, when the appointed time comes, the day which he has secreted in his heart, he will save us, beyond any doubts, regardless of the circumstances. For he is the Lord of all, and can do so whenever he desires. What we must believe is, essentially, what we have just stated, namely that since the Blessed One is under no compulsion in his deeds, therefore none of his creatures can assert itself and prevail against him, even though the very laws and ordinances which he himself established. For it is he who fashioned them, and he can alter or annul them at will. This is the intent of the aforementioned statement in Sanhedrin 67b. There is none beside him, even as regards witchcraft. For even though in the celestial system which God desired and established, witchcraft refutes the heavenly retinue, still, whenever he wills it, he can assert his dominance and annul it, the witchcraft, as if it never existed contrary to the conception of those fools who fancied themselves capable of using his very tools against him, God forbid. They were made to realize the falsity and ineffectuality of their devices. He is the Lord of all, and there is none beside him. This we must accept as an article of faith, but it is the affirmation, affirmation of this truth which is manifest in all of his deeds, creation and assurances, as heretofore explained, it emerges then that the revelation of this oneness is what was desired by the heavenly will. It is in accordance with this intent that he formulated the laws of his creations and everything that he caused to happen is what is necessary for the realization of this end. Thus we can very well say that the entire universe and all that we can understand of it all of it depends and rests upon the idea of the perfect oneness of the Blessed One, which he wished to make manifest before the eyes of his creations. A corollary of this is that when we understand what the revelation of his oneness inheres in, we shall likewise understand the laws of his creations, how they are structured and on what principles they rest. And it shall be explained further, with God's help, that from the Lord's desire to structure and govern his world along these lines, derives the entire system of man's imperfection, the perfecting of his service, and the receiving of his reward, something which derives from no other order. This I am anxiously awaiting to hear, how all of this derives from the revelation of his oneness. What we must understand well is the idea of the defects found in nature, of the evils found in it, which are not in accordance with God's perfection, and because of which the sinners went astray, each in his own way, as explained before. For certainly, considering God's perfection, he should do only good alone, 
I will therefore now clarify this for you with the help of God. When we say that God is one, we thereby understand that there is none beside him, that he has no counterpart, that none can deter him, as opposed to all of the other misconceptions we have mentioned. It follows that it is not sufficient to attribute goodness to God, but that it is necessary, in addition, to disassociate its opposite from him. But all the other qualities we may think of are not defined in terms of opposites at all. For example, the idea of foolishness does not enter into the definition of wisdom, the latter being understood as the mind being replete with the properly founded ideas. Evil does not enter into the definition of saintliness, which is understood as the doing of good in respect to all. Oneness, however, does lend itself to definition by opposite, vis-à-vis -vis the absence of plurality, so that the other qualities are defined in terms of the affirmation of the good in itself and oneness in terms of the negation of evil. You see then that if the Holy One, blessed be He, desires to reveal all of the other qualities of His perfection, since they are all qualities of goodness, they are defined only in terms of the affirmation of good, and their revelation could not involve the manifestation of evil. But in His desire to reveal His oneness, in which is subsumed the negation of evil, it was possible to create evil and deny to it the absolute existence and dominion so that the full spectrum of this quality would be manifest. And do not take issue with me by contending that to make wisdom manifest it is likewise necessary to reveal ignorance and to make saintliness manifest to reveal cruelty, equality being understood only through its opposites. For we must understand that every variety of goodness can be understood entirely as a quality of goodness in itself. The negation of the opposite of these qualities entering it not at all into their definition, but all of these together are subsumed under the definition of oneness, the negation of aught beside him. They are all of this variety, and one who would understand must not confuse the varieties of one type with those of another. <clears throat> Unquestionably, Understanding depends upon discrimination, and all categories and varieties must be distinguished one from the other, so that they and their ramifications may be understood. And although the supreme intelligence is not of the nature of the human mind, so that these distinctions would properly relate to it, still we are human beings, and we must speak as human beings. I will go even beyond what you have said. It is certain. The Holy One, blessed be He, in His omnipotence, would have created the world in such a manner that we would perceive in His creation neither subsequence nor antecedents, neither cause nor effect. And if He had wrought thus, the mouths of all men would be muzzled, unable to utter anything in respect to any of His deeds, for it would be impossible for us to have the least understanding of His ways his omnipotence being above all our intellects and alien to man, whose mind is bounded within the specific laws of its nature. But since the supreme will desired that men understand somewhat of his ways and acts, and even more so that they exert themselves to this end and ardently pursue it, he chose to act in the manner of men, that is, in a perceptible, comprehensible order. In sum, he sought to adapt his deeds to the intellects of his creatures and not to his own intellect. He therefore gave us an, an area within which we could reflect upon them and understand at least something if not a great deal. This is corroborated by the scriptural account of the creation where he testifies about himself that he created his universe with a division of times, with distinctive injunctions, in the order he desired, and not simultaneously or through one injunction, in which manner it could have been created. This being so, it devolves upon us to reflect discriminately upon all of his acts and their reasons, and certainly upon what they give rise to, all of the types, varieties and individual details according to the entire order indigenous to man. 
and we turn into our subject and we speak of oneness, you understand us to mean thereby the negation of anything other than it. And this emerges as a general principle governing all of the infinite qualities of his perfection. That is, in respect to any quality and perfection that he possesses, it is always to be understood that there is none but him, and he has no counterpart, and that there is none who can deter him, all of this being subsumed in oneness, as we have explained. Two corollaries are to be adduced from this introduction. The first, is, as we have already explained, that in respect to no quality but his oneness, can we speak of God's creating anything opposite to his perfection, that is, when he desires to reveal the quality of his oneness and to make it vividly manifest, as conveyed previously in all of its aspects. The second corollary, relative to this quality of perfect oneness, all of the other qualities stand in relationship of specific to general, for it reflects upon all of them. For it is axiomatic with us that in every facet of his infinite perfection he is the very essence of oneness, there being none but him, none opposite to him, and none to deter him as we have explained. This truth is rooted in the truth of his necessary existence, which constitutes the basis of all that we can say about his perfection, and likewise of all that we cannot say, namely, that to him alone is to be attributed necessary existence, that he must be, and that he alone must be, as is obvious to all of the holy faith. The implications of this idea will be explored further. It should be clear to you now, what I have spoken of previously, how the quality of oneness is distinct from all of the other qualities of perfection, it being the core of the system of defect and perfection, divine service and reward. For if the Supreme Will desired only to reveal qualities of his perfection, he would have wrought only perfected deeds in accordance with the particular perfection he wished to reveal and it would have been inappropriate for those deeds to partake of any imperfection whatsoever, as we have explained above, for the manifestation of no other quality but that of oneness lends itself to the revelation of defects. And if there were no defects, there would be no room for divine service by man and no room for his receiving rewards. But when he chose his oneness as what he would reveal of his perfection, a consequence of this was that there would be imperfections in his creations, it being necessary to reveal imperfection to extenuate its negation. This, however, does not constitute the ultimate manifestation of his oneness, which will obtain only when imperfection will in truth be annulled through the power of his perfection, and all will be perfected in the might of his solely reigning good. It is then that his oneness will be considered as having been revealed in actuality. A necessary implication of this is that though their creations are imperfect, their defects are not permanent, but temporary defects, which will assuredly be removed, although there are many ways to remove them. Now understand the root of all of this, that imperfection arises only from God's concealing his countenance from his unwillingness that it shine immediately upon his creations at the very outset and render them perfect from the start. On the contrary, he concealed his countenance from them and rendered them imperfect, for the light of the king's countenance is life, in truth, and its concealment the source of all evil, as we shall explain further with God's help. But since the intent behind the concealment of this light is not that it remained concealed, but on the contrary, that it ultimately be revealed and dissipate all of the evil that resulted from its very concealment. He established it for himself as a firm and fixed resolve to reveal his hidden goodness. This may be achieved through the agency of man's deeds, that is, through the carrying out of the laws and teachings which God set down for us in his Torah of truth which, if a man keep them, will gain him eternal life. For the reward of a mitzvah is a mitzvah. The radiance of the Blessed One's countenance, which he hid from man in the beginning of his creation, 
Man was thus born to labour, invested with a reigning evil inclination and weighed down by the evil of all kinds of imperfections and by his distance from the light of life. It is the performance of mitzvot which sheds upon him the secreted light, so that when he has fulfilled the complements of his mitzvot, he will so have perfected himself through them as to bask in this light of life. But even if he is not upright, the heavenly oneness will still desire to reveal itself, for he will not conceal his visage from his world forever, but he will assert his rule over inveterate sinners with unleashed wrath, and they will bear the burden of their sins until, and I quote, sinners cease from the earth, or until they humble their uncircumcised hearts and repent and live. What is more, in view of the fact that this concealment of countenance presupposes its ultimate revelation in God's returning us to him in mercy, even this freedom of choice which he allows us now, so that we are always suspended between beneficence and retribution relative to the preponderance of our deeds, even this state will not endure forever, but only for as long as the supreme intelligence deemed necessary and sufficient for the perfection of all the souls that he created, whether through righteousness, repentance, or the undergoing of affliction. And this time period, according to our sages, quoted from Rosh Hashanah 31a and Sanhedrin 97a, is 6,000 years, after which he will renew his world. In this new world, men will be like angels, and not like asses. They will be purged of this gross material nature and of its evil concomitants, the evil inclination and all that derives from it. And even in respect to the period of the Messiah before the end of the 6,000 years, it is written in Ezekiel 36 verse 26, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and I will cause you to walk in my statutes. And our sages have also said in Shabbat 151b, <clears throat> years of which you will say, I have no desire in them. This is the period of the Messiah, wherein there is neither merit nor fault. This stands to reason, for when man is to be cleansed of the evil inclination, his divine service will become a natural necessity, for which he will deserve no commendation whatsoever. However, it is dictated by the nature of the Supreme Oneness, in order to manifest the might of its complete sovereign sway, that, as long as he desires, the earth is to be left to the vicissitudes of time, while evil holds sway in the world. And what is more, he does not constrain this evil from doing all that is in its power to do, even if his creations thereby descend to the nethermost level. In spite of this, however, his world will not go lost, for his alone is the rain. It is he who does and bears and strikes and heals, and there is none besides him. And this is a strong bolster to the faith of the Jews, that their hearts not weaken, neither from the length of the exile nor from its severe bitterness. For indeed, the Holy One, blessed be he, has allowed evil to do all that is in its power to do, as we have explained. And in the end, the more forcefully evil brings itself to bear against men, the more manifest will be the strength of God's oneness and the omnipotent sway of his reign. And from the very depths of our more many sore trials, the salvation will most assuredly spring in the greatness of his might. It is true that men could be meritorious in their deeds, recognize the truth, and abandon the deceitful paths of this world, and their desire to draw near to their Creator, and all this through their realization that everything opposed to the way decreed by God is of the category of evil decreed by the supreme will and created by the concealment of the visage of His goodness. They would thus despise this visual deception and choose the hidden secreted light, the light of the face of the King of Life. And if they did so, God's oneness would be revealed to them in their own rights so that they would be hastening their own salvation. 
the Holy One, blessed be He, would then have no need of revealing His oneness to them through the difficulty and length of the exile. For since they would have perceived the truth by themselves, this would be sufficient. If it is perceived, it, it is perceived. For since they would have seen and recognized the evil and abandoned it, embracing the truth of his oneness, what was necessary would have been done. But the entire intent was that this truth become manifest to them, so that they thenceforward they could bask in the truth that had been revealed to them. If so, when it is revealed, it is revealed. It is to be noted that what we have spoken of previously is very much descriptive of Adam's situation. Understand this well. The Holy One, blessed be He, had created the world with the dimension of good alone, completely without that of evil. The mind could not at all conceptualize evil, and consequently could not gain a perfect comprehension of oneness, as we have explained. But since evil has been created, the mind is able to conceptualize it and, through it, to recognize true oneness. Adam, indeed, perceived evil, this in the form of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that the Holy One, blessed be he, forbade him to him. In spite of this, his eyes deceived him into regarding the tree as appealing to the eye, appetizing to the palate, and desirable for the acquisition of knowledge, as it is written in Genesis 3.6, and the woman saw. It emerges then, he saw immediately that there was room to err by saying, God forbid, that there are two ruling powers, or by embracing any of the other evil conceptions proposed to him by the serpents. Now, the truth is, Adam was extremely wise and should have employed his wisdom to analyze the matter properly. What is more, he already knew it as a truth, by virtue of this wisdom, that everything he saw contradicting what, was the blessed, what the Blessed One had made known to him regarding the truth of perfection was nothing more than deceitful falsehood pertaining to the category of evil that he had created to demonstrate the truth of his oneness and to test man himself in order to invest him with merit. And if he had remained steadfast in his faith and had not been led astray by his evil inclination, but, to the contrary, had strengthened this faith of his heart, in his heart, he would have been accounted as having attained to the supreme oneness. For he had already seen and conceptualized evil, and had also apprehended through his wisdom that all evil had been created by God only for his honor. It would have been sufficient if he had strengthened himself in this faith and not transgressed God's commandments and this only until Sabbath Eve, as our sages relate. For then the Holy One, blessed be He, would have done in one day what He has done, what He does now in 6,000 years. That is, He would have ultimately have shown Him in actuality that what He believed of His oneness was true. For in one moment He would have removed all evil from the world. But Adam was led astray in the beginning by his lust and desire, and in turn invented rationalizations to smooth his way, very much along the lines reminiscent of our sages' pronouncement in Sanhedrin 63b, Israel embarked upon idol worship only to permit themselves forbidden relations openly. And in a similar vein in Sanhedrin 38b, Adam was a heretic. It thus became necessary to show him indeed what he had not choose, what he did not choose to perceive through reason, the true nature of evil, and to impress upon him that even though it was given such a large area of freedom, ultimately all would return to the reign of the one good. And all of this is embodied in the hardships of the world, which were decreed upon him so that he would eventually espouse the belief that he could not sustain in the beginning. Thus, it would be revealed to him empirically and in detail what he could have apprehended and perceived immediately in the beginning. The same applies to his descendants after him. If they desired to apprehend this idea and to fix it in their souls by means of reason, it would have been sufficient, for it is only necessary that they know it and they would know it. If it is clear, it is clear, but since men 
not been upright in their deeds, but, to the contrary, have pursued the deceptions of their eyes with respect to all of the evil misconceptions that we mentioned previously, the Holy One, blessed be He, must reveal to them what they could not conceive of by themselves. And this, in effect, is the orientation of the exile, wherein he has concealed his countenance more and more, so that evil has asserted itself to the fullest extent. As stated by our sages in Sota 49a, there is no day whose blessing, or euphemism for curse, is not greater than that of the day before. And in the end, suddenly, the one blessed Lord will return to his sanctuary, the glory of God will be revealed, and all flesh will see it together. And now, because of the magnitude of the concealment of his countenance, knowledge has deteriorated and all deeds are defective as, through the same cause, the creations themselves have undergone deterioration and diminution, as stated in Sota 48a. The flavour of fruits has been lost, along with all of the other sad occurrences that our sages have related to us and which we see with our own eyes. The earth is empty and void, and our sages have stated in Sotar 49b, audacity will prevail and dearness will soar. All of these are aspects of the intensification of the great evil. Yet, when the glory of God is revealed, all minds will return to the proper path. All deeds will be perfected as in the beginning, and men will cleave to their Creator, as it is written in Joel 3.1. I will spill out my spirits on all flesh. And also in Jeremiah 31 verse 33, And a man will no longer teach his neighbour, saying, Know the Lord, for all will know me, from small to great. And the universal aspiration will be to be sanctified in the holiness of the Blessed One, as it is written in Yeshaya 2, 3. And many nations will go and say, Let us go and ascend the mountain of the Lord. Let him teach us his ways, and let us walk in his paths. And this will give rise to the amelioration of nature as a whole. As it is written in Psalm 72 verse 16, grain will be abundant in the land, in the peaks of the mountains, and in Yeshaya 11.6, and the wolf will dwell with the lamb. In summation, when the supreme will chose to pursue this path, he allowed room for all that was necessary for the true perfection of his creatures. For, in concealing his countenance, he has left room for imperfection. And in leaving room for imperfection, he has left room for the divine service, which would bring about the needed perfection. And since the purpose of this concealment is only ultimate revelation, this leaves room for the perfection of these defects through the force of the revelation of perfection. And since the concealment is destined for revelation in any event, even of itself, in an end, an end has been set for the days of free choice. For ultimately, the entire universe will achieve complete perfection, which will be followed by the period of reward for the divine service that had preceded, as stated by our sages in Eruven 22a, and I quote, today to perform them, the mitzvot, and tomorrow, to receive their rewards. Please summarize what you've thus far stated on this subject, for indeed, much has been said. The principle is short and easily acceptable. The Supreme Will desires to reveal and make manifest the truth of his wonders, that there exists no power whatsoever contrary to his, and it is upon the foundation that he built his world with all of its laws. The purpose of the concealment of his countenance and his allowing room for the existence of evil is the ultimate revelation of his oneness, the eradication of evil and the manifestation of the oneness of his reign. In the interim, room has been provided for man's divine service as long as imperfection exists and perfection awaits revelation. And after this revelation, there will ensue a period of reward for the divine service that had been Proceeded. I am still left with some slight room for question. Why must we say that everything rests on this principle of oneness? Is it not sufficient to subscribe to the first idea which we stated at the outset, that the Holy One, blessed is He, 
desire to bequeath perfect goodness to his creations and saw fit to this end that they require it through merit and not as charity, for which reason he instituted reward and punishment in the world, so that they acquire this good as reward, and for which reason he instituted pure freedom from will, so that there be room for reward and punishment. But the fact of the matter is that it is oneness that is destined to be revealed. For we have seen the assurances of the prophets, which we have adduced previously, to the effect that the Holy One, blessed be He, will redeem Israel in any event, even without merit, and that He will remove the evil inclination from men and compel them to serve Him. All of this is in opposition to the idea of reward and punishment and freedom of will. And if the intent, if the intent were in truth, to establish free will and reward and punishment, that is, for the world to be constantly composed of individuals with freedom of choice to be righteous or wicked according to their wills, so that things would always go well for the righteous and badly for the wicked, then it would be necessary for the state to persist continuously, without interruption. And this would indeed be the case were it God's desire to persist in the attribute of justice and to measure men by it all of their days. But we know this not to be so, as we have demonstrated through Scripture, and as it is clear to us from the words of our sages, that ultimately men will be divested of freedom of choice, and evil will cease from the world. And as they have stated in the Brachot, it is written, and sins will vanish from the earth. The ultimate intent then is not reward and punishment, but universal perfection. It is just that the Holy One, blessed be He, has linked the two systems together as one, in the depth of His design, channeling all towards the universal perfection. We shall yet speak of this further, with God's help, when we discuss divine providence in detail, for it is a very deep and fundamental doctrine. We have been speaking until now in generalities, and we must now come to specifics. We have established that all of the aspects of laws of creation rest upon the ultimate revelation of God's oneness. And in this regard, we have established that there are two periods. The first, that in which he is hidden but destined to be revealed. And the second, that period which is subsequent to his revelation. And it is upon these two periods that we see man's divine service and the receiving of his rewards to rest. For this point on, we must distinguish every detail we can in respect to each of these two periods, that is, the details of the concealment of his oneness in themselves and the details of its revelation in themselves. For in view of the fact that one leads into the other, there must be of necessity be a linking point which marks the transition between the two extremes. Let us begin in order, the first task being to understand the details of the concealment of his oneness, the first of the periods, and the nature of his dealings with us during this time, and this stage, we shall have to explain all of the aspects of divine service, and all of its implications, the preparation requisite for its performance, and all of the other considerations that enter into this discussion. There is a great fundamental preface that I must set down before we can venture forth into analysis of the ways of God and the modes of his conduct that we are discussing. Oh, what's that? We are cognizant of ordinances and rules whereby the Blessed One deals with us, his creations, righteous modes and ways that decreed by the depth of his wisdom. As a result, we attribute to him many qualities, as in all of the descriptions of our prophets of blessed memory, and, and we term him merciful, gracious, strong, along with all of the other qualities attributed to him. Here, however, we must understand and know with firm conviction that none of these descriptions and titles corresponds in any way whatsoever to the true essence of the Blessed One in that none of his acts are performed by him in the same sense that a man acts in accordance with his nature and strength, but they are all representative of what he wills to do in accordance with the intellects of the creatures that he willed to create, and within the limits of their potential alone. 
The sages have expiated upon this idea in many places. What is incumbent upon us to believe in this respect is that the existence of the Blessed One is unquestionably self-evident, but his essence cannot be conceptualized by us in the least. And what is more, it is absolutely forbidden to us to embark upon such an inquiry. As our sages have stated in Chagiga 11b, if one reflects upon four things, it is better if he had not come into this world. And also from Chagiga 13a, do not inquire into what is removed from you. You have no business with mysteries. In sum, anything that the human intellect can conceive of and envisage is certainly not of the essence of the Blessed One, for he is elevated and exalted above all thought and conception, and possesses not a single one of the properties of his creations, whether great or small. The greatest perfection in his creations is a defect relative to him, but we do not approach his nature in any way whatsoever, for anything found in his creations, good or bad, perfection or imperfection, is entirely new invented by the will of the Blessed One, adapted entirely to our intellect and station, and reflective in no way of the intelligence and essence of the Blessed One. On this score, Scripture unequivocally proclaims in Yeshaya 40 verse 25, And to whom will you compare or liken me, says the Holy One. To sum up, the Creator is absolutely free of anything found in His creations, whether perfection or imperfection. He alone being perfect in true perfection which allows of no imperfection whatsoever. He is absolutely inconceivable to us, none of our qualities being attributable to Him. However, in His will to create creations and to guide them, to bequeath of His goodness to them, so as to confer blessings upon them and to allow them some revelation of his glory, which is exalted above all blessing and praise, so that they may bask in his light. He established, as it were, a system of just conduct, to wit, this entire system that we see and hear of, having invented, as it were, forms of influence and modes of conduct by which to act and by which to direct all his creations to a choice select goal. And now, as to his qualities, they are certainly his qualities and attributes, may certainly be ascribed to him. However, they are not things necessary to him at all, but all willed by him, and their existence is entirely dependent upon his desire and his will. For he certainly could have acted without these in their complete absence, and even now he can alter them at will. In conclusion, the rule of his will is absolute, allowing of no deterrent whatsoever at any time whatsoever. I have already explained this sufficiently previously, and though he is hidden, God, in point of his existence and pure essence, entirely inconceivable and unknowable by the creature, yet his glory is somewhat revealed and known through his acts. And anything that any creature in the world may conceive of him will be through his acts alone and nothing else. However, you must also know that even those acts of his that are perceived by us and are perceived only in terms of their effects, that is, we perceive only what is affected by the Blessed One and not the manner in which he affects it. For there is no conception that can apprehend anything relating to the Blessed One. We can apprehend only what is native to us, his creations. Therefore, even though we attribute to the Blessed One certain qualities such as knowledge, memory, thought, mercy, anger, volition, it is not to be said because of this that his manner of knowing or remembering or thinking or pitying or venting anger or willing corresponds respectively to ours, and so with all of the qualities. He affects his acts in a manner completely inconceivable and unknowable to us at all, but they reach us in the form and measure that he desires. Furthermore, even his acts of imperfection need not be enacted in the imperfect manner of the man who would perform such acts. But, and I quote, he said and it came into being in a manner completely hidden from us and beyond our comprehension. 
reaching us only in the measure that they reach us. Deduce this from the voice of the Blessed One in the Tent of Meeting, concerning which our sages commented in Torah Kohanim on Vaikwa, and I quote, the voice of God in power, and even so Moses heard it and all of Israel did not, end quote. All this stems from his omnipotence, from his ability to do all that he wills, without any forces to deter him or any law or limit to circumscribe him. Therefore, we can draw no inferences whatsoever as to his acts from those of his creations, in view of the fact that they are bounded and circumscribed, whereas he is wholly omnipotent. This is the preface you will need for all that will touch upon in our discussion. Now, to our subject. I have heard what you have said and readily subscribe to it, for it is impossible to be at rest regarding the creation and its accidents without recognizing the existence of a cause and providence so elemental, exalted, omnipotent and entirely unforced and uncompelled. Without this there is no resolution or clarification for most of the doubts and conjectures raised by this subject. The first of the periods which we must now explain is that of the concealment of his oneness as obtains at present the entire period of divine service, as we have explained. In point of his perfection, as stated previously, God could certainly have rendered all of his acts perfect, so that they possessed only complete perfect good, with no taint of imperfection or evil whatsoever. However, in his desire to deal with his creations according to the ordinance that we have mentioned, he invented an altogether new order, not in accordance with the supreme perfection, but only with the needs of the creations, to provide them with merit and ultimate reward. And this is the way of good and evil, reward and punishment, according to which good and evil are evenly balanced, both entering the world, so that good is set forth for the righteous just as evil is for the wicked. Within this construct, the creations sometimes assimilate imperfections and sometimes perfection. The forces of evil are permitted to exercise their influence and the corrupting powers to work all the evil that God has invested in them. And room is provided for the nations of the world, the worshippers of idols and all of the other evils in the world that are in relation to, to whose ultimate removal were stated the assurances of our prophets of blessed memory, as in Yeshaya 2.18, and the idols will pass entirely away, and in Zechariah 13.2, and I shall remove the spirit of defilement from the land, and also in Yeshaya 25.8, death will be swallowed up forever, and also from Yeshaya 11.9 and 65.25, they shall work no evil or corruption in any of my holy mountain, and in the like, in the vein, uh, also from Brachot 33b, all is in the hands of heaven except the fear of heaven. For the Holy One, blessed be he, does not wish to stand in the way of men if they desire to do wrong. And this is the source of all the great erosions the world has undergone from the day God created man. And there is no rest for the righteous in this world, for man's evil upon it is great. The forces of evil are continuously asserting themselves. And the Holy One, blessed be He, is exacting with His saints to the degree of a hair's breadth. This is the nature of the order that the Supreme Will has originated in accordance with the concealment of His sovereignty and His oneness. And this order persists only by virtue of the concealment of the countenance of the Blessed One's goodness. For if he wished to reveal himself in the truth of his reign, he would eliminate all of these evils and only allow good and perfection to remain, as he will indeed do in time to come. And it should be known further that, unquestionably, even now, although he has concealed his goodness and withheld the full scale of his perfection from his creatures, it is certain beyond a doubt that he is providential to them. For whence would they derive being, existence and endurance, if not from his providence? If so, he certainly exercises his providence, but his pre present providence 
compared to what it would be if he desired to exercise it in proportion with his perfection is only as a shadow compared to a man, or as a slight impression left by writing on a piece of parchment after the letters are removed from it. The generality of this providence is referred to as darkness and not light, relative to the perfect providence that could obtain if he wrought in proportion to his perfection. As far as we are concerned, however, this is, in any event, all of our lives, for it is exclusively by virtue of this providence that we live and endure. When we speak of this providence then, which originated in the concealment of the countenance of the Blessed One's goods, we will regard it in its totality as the shadow alone of the Almighty's strength and is nothing more, although, when we analyse it in detail, we find it in all the ordinances and laws which we distinguish in the supreme order. For altogether are extremely insignificant relative to the supreme power that would manifest itself in God's acting according to his perfection, as I have explained. However, since the ultimate intent is the revelation of oneness and not its concealment, as we have explained previously, this concealment being only the means of arriving at the ultimate revelation. Therefore, even though he concealed his countenance to originate this order of good and evil, he nevertheless cast a projection through the quality of his goodness and within the framework of his sovereignty to weave its revolu resolution of this entire order into the universal perfection. This is self-evident. It having already been explained that God will put an end to this darkness of good and evil of, in these 6,000 years, and that he has already decreed the end of this order from the very start, so that his oneness will remain revealed and the good of the world will remain fixed for all eternity. Every day that passes then finds the world closer and closer to perfection. What is more, the Holy One, blessed be he, in the depth of his design, fashions contingencies and continuously manipulates events to bring the world to this perfection. As scripture states, and I quote from Psalms 40 verse 6, You have done many things, O God my Lord, your wonders and your thoughts towards us. And also from Yeshaya 25 verse 1, Counsel from afar in depth of faith. And also from Shemuel 14, verse 14, and he contrives thoughts not to cast out the outcast. For certainly it is not the intent of the Holy One, blessed be he, to persist so long in the order of good and evil, and then in one moment to abandon it, and initiate the order of sovereignty and oneness, as a man would regret and go back upon what he has done but it is of the depth of the Blessed One's design to manipulate events from such a profundity of wisdom that we will attain this end, the revelation of the Blessed One's oneness by means of the working out of the order of good and evil itself. We shall speak more of this further with God's help. We find then that the Creator constantly employs these two orders, which he established when he forged the foundations of the earth. The first, the order of reward and punishment, consists in a balanced state of good and evil, tending to merit and culpability respectively. This order is called the order of justice, for through it the Holy One, blessed be he, presides in judgment over all men according to their deeds, good or bad, and from within this judgment there emerges his goodness according to his perfection and his reign, through which he resolves to perfect all of his creations. According to the order of reward and punishment, the Holy One, blessed be he, makes his deed dependent, as it were, upon those of men, so that if they are good, he will bequeath them good in return, and if they are evil, he will be compelled, as it were, to punish them. This is the intent of the verse, and I quote from Tehillim 68, verse 35, Give strength to the Lord. And its opposite, in Deuteronomy 32, 18, you have weakened the rock of your birth. 
as our sages have explained in Eicha Rabba 1 verse 33, when Israel does the will of the Lord, it adds strength to the heavenly power. And when it does not do the will of the Lord, it weakens the heavenly power. God forbid. But with respect to the order of his reign and sovereignty, scripture states in Zechariah 3 verse 9, and I will remove the transgressions of that day in one day. And Jeremiah 50 verse 20, the transgression of Israel will be sought and not be there, the sin of Judah, and it will not be found. Under the order of good and evil, the judgments of the Lord are true, to recompense a man according to his ways, measure for measure. The Lord has many means to pay a man according to his deeds, and a man's ways will be returned to him, whether for good or ill. But in the counsel of his goodness according to his perfection, the common end of, end of both good and evil is to return all to the perfect good, the ultimate universal perfection. It is in this respect that scripture states in Malachi 3 verse 6, I am God, I have not changed. And in the Midrash of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, it is written, and I quote from Zohar Kitzetze 281, I have not changed in any place. It is the order of reward and punishments, however, which is revealed and constantly manifest to all, the process by which all is resolving itself into good being extremely profound and not destined to become apparent until the end, but the process is assuredly in motion every moment and does not cease. It is clearly seen then that the Creator circumscribed His perfection, as it were, when bringing His perfections into being, creating them imperfect, imperfect and not complete, and assigning them a kind of order and a manner of providence which is nothing but the darkness of the Blessed One's concealment, from which proceeds the balance of good and evil, which allows for the existence of sins and their blemishes, for punishment and defect. In spite of this, however, in his goodness, he has projected for his creatures an ultimate, complete, universal perfection into which the world is resolving itself each day, and into which he draws the concomitants of good and evil themselves, to result in complete perfection in the oneness of the Blessed One's sovereignty. Please summarize what you've stated until now. The Holy One, blessed be he, has employed two orders in his conduct of the world. One, the order of justice, and the other, the order of the single divine sovereignty and reign. The order of justice is that of good and evil, in which reside all the aspects of good fortune and ill, with all of their effects. The source of this order is the veiling of the countenance of his goodness and the concealment of his perfection. The order of the single reign is that of the perfection of all of the creations through the power of the Blessed One though they would not be deserving of it in themselves. It is this order which operates secretly within all the workings of justice itself, to turn everything to perfection alone. Its source is the Blessed One's elemental goodness, which, even though it is hidden, does not leave off directing us towards the good. The order of justice is revealed and manifest. That of the divine reign is hidden and concealed. I still need some clarification of this order of divine reign that you've mentioned, for I do not understand well the working of the Blessed One's elemental perfection. For ostensibly, in two is not of the order of perfection, you're having state, uh, stated that the true per perfection is not apprehensible. You have questioned well. I will now make the matter clear to you. The elemental perfection of the Blessed One is completely beyond our apprehension. This is the true perfection which is entirely unknown to us, and it is by its very nature exalted and it's elevated above all the affairs of his creatures. For as soon as he willed to guide his creations, he established and willed these modes of conduct which are all adapted to the level of his creations and in no way whatsoever represented of him so that his pure essence is entirely removed from them. And what is more, even in these acts themselves, which are adapted to the level of his creations, he did not do what he could have done, 
to the contrary constrained his goodness as it were so as not to do what he would have been expected to do in the point of his goodness for even in willing to guide his creatures and reveal himself to them on their level and not on his he could notwithstanding have revealed himself to them and conducted them within his very framework of their level in perfection alone without defect as will indeed be the ultimate nature of his ordinance and from the point of his goodness and loving kindness this would consist in his revealing himself in great goodness and bountifulness and from the point of his perfection in his rendering his acts perfect without a defect but he constrained all of this and willed to render them imperfect and lacking in radiance as they were However, in any event, he did not will to leave his world so, constantly heaved about the maelstrom of good and evil, but it was the counsel of his great goodness to establish an order and a deep design to channel all things from within the order of good and evil itself into the universal perfection which they are susceptible. And it is of the nature of his perfection to at least ensure the ultimate perfection of his deeds and they're not remaining in a state of imperfection however this does not not at all represent the true perfection of his deeds in accordance with his apprehensible essence for such purity does not relate to us in any way whatsoever but it is as i have said that in any event even though he has willed to act only according to the level of his creations it is of the nature of his perfection to act so only in perfection and the root of this order is the deep design that i have spoken of which resolves everything into universal perfection nevertheless as we have mentioned in the withholding of his mercies as it were the situation obtains of his not acting in accordance with his perfection so that his creature creatures are perfect from the very beginning but in the beginning they are defective and their end is to achieve perfection through his great goodness as we have explained for if he allowed the order of justice to prevail forever men would never emerge from their foolishness for there would be always righteous men and wicked good and evil blessing and curse but now even though things are so at the outset they will not remain so it is for this reason that the order of justice is manifest and that of the universal perfection concealed its workings destined to remain hidden until the achievement of the ultimate perfection of all it is now clear to me that the order of the universal perfection most assuredly proceeds from the very nature of his goodness albeit in his willing to act with us only in accordance with our level and not in accordance with his. I shall tell you now something more specific in this regard, and that is that in all of God's dealings with us, we compose it two dimensions, the revealed and the concealed. The revealed is reward and punishment to the recipient of one or other, good or bad. The concealed is the deep design in hearing all always in all of his deeds to guide the creation to the universal perfection for this is certainly the case there is no deed small or great whose ultimate end is not the universal perfection as stated by our sages in brachot 60b all that is done by heaven is for the good and by the prophet yeshaya in the chapter 12 verse 1 your wrath will turn back and you will console me for in time to come, the Holy One, blessed be He, will make known His ways in the presence of all Israel, showing how even the chastisements and tribulations were precursors of good and actual preparation for blessing. For the Holy One, blessed be He, desires only the perfection of His creation and does not categorically repel the wicked, but to the contrary, He refines them in the crucible of perfection to cleanse them of any impurity and this intent characterizes every act that the blessed one does with us whether for good or ill as we have explained you must know however that every one of god's deeds is awesome 
infinitely broad and deep. As scripture states in Psalms 92 verse 6, How great are, you, are your deeds, O Lord! The very smallest of his deeds contains so much vast and profound wisdom that its depths can never be plumbed. As it is written also <clears throat> in Psalms, your thoughts are exceedingly profound. God's acts, then, are entirely incomprehensible to us. It is only their surface layer which is seen, their true core being hidden. And this core is common to all of them in that they are good only and not at all evil. This is something which certainly cannot be seen and understood now, but in time to come this much at least we will see and perceive that they all proceed from the Blessed One's profound design to benefit us in our latter end. But let us not imagine, because of this, that we shall ever attain to the end of the vast wisdom inherent in those deeds. For anything that one can fathom, even of the deeds of the Creator, is but as a drop from a great ocean. Let us know then that the Creator, in desiring to project His goodness onto His creations, as we have mentioned, has so wrought that all of the acts which reach us now within the order of reward and punishment certainly contain within them what they do not reveal on the surface, that which constantly impels and directs them through his goodness towards the consummation of our perfection. And there is that within this inner core which will immediately reveal itself in time to come, as it is written in Yeshaya 35 verse 5, then the eyes of the blind will be opened. The reference being to the wisdom which is to be seen and recognized from within the acts themselves. For as soon as our eyes will be enlightened in the light of knowledge, we shall perceive the thought from the act itself. However, there is certainly that within these acts which is of the profoundest wisdom and which can in no way be recognized or apprehended from the nature of the acts themselves appertaining as it does to the sublimity of the supreme wisdom which is not recognized even through its workings both of the dimensions of this inner wisdom however are nothing other than aspects of the projection onto us of the blessed one's goods but always on our level not on his as we have explained for the profundity of his wisdom proceeds from the very nature of his perfection, whereas the working out of his deeds is dictated only by their significance for us. <clears throat> Summarize this idea too. In sum, the perfection of the Blessed One in itself is absolutely unfathomable. But in his desire to manifest his goodness, at least in respect to those acts which are on our level and not more, he contrived the designs and systems of ordinances which would result in completeness and perfection for the entire creation. And this is the hidden element in all of his deeds, the common denominator of them all. And as to the hidden element, a bare modicum of it will be revealed and recognized from the deeds themselves when the Holy One, blessed be he, chooses to open our eyes. The major portion of it, however, will still remain elevated and exalted and entirely unperceivable by virtue of the exceeding profundity of the Blessed One's wisdom. Here you should know that the order which can be absolutely attributed to the Blessed One is that of perfection, for he is perfect and acts always in perfection. And in having arranged and established the ordinances and orders relating to the creations on the basis of good and evil, the effects of these ordinances and orders are to be regarded as emanating from him in respect to what has been implanted in them. And indeed, as long as the order of good and evil is to serve, those acts which emanate from this order are derived from the operation of perfection itself, for in the last analysis the source of all is this perfection. And even what is done according to good and evil is a cycle returning to the point of perfection. But as long as the oneness is concealed, things must follow this course. Therefore, it is from perfection itself that these acts will inevitably derive, for it is of the supreme will and wisdom that they emanate from the source of perfection as long as the oneness is concealed. And ultimately, the result of the operation of perfection will be the reversion 
of the entire order to him. And this constitutes a third dimension to discriminate in each of the Blessed One's manifestations. The derivation of the results of that manifestation from the operation of perfection itself. This is an intermediary stage, as it were, between perfection and manifestation according to its nature. And it varies with each manifestation according to the nature of the manifestation, being activated by perfection according to its particular character. And in this intermediary stage, too, it is necessary to discriminate the intrinsic nature and manner of execution, as will be explained further. We must realize, that furthermore, that all of these things are dependent exclusively on the Blessed One's will, having neither existence being nor endurance except by virtue of the desire of the Blessed One, who reigns in infinite omnipotence, as it says in Psalms 33, 9. For he said, and it came into being, he commanded and they were established. Therefore, the force of the Blessed One's will is recognized in all of them, for it is he alone who maintains them in all of their aspects, in all of their divisions and details, just as it is he who maintains all of the creations in all of their characteristics and in all that pertains to them. Neither they, nor, neither they nor anything about them having any existence outside of him. This is obvious to me. I have no doubt concerning it. I will explain this preface in greater detail and you will understand the deep matter as well as the dictum of our sages. And I will quote from Boratius Rabba 68 verse 9. He is the place of the world but the world is not his place. <clears throat> there is no necessary existence but that of the Blessed One. Anything beside him having no existence except through his will and being dependent exclusively upon it. All of existence is therefore regarded as hanging upon the Blessed One's word. As it is stated in respect to the upper waters, that's from Ta'anis 10a. And in this connection our sages have stated in Chagiga 12b, Upon what does the earth rest? Upon the pillars. And the whirlwind rests in the arms of the Holy One, blessed be He. And also from Yalkut Shmoni. Flesh and blood is beneath its burden. But the Holy One, blessed be He, is above His, as it is written in Devorim 33, verse 27, and from beneath the arms of the world. God is here featured as supporting all of existence in all of its details and standing over it from above. The sum of the matter is, as I have stated, that since the existence originated by the Blessed One is not necessary to Him at all, it is sustained only by virtue of the fact that his pure will desires it. And understand well that only this will and decree of his is the place of all that exists, without which there would be no place at all. Therefore, the Blessed One is certainly primordial, but not so with the creation, as opposed to the contention of the heretics that since he is primordial, the world too must be primordial. For so long as he did not will and decree it, there was no place for the existence of the creations. On the contrary, relative to the Blessed One's existence, they have no place, for they are not analogous to something ingrained in a man's nature. Only he alone must exist of necessity, and nothing other but him. This is clear. Only by his willing them and decreeing them into existence do they have a place, and not otherwise. This decree of his, then, is seen to provide the place for all of his subsequent constructs. Understand further that although we know, we now know, the Holy One blessed be he, as rejoicing in all of his deeds and deriving glory from them, as it is written in Psalms 104, verse 31, God's glory will endure forever. God will rejoice in his deeds. Let us not think, because of this, that before these came into existence, the Blessed One was lacking in joy or glory, God forbid. But it is as we have said, in point of the Blessed One's pure existence, there is no room for the creations at all. They're having no relationship to aught that pertains to Him. But since He has willed them, then, because of this will and desire, they are to Him, as it were, sources of joy and honour. 
for it is certainly his will that gives them existence and it is regarded as unfulfilled if their existence is not effected. His will is herein analogous to a building site which is regarded as vacant until the projected buildings have appeared and not the creations alone but even all of the orders and ordinances and forms of providence that we have mentioned which are adapted to our level and not his have no meaning whatsoever outside of his will that they exist therefore it is only in accordance with this will that he brought them all into being and they are not necessary to him at all but they too are among the buildings projected to fill the site for all are needed for the fulfillment of his will this is clear we have now said enough on this matter. My mind is completely settled on this matter. I would now like to understand the idea of the existence of man, a matter which I feel must be well understood, for everything revolves around him, and it is upon him that the burden of divine service falls. You speak rightly. Man is the end of all of the Blessed One's deeds. Therefore, only he who understands this correctly can understand the essence of all that precedes it, for everything is directed to this end. Here too we shall have to inquire a great deal. We must consider the three things, man's existence, his deeds and the fruit of his deeds. If so, the area of inquiry is extremely great. Therefore, we shall mention in the main ideas only and leave their elaboration to the understanding of the wise. Speak on. Here we must consider the idea of the resurrection, which we certainly believe in without any doubt whatsoever. This indeed is one of those matters that I ask you to explain, for I would like to understand it well. The idea of resurrection, briefly stated, is quite simple. In view of the fact that the Holy One Blessed Be He created man as body and soul together to take upon themselves all of the holy service, the Torah and the mitzvot which were given to them, it is only fitting that they also be together in the receiving of the eternal reward, for it is inconceivable that the body's labours not redound to its benefit. The Holy One better be He, not withholding the reward of any creature. We know this from Baba Kama 38b. What does demand reflection are the details of this union of body and soul, in their conjunction, their separation, and their subsequent complete reunification for the Lord deals so with all men and it is certainly no vain matter these details therefore demand explanation broad adequate explanation it certainly does demand explanation why is it that the Hashem created body and soul two creations and not one whereby man would be one distinct entity and not a complete uh, composite as he is now for he certainly is not lacking the wherewithal to create him as a distinct living being, without this quality of body and soul. Indeed, I think that knowing this would serve as an entry into knowledge of the other details. The heavenly intent, as you have already heard, is man's good alone, that he merit reward for his deeds by perfecting himself and completing his creation. This is subsumed under the idea of defect and perfection that we mentioned previously. God made this body of coarse, dark matter, unfit by its lowly nature, to shine in the light of the Blessed One's holiness. For only the readied in perfection are fit to approach the King's gate and sojourn in his sanctuary, a fortiori from the code of earthly kingdoms. And it is this darkness which has been ingrained in this body's nature that invests it with all of the evil lusts that hold sway over it and render it vulnerable to all of the evil accidents that befall it and in contra contradiction to this he has made the pure soul hewn from under the throne of glory and brought down and infused into this body to purify and sanctify it and what we must understand is that the end intent of the infusion of the soul into the body is not that it's animated for this life of vanity, 
but its central purpose is to refine it completely, to elevate it from the depths of the dark earthly abyss to the highest station, to the rank of the ministering angels. This indeed is what occurred with Moses of blessed memory, who so refined and enhanced his earthliness that he actually attained to the level of an angel, so that all of Israel saw that the skin of Moses' face shone. And Hanukh and Elijah actually ascended to heaven in their bodies after they had greatly refined their earthiness. This means, however, by which the soul is enabled to purify the body is the performance of mitzvot and the observance of the Torah. For, and I quote, a mitzvah is the candle and the Torah is light. And the more Torah and mitzvot the soul acquires, the more refinement it achieves for the body and the more merit for itself in fulfilling the will of its creator. We find then the benefit of perfection for the body and merit for the soul, but not the benefit of perfection of the soul. We shall yet speak of this with the help of God, but let us now complete our subject. This refinement is the prime activity of the soul in this world, after which it is subject to other considerations that are more appropriately discussed elsewhere. On this matter, it has been stated in the Zohar. Uh, Rabbi Chia said, Come and see, so long as the body resides in this world, it is lacking in perfection. If it is upright, having travelled the path of righteousness and having died in its integrity, it is termed Sara in its perfection, the soul being referred to as Avraham. And this is the fruit of all its righteousness. The enhancement of the Blessed One's glory through the perfection of His creations, God having created everything for His glory. And this is all that virtue of deed results in vis-à-vis -vis heaven, and for which reward is conferred upon it from above. For as the pleasure is renders its, crea its creator, so is the reward it is rendered in return. But the sin, the sin of Adam, has necessitated the quaffing of the cup of death by the entire creation. There is no alternative to it, and it is for this reason that the soul cannot affect this refinement before death. This accounts for the phenomenon of those righteous men who died through the counsel of the serpents, as stated by our sages in Baba Basra 17a. Their not having been able to achieve perfection without death, even in the abundance of their righteous deeds. But after the body will have returned to the earth whence it arose, and will have been completely purged of the foulness with which the serpent infected Eve, then, when it will be reconstituted, the soul will descend into it with all the strength of its virtuous acts and the splendor of the heavenly radiance in which it basked in Eden in all the strength of its deeds, and it will illuminate its body with a great light, which will purify it completely and heal it of all the evil that have been rendered vulnerable to at the outset. This receives expression in the Midrash Hane'elam, Vayera, and I quote, our sages have stated, the soul, whilst in Eden, is nourished by the heavenly light and clothes itself in it, and when, in time to come, it re-enters the body, it is with that light itself that it re-enters. And, and I quote also from that Midrash, The Holy One, blessed be He, stores this body in the ground until it decays and is purged of his fa its foulness. We find then that man's divine service and his receiving reward center around two periods, which wake up his entire existence. For now, in this world, the body is coarse, dark and defective, and the soul must charge it with light to sanctify it and to sanctify, to refine and illuminate it. And the completion of this process ushers in the period of receiving reward, when they will both present themselves for eternal goodly reward. What we must now understand is the degree of potency allotted the soul in its investiture of this body. For if its potency were very great and its illumination extremely intense, 
it would suffuse the body with so much radiance that the body would undergo a sublime transfiguration. Its defects would give way to perfection in an instant, and the evil inclination, the prime tool of imperfection willed by the Creator for the purpose of free choice and reward or punishment, would hold no sway over man at all, just as it holds no sway over the angels by virtue of their great enlightenment, the perfection of their knowledge and their exalted nature. Know this to be so, for in respect to the time to come it is written in Isaiah 11.9 they shall work no evil or corruption in all of my holy mountain for the earth will be filled with knowledge and in respect to the same time uh, we quote it from Ezekiel 36.26 and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh all this in light of the greatness of the soul which will be even more exalted at that time however on the other hand if the soul in its essence were lowly and not great it could not sustain the intensity of the greatness and sublimity that awaits it in times to come exceeding that of the ministering angels but the truth is that the soul in its essence and source is exalted in greatness but so that it enter the body the Holy One, blessed be He, diminishes its light and potency, leaving it only as much as is appropriate for the body of this world. It can be compared to that time to the moon, to which it was said in Chulin 60b, go and diminish yourself. Whereas in respect to the time to come, it is stated in Yeshaya 30 verse 26, and the light of the moon will be as the light of the sun. It is in the power of the soul, according to the perfection of its deeds, to make ascent after ascent until it reaches its supreme height. But because of the lesser magnitude assigned it in this world, it remains cabined and confined within this homely body all the days allotted to it on earth, to be tried and proven through the trials of the evil inclination. Indeed, it was for this purpose that the evil inclination was invested in man. As our sages have stated in Zohar 106b, the evil inclination was created solely for the purpose of trying man. And in accordance with the quality of its deeds, the soul merits for itself the ennoblement of ascending level after level, so that in the time of reward all souls carry their deeds with them and rise in station in accordance with them. And it is on this plane that they return and refine their bodies at the time of resurrection, after which they will rejoice in a superabundance of perfection eternally, as we have explained previously. In sum, the soul in itself must be rooted in greatness and must derive from an exceedingly noble source to be fit for all the good glory stored up for it in time to come. But it is lowered in stature, for its ultimate ele ele elevation and benefaction, the Blessed One circumscribing it. Go and diminish yourself to enter this ugly body and remain there all the days of its vanity. And there he prescribed for it all this Torah, to observe and to heed it. These are the things that pertain to it whilst it is in his body. However, because its power has been weakened and its light dimmed by this diminishment, the body remains ugly as it is today, though the soul is within it. But, according to the righteousness of its deeds, the soul is judged in time to come, rising in its ladder of ascent, so that when it returns to the body for a second time with its new light, it will effect in what it cannot effect now, complete refinement, transformation into a glorious, resplendent being, as we have explained. For whereas the beginning, in order to enter the body, it had to diminish its light, in the second entry, on the contrary, it must come with all of its light, so that the refinement is effected completely. And there is a benefit to the soul itself by virtue of its perfecting the body, to rise higher and higher, to add strength to strength and glory to glory. What is more, even when it is in this world, within the body, it achieves ascent and ennoblement in accordance with its deeds. 
For there is no comparison between the soul of a man who has occupied himself with his study of Torah and with mitzvot, and achieved knowledge of the glory of his Creator, and a soul devoid of all these. But its ascent does not reach the point of enabling it to change the body to the extent that its refinement is apparent, except in the case of a select few, the rare chosen ones of the Lord, such as Moses, our teacher of blessed memory, Hanoch and Elijah. As far as others are concerned, however, though it will be ennobled through its acts, the ennoblement will not proceed so far as to be evident in the body, but good will not be withheld from its proprietors in time to come, each according to his deeds. Please summarize what you have said. This is the overall idea. The body in its creation is dark and defective, but it achieves refinement through the soul. The source of the soul is majestic, but the soul diminishes itself in entering the body so as not to saturate it with the refinement in one instance and alter it from what it was created to be. Little by little, through virtuous acts, the soul effects the requisite amendment of the body, after which it achieved ascent in proportion to its deeds, increased power in proportion to its ascent, and effects refinement in the body to proportion it to its power, increased power, until the body is fit to present itself together with the soul, to behold the pleasantness of the Lord and to sojourn in his sanctuary for all eternity. I have understood what is sufficient for me in respect to the resurrection and the future reward. We should now complete the subjects that we began. Now that we have considered man's essence and in nature and in terms of both his soul and his body, with respect to the different periods and the order of times established for him, we must understand how the Holy One, blessed be he, relates to him in all of these times as concerns both his body and his soul. Order is certainly appropriate. Everything should be understood in its various aspects, in respect uh, to its differing circumstances and times. Now, please complete your statement. There are material and spiritual entities. You are aware of the great difference between them, the material being obviously inferior to the spiritual. His nature is noble and sublime, and you are aware of the radiance of the spiritual and of the darkness and effectiveness of the material. We have then before us two kinds of creations, a creation of great illumination and broad projection, and a creation of little illumination and limited projection. And these two modes, that of creation with illumination and that of creation without illumination, the first proceeds from God's goodness and the second from the absence of God's goodness. You will observe that all of the concourse of the spiritual is in holiness, whereas with the material all is mundane, lowly and despicable. The sum of man's labours under the sun is nothing but vanity, and man's ascendancy over the beast is as naught. To eat and drink and engage in commerce, all of these are lowly and insignificant things. In short, all of these aspects of matter and of nature are, dark, and are darkness, not light. They result from the Blessed Ones concealing his countenance from the world and not shining the light of his holiness upon it, but to the contrary, leading men in an uncharted void in these lowly ways. But as concerns the spiritual, this path is radiated by the light of the Blessed One's countenance, shining in His holiness. This is clear. Know, then, that these two are the foundations and the root of the Blessed One's conduct with all of His creatures, the concealment of His countenance, His secreting and concealing Himself and not revealing the splendors of His glory and the shining of His countenance. And as it is in conduct, so it is in creation. The coarse, ugly creations proceeding only from the concealment of his countenance is not illuminating them with the visage of his holiness, and the noble spiritual creations proceeding from the shining of his countenance. And it is upon these foundations 
that the fusion of body and soul is affected. The body and all of his operations proceeding from concealment and con of countenance, and the soul and all of its operations from its luminescence. And man himself is the perfecter and the perfected. For he perfects himself through his divine service, as in our sages' interpretations, and I quote from Sanhedrin 99b, and you shall do them, and also from Devorim, and you shall make yourselves. For it is man's power to give the ascendancy to the material, or to the spiritual in himself. If he follows the material promptings of his eyes and his heart, then his soul, instead of fulfilling its intended function of abetting the body by refining it, as we have explained, will, to the contrary, suffer great loss and deterioration, sinking into darkness. If, on the other hand, he overcomes his evil inclination and departs from the paths of vanity to walk in those of Torah and Mitzvot, the soul will gain ascendancy over the body and refine it. Observe now the progress of the world, the difference between the earlier and later generations. For, in truth, the one who considers this matter will indeed marvel at the phenomenon of men ceaselessly racing back and forth, day and night, each in his own path, the wearied and fatigued. And for what are they labouring? For food and drink? For inane vanities? For one night world of nothing? Today here, tomorrow in the grave. The one who can observe well will see and understand that it was not for this that man was created, that it would benefit him, that it would befit him to engage only in the contemplation of the glory of his creator, that it was this for which he was created and invested with great knowledge and wisdom, and not to devote himself to commerce or to other inconsequential enterprises. But man has perverted his needs and has brought himself to his present state. The world is undergoing constant regression in this respect. The early generations having been closer to wisdom and having given greater priority to intellect, the later generations being further from intellect and steeped in these elements of matter and nature, in commerce and in all manner of enterprises which leave nothing behind them as we have explained. The root of all things is as we have said. The one, blessed Lord, created the body and through the concealment of his countenance and not through its radiance, for which reason it is dark and ugly in essence. The soul, Count Contrawise, was created in the luminescence of his countenance and with projection for the good for which reason it is eternally enduring and pure in essence. However, if man asserts his body and gives it the ascendancy, the Blessed One, measure for measure, will relate to him only in concealment of countenance, so that he will be far from the light of life, from wisdom and from knowledge, and steeped in the mire of material pollution and the vanities of this world. And this is precisely what happened to Adam in the beginning and to his descendants after him until this very day because they went astray after their eyes and gave precedence to the body and not the soul the Holy One blessed be he responded in kind with concealment of countenance to Adam he said in Galatians chapter 3 verse 9 by the sweat of your brow shall you eat bread and from that day forward, we quote from King Solomon's Ecclesiastes, verse, chapter 6, verse 7, All the labour of man is for his mouth, and his soul too will not be filled. Wisdom has progressively waned and has departed from man. And this is a great principle. The bounds of a man's intellect dictate the bounds of his thoughts and his desires. The little child does not recognize wisdom and does not desire it at all. To the contrary, every child wishes to run away from school, thinking there is no good but the vanities he occupies himself with. But when he grows in knowledge and his horizons expand, he comes to desire more sophisticated things, and so onwards according to his progress. The same applies to men in general. 
when their intellect was stimulated by an abundance of illumination, they found pleasure in wisdom alone and in what was truly good. But when their intellect is not so stimulated, they recognize nothing as good but these earthly vanities. And this is the evil that resulted from Adam's sin, the removal of providence and radiance from the human species so that they remain steeped in gross material elements alone. The Holy One, blessed be He, indeed, corrected the state at the giving of the law, but they reverted to it through the sins of the golden calf and through others, so that the world remained in the darkness of illusory natural processes. This would not be the case were man to accord preeminence to his soul. For then the Holy One, blessed be he, would in kind cause his countenance to shine upon him and would raise him to the stature of the seraphim, for the righteous are greater than the ministering angels. And this, in truth, is what was experienced by the generation of knowledge at Mount Sinai, and what will be experienced in time to come, as it is written in Yoel chapter 3, verse 1, I shall pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. And even in respect to this good, there are varying levels which Israel and the world in general attained in varying degrees in different generations. Witness the generations of Moshe, of David and Shlomo, and the like. The good attained by all such generation consisted in the shining of the Blessed One's countenance upon them according to the ennoblement of their souls through the strength of their deeds. It follows from this that when we understand the details of the existence of body and soul and their conditions under concealment of countenance and shining of countenance respectively as they were correspondingly created in their varied details within this context. We shall likewise understand the principles by which God governs and continues to govern the universe, sometimes for the good and sometimes, God forbid, for evil. We shall see too the awesome wisdom imminent in this order, as well as the central position of man around whom, in his affairs and his acts, revolves the entire world and all that is done in it from beginning to end. These things are certainly gratifying to the understanding, seeing the great wisdom in the Blessed One's governance of the universe, the inner relationships of things, the creation of man and all that happens to him, the creation of the universe and all that is in it. You will hear yet more in this regard. For when we delve into the details of soul and body, we will understand how all of them relate to this root of the two qualities that we have mentioned, each one of them being governed in all of its aspects by its source, which serves as a sufficient reason for all of them. What is more, it was decreed by the Blessed One's wisdom to reveal the workings of these qualities through the body and soul that originated in them. It is seen then that the body, aside from it and its accidents, resulting from concealment of countenance, is, in its makeup and parts, a paradigm of the entire order of concealment of countenance in itself. And the soul, likewise, is a paradigm of the entire order of radiance of countenance. This is a specific dimension of man's form, it being said of him, and I quote from Horatius chapter 1 verse 26, in our image according to our likeness, imaging as he does all of the orders of the Blessed One's qualities. Know that the essence of the body is darkness and that even if it is realized its greatest potential of refinement, it will still be distinguished from the soul. That distinction consisting in this difference alone, the soul is a noble luminous entity emanating from the radiance of the Blessed One's countenance, whereas the body is not so, but an entity, dark in essence, resulting from the concealment of the Blessed One's countenance. It is susceptible of refinement, however, to the extent of its nature, to that degree where very little difference is perceivable between it and the soul. But in despite of this, the soul will remain soul, insusceptible of defect, 
and the body, to the contrary, a thing defective by nature, but attaining the refinement afforded it. Note further that the body is divided into organs and parts, each performing its own function, the eye seeing but not hearing, the ear hearing but not seeing. This is not so, however, with the soul, which, although encompassing all functions, does so without this division into individual organs, characteristic of the body, but it does everything without such division, as is well known. You will see now how this follows logically from our preface, that the body was created through concealment of countenance, and the soul through its luminescence. And this itself brings us to a preface of central significance. It is well recognized that perfection is one, that absolute perfection is insusceptible of detraction or addition. But when the Holy One, blessed be He, does not wish to act through His perfection, He is not lacking in devices to reward or punish, each according to His deeds, as we have explained previously. And since it was the decree of the Supreme Wisdom to display through the creation itself the manner and order of its creation, Therefore, by concealment of countenance, just as its operations are manifold, so he desired to invest this creation with many parts and different organs, which would exactly parallel all of the aspects of his ordinances. This is the idea intimated previously, concerning which, is, which it is written. And I quote, Let us make a man in our image, according to our likeness. For, in relation to all of the exalted qualities which we distinguish in the Blessed One in His acting on the level of His creatures, we find corresponding qualities in the figure of man. For example, the eye of man corresponds to the eye of His providence, which exercises surveillance over all the dwellers of the earth to judge all of their deeds, as it is written in Genesis 18.21, Let me go down and see. This teaches us that a judge must abide entirely by the evidence of his eyes. That's a quote from Sanhedrin 6 on the, on the base. The ears of man correspond to God's sitting and listening to the praise of men and to all of their praises, as it is written in Exodus 2.24. And the Lord heard their wailing. And our sages have also said in Ethics of our fathers, chapter 2, verse 1, Mishnah 1. Know what is above you, a seeing eye and a listening ear. The mouth of man corresponds to God speaking in a vision to his prophets and causing the glory of his voice to be heard by his angels, mighty in strength, executors of his words. And similarly, all of the other components of the body can be well understood as paralleling in their form and function the qualities to which he resorted in the making of his creations. And the general structure of man's body, right and left, with a doubling of parts on either side, two eyes, two ears, two hands, two feet, this corresponds to the twofold nature of the Blessed One's qualities, whether for loving kindness or for punishment, for turning to the right to merit or to the left to culpability. This is the order adopted by the will of the Blessed One in withholding his perfection, which equalizes all in goodness. And just as the parts of the body are thus distinguished and differentiated in terms of their functions, so all of the accidents of man within the order of concealment countenance are aspects of the particular devices employed by God in his governance of the universe. According to all we witness of the vicissitudes of time day by day. Perfection, however, as I've mentioned, is one superimposing itself over all imperfection to perfect it and suffering no disjunction in itself, but effecting perfection indiscriminately in all that requires it. And the same is true of the soul, which was created in the radiance of the visage of the Blessed One's perfection, the intent being that it gain ascendancy over the body and refine it, so that the Blessed One respond in kind by revealing 
his own perfection to correct all distortion and defect in the universe, as we have explained previously. But the body is prey to mischance as long as it rules in man. For the Holy One, blessed be he, will in kind conceal the visage of his perfection, so that the world and man will remain under the ordinance of the ever-turning wheel of life, in the manner of all temporal creatures who are subject to whatever fortunes the passage of time may bring upon them. The body, therefore, contains all that this wheel of life is apt to contain in the absence of the perfection of the goods. All of this will befall the body if it gains complete ascendancy over him. And there is in the perfection of the soul that which can affect perfection where it is lacking, so as to call down upon itself a correspondingly positive influence if man sets his path right and places the crown of kingdom upon the soul so that it alone reigns in the goodness of its wisdom and its nature. This has been well explained in the Midrash of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Uh, and I quote from uh, the Zohar, Pinchas 257b. It is to be known that he is called wise with all kinds of wisdom. For aside from the interpretations of the nose of truth in Kabbalah, According to their holy ways, even from a superficial perusal of the previously mentioned dictum, we can derive what has already been stated, that the Holy One, blessed be He, has many epithets, and that these relate to Him not in terms of His own nature, but in terms of the nature of His creations. As it is stated also in the Zohar, He will be known by the names of the creatures that are destined to be created by the names of the creatures is certainly not meant to imply the manifestation of something new in him, for his essence is insusceptible of newness or change. It is to be understood rather that it was always in his power to generate these qualities, but that they always represent what applies to his creatures and never what applies to his essence. In this guise he created the soul, an allusion to the fact that the that the essence of the soul points to the perfection of the Blessed One through which, through which it was created, and so too the Lord of the world. But all names attributed to him are in accordance with the qualities he manifests. And just as the Lord of the world has no specific name, so too the soul. This idea must be carefully considered if the essence of body and soul and all that relates to it is to be correctly understood. The Holy One, blessed be He, in His perfection, cannot have ascribed to Him any name or epithet. For we cannot conceptualize His perfection, and it is impossible to name what cannot be conceptualized. For a name defines its object, and what is not known completely cannot be defined. We do indeed perceive in the Blessed One's glory specific qualities, such as mercy, sovereignty, power, judgment, pity, anger, strength, and the like. All of these qualities which we perceive in him through his deeds are the very same qualities that the prophets perceive to in him proactively. The Blessed One having granted them such perception, and to the extent of our perception of his glory, we ascribe such epithets to him as merciful one, ruler, almighty, judge, and the like. And though the Blessed One in his perfection is without bound or limit in these qualities that he willed, he willed in them specific bounds and limits. Therefore, one quality is de designated mercy, another sovereignty, another power, another love, and so with all. So that in mercy, for example, there is only mercy, and in sovereignty, only sovereignty. And there is only that degree of mercy and that degree of sovereignty that the Blessed One willed, and so with all. And it is not to be said because of this that the Blessed One in His perfection possesses these powers in these proportions only, but that all, but that all hinges upon His will, as we have explained, for it is in His power to change all this. To the contrary, His perfection itself is subject to no limitation whatsoever. But because he willed to adopt these qualities and to act through them, 
we attribute the corresponding epithets to him. There, thus, let us not understand when we call the Holy One, blessed be he, merciful, that he is so in essence, as we would say of a human being who possess the characteristics of mercifulness, that this trait is rooted in his nature. Let us not assume that we can in any way conceive of the Blessed One's essence, God forbid. We have no right to entertain such an assumption, it being impossible for us to form any idea whatsoever of his true essence. When we term him merciful, let us rather understand that he wills a quality called mercy, which accords not with his essence, but with that of his creation, and that it corresponds and that it is correspondingly limited because he wills this quality and acts through it if we call him merciful but his perfect pure essence is certainly removed from all of these considerations this must be the nature of our faith in the blessed one as i have already explained previously the body soul relationship is to be understood in the same manner the body consists of specific parts and organs, each assigned specific limited functions. The soul in itself, however, is one, entirely removed from all of the aspects of the body, all of its ways being different ways, absolutely dissimilar to those of the body, even insofar as sensations are concerned. But because it performs all of the actions of the body while in it, it is the soul which hears through the ears of the body, the soul which sees through the eyes of the body and the like. It is therefore referring to as seeing, hearing, etc. It is not to be understood, however, as intrinsically invested with such attributes. For though it is the soul alone which sees and not the body which is inanimate, so that it is the agency through which men in fact see things as they do. It is not to be understood because of this, that this is its natural manner of seeing. For its way is entirely different from all of the ways by which the body functions, and it is entirely unfathomable to a man as long as he exists in a body. But because it adopts the way of the eye to see through its mechanism, it is therefore referred to as seeing, and so with all the other functions. In sum, the soul is a single creation, entirely divorced in essence from all the ways of the body, but created in such a way as to perform all that is implanted in the organs of the body according to their nature. And because it adopts these mechanisms and performs all of these actions in the body, they are all attributed to it. The relationship is precisely the same as that of the Blessed One vis-à-vis -vis the particular qualities which He willed. Perfection possesses no aspect of these qualities whatsoever, all of them being specific qualities which he willed and which he bounded and limited in accordance with his will. But because the Blessed One, through the quintessence of perfection, acts through these qualities, we refer to him by the corresponding names and epithets and attribute the corresponding acts and descriptions to him. In point of his perfection, however, he is entirely removed from all of these things, having no connection at all in terms of his essence with these ways and acts. This formulation is cogent in respect to both body and soul and is a great door opening into an understanding of all man's acts in all of his times. Now we come to the categorization of the various periods of soul and body and their different states. But first, a necessary preface. It is obvious that many laws and modes of ordinance enter into the complete picture of all the states of men and of the creation in all of their times as it is written in Psalms 40 verse 6. You have done many things, O Lord my God, your wonders and your thoughts. And also from uh, Psalms 92 verse 6. How great are your deeds, O Lord. And furthermore from Psalms 94 24. How many are your deeds, O Lord? But in any event, the specifics must of necessity fall under general rules which are not too numerous. Unlike the specifics which are readily, necessarily numerous to suffice for this entire creation. 
This certainly stands to reason. There are no particular instances which do not stem from general principles. And whereas the collation of the former wearies the mind, it is receptive to the simulation of the latter. Let us therefore pursue the principles and not the instances. This is the attitude of our sages. Uh, if we look at Sifrei Ha'azinu 32 verse 2, and I quote, Let the words of Torah at your command always be principles and not particulars. Let us return then to our subject. You have already seen that the Blessed One employs two modes concealment of countenance and illumination of countenance, which are root and cause of body and soul respectively. We must understand both of these modes, each in itself, in all of their many details, which derive from their governing principles. If we are to understand similarly, the states of soul and body, each in itself in complete detail. After having established this, we must know further that these two modes operate jointly in the governance of the entire world and its inhabitants. There is no area in which they do not operate, concealment manifestly and illumination in concealment, as we have explained previously. After this we must go on to understand the consequences of the conjunction of these two modes when one or the other gains ascendancy. In summation then, we must have knowledge of these three things, the two modes each in itself their constant joint operation and the various consequences of this conjunction as either concealment or illumination gains ascendancy. I'm reflecting in view of your having stated that the Holy One, blessed be He, desired to make manifest the orders and modes of His creation, that along these lines the two modes which govern man's conduct and in accordance with which He was created are reflected in man himself, in the two parts of which he is composed and constructed, body and soul. This corresponds to the first aspect of knowledge that you have mentioned. The second too has a parallel in man, the soul being conjoined to the body and permeating all its parts so that every act results from their joint operation. As to the third, however, I ask you, do you see a parallel? I don't. You will find a parallel for this too, if you look deeply into the human construct. For aside from the figure of the body, and aside from the form of the soul within it, there is something which results from the union of both, radiance of countenance. It is this which distinguishes the living from the dead, and not this alone, for even a change in the disposition of the soul within the body is reflected in the face. Witness the ashen countenance of the ill, and what is more, even the musings of the heart are reflected in the face. A smiling countenance, an angry countenance, a cordial countenance, are all witnesses of the thoughts hidden in the recesses of the heart. And this expression inheres neither in the soul alone, for it is manifested by the body, nor in the body alone, for the body has no expression without the soul, but it is born of the union of body and soul. And this is no small matter, for the prophets liken the form to its creator, as we have explained. Therefore, when the supreme glory appears to them through his qualities, presenting them with allegorical visions, appearing to them at one time as a young warrior, and at another as an ancient presiding in mercy, as our sages have stated, and I quote from Chagiga 14 Abadala, the eye of the prophet will image and his heart will conceive. He will thus apprehend in his prophetic vision the concealment of his countenance, the illumination of his goodness, and the consequences of their conjunction. This will be effected through the apparition of human form on high, process of body and soul, and the expressiveness of countenance resulting from their union, whether cordial, smiling, or angry, so that he will know all that the Lord proposes for his world whether for the good or for the bad. This suffices me now as far as parallels are concerned. Let's return to the knowledge of the ordinance itself in its various stages. What must be considered first in respect to the consequences of the union of these two modes is the ultimate stage to be reached by man in the time of the final perfection set aside for him. It goes without saying, 
that the final stage, the end of all man's ascension, is that which had been anticipated at the outset. For, considering the soul's noble extraction, it follows that in its nature there must be that which provides for the attainment of the greatest possible perfection in the end. It is just that it is charged from above, go and diminish yourself until it returns to its original status by elevating itself through its deeds. But it is not to be understood that it is of a minor stature in its creation and attains greatness subsequently. For there is nothing new under the sun. The opposite is the case. It is noble in the greatness of its origin and subsequently diminished, pending a return to its pristine strength. In any event, the end of the process is what is first contemplated. Accordingly, it is the perfection of man which is projected first, after which ensues his diminution, to be followed by an ascent of the stages by which he descended, to return to the perfection established for him in the beginning. The perfection of man, then, is what is first envisioned. This is the state and time in which the soul alone holds sway, the body exercising no form of dominance whatsoever, as if it did not exist, for it will be entirely subservient and subject to the reign of the soul in its purity, so that it will not even go by name, but will simply possess existence without dominance. And this goes without saying, for the dominance of the body is but darkness and blackness of the soul, Corporeality being nothing other than concealment of countenance, even a modicum of which exercises a deterring influence. For it is impossible for even the slightest bodily dominance not to result in a corresponding diminution of light and power in the soul. Therefore, the time when the soul will reign in all its strength, when it will lack nothing in it of its bounty of perfection, that is the time when the body will exercise no dominance whatsoever, for which reason there will be no deterrence to the soul. It is not to be thought, however, that the body at that time will have no existence, for we have already explained that both body and soul must receive reward, but it will have no dominance, being entirely bound up with the soul and inseparable from it. It will do nothing of its own accord and will desire nothing that the soul does not desire, so that it will be almost indistinguishable as an entity in itself, but will be assimilated, as it were, among the pure powers of the soul. A lesser stage is that in which the body can be somewhat discriminating in its dominance, the soul experiencing a corresponding lack in not realizing the full glory of its perfection. This slight dominance will produce only a slight lack, but to the extent that the dominance will grow, to that extent the deficiency will increase. In principle, there are three general time states, complete dominance of the soul, partial dominance of the soul, complete dominance of the body. If, however, we proceed by stages in considering the dominance states of the body, we can distinguish five, Stage 1. The body's possessing existence, but no dominance whatsoever, so that it gives not the slightest intimation of corporeality as it now exists. In this stage, a man is entirely free of any of those qualities which he possesses now, when bodiliness dominates him. This is the most exalted state of all. Stage 2 bodies experiencing a modicum of dominance, so that there is a kind of memory in man of what he was like when he had a body. This is not, however, a memory of specific things, but rather a generic memory of many things that he experienced. The state is analogous to that of a man who has experienced much suffering and had laboured and wearied himself in a succession of difficult situations so that there remained in him a general feeling of weakness and fatigue. In the same way, the dominance of the body produces a general deficiency which cannot be distinctly discriminated, just as man who carried some sorrow in his heart cannot experience complete joy, 
even though there was no specific reason for that sorrow. Similarly, the soul at this stage does not have the strength to expand in all of its power, but feels a slight heaviness, the exact nature which is not known. Stage 3. The body is exercising specific dominance, not in all its aspects, however, but in some of them, so that there remain some elements of corporeality in the man, the slightest elements, but still corporeal ones. It is obvious, though, that in all of these conditions there are no substantial ramifications of these elements of corporeality, as I shall explain further with God's help. Stage 4. The body is exercising dominance in all of its aspects, all corporeal properties inhering in it. But just as the soul now in this world is as a stranger in the land and must follow the ways of the body, so the body will then be as a stranger in the land, the soul being sovereign, and the body will have to follow its ways, as is stated in Shemot Rabbah 47 verse 6. When you come to a city, follow its customs. To what can this be compared? To the situation of Moses, our teacher, when he went to receive the Torah for Israel. He did not lose his body and did not change, but because his body was as a guest in the world of the souls, it departed from its accustomed behavior and emulated the mores of the soul. As our sages have stated in Baba Matiya 86 on the debates, a man must not deviate from the customs of the land. It is seen then that the body's change at that time is not intrinsic, but is rather an ad adaptation to a particular place, so that the change is not an absolute one. There are still no ramifications proceeding from these aspects of cor corporeality, for, as we have explained, the body is like a stranger, having to follow the ways of the soul. But in this fourth stage, all the aspects of the body are distinguishable and known. It is just that they are not in their native setting and must suspend the normal workings of their nature in deference to the soul. From this level upwards, all the aspects of the body cannot even be distinguished. And it goes without saying that they have no ramifications, for they follow the ways of the soul. Stage 5. The body is exercising dominance in all of its aspects, like a man who is lord of his home. All of his aspects manifesting themselves in full force and in all of their ramifications. This stage is divided into two parts, but it is still one stage. This is because the aspects of the body, even as body, can manifest themselves in two ways, in a mundane manner the manner of beasts, typical of most men, or in the manner of holiness and divine service. As we read in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 6, In all your ways know him. All of one's acts, proceeding from correct intent, as will be the case in time to come, of which it is stated in Ezekiel 36, 26, And I will give you a heart of flesh as would have been the case with Adam had he not sinned. But in any event, there are both aspects for corporeality, for eating is necessary, drinking is necessary, it cannot be dispensed with. Whether it be mundane eating and drinking, or holy eating and drinking, both are aspects of corporeality. But as we know that all of these things result from either concealment or illumination, of the Blessed One's countenance, we therefore say that the Holy One, blessed be He, varies His ordinance in accordance with what the creation demands in terms of these five levels. For on the lowest, the fifth, He conducts His universe to a great extent through concealment of countenance, and to a far lesser extent through illumination of countenance. On the fourth level, he diminishes concealment and increases illumination. On the third, he reduces concealment little by little and increases illumination more and more, and so on, until the first level, where illumination is so strong and concealment 
is so negligible that dominance remains with the soul alone and the body retaining none whatsoever. What makes this five-stage division necessary? This is the nature of the matter. It is obvious that all of these states can obtain and that they proceed by stages. One after the other, existence without dominance. Dominance in general, partial dominance, complete dominance, but as a stranger out of one's sphere, complete dominance in one's sphere as a man who is lord of his home. These five stages proceed from the very nature in, of the process. They are not subject to whys or wherefores. All you need to know now, however, is the division I mentioned to you in the beginning, complete dominance of the soul, partial dominance of the body, complete dominance of the body, this being what is necessary for an understanding of God's ordinance as a whole. And as to the five stages that I mentioned, let them be well remembered by you. For I know that you will find things in the words of the sages, a proper understanding of which is contingent upon this preference. This, however, is not their place. If so, let us speak of these three time states. Our sages have taught us that this world will exist for 6,000 years, after which the 7,000th year it will lie waste and, succeeding that, will be renewed by the Holy One, blessed be He. This is quoted in Sanhedrin 97b. They have said further about the 7,000th year, also quoted from San Sanhedrin 92 Omid Aleph. What do the righteous do? The Holy One, blessed be He, fashions wings for them and they hover above the waters, as it is written in Yeshaya 40 verse 31. And those who hope in the Lord will be regenerated in strength. On the surface, we detect three times 6,000 years. The 7,000th year, the renewal of the world. For 6,000 years, the world remains as it is now. In the 7,000th year, the world has not yet been renewed, and the righteous are in a form in which they were resurrected, except that the Holy One, blessed be He, fashions wings for them. In the 8,000th year, the Holy One, blessed be He, renews His world completely. In the world as it is now, we see the body in a state of complete dominance, as a man who is lord of his home, this being its place and no other. In the 7,000th year, however, the righteous rise from the earth and the body remains outside its natural sphere, as a man wandering from home or as a guest lodging for the night. For this reason, it will manifest no dominance, but will correspond in status to that of Moses, our teacher of blessed memory, in his ascent of Mount Sinai. Once he rose above the earth, he no longer followed the ways of the earth dwellers. It is in this respect that our sages referred to the seventh thousandth year as, and I quote from St. Edwin 97 on with Allah, a day which is all Sabbath, eternal rest. The body rested from all corporeal functions, which are represented by the days of the week. At this stage, however, the body has not yet abrogated its nature, for the creation has not yet been renewed. But from this renewal onwards, a period referred to as, I quote from Eruvin 22 Amadala, tomorrow to receive their rewards. There is no further need for the dominance of the body, such dominance being necessary only for the performance of divine service in its time, but its essence will be subsumed in that of the soul, so that it will rejoice eternally in the heavenly goods. But are not the seven thousandth year and the renewal of the world outside the realm of our knowledge? How then can we speak of them? Indeed, we shall not speak of them, but the existence of these times and their general character we know for certain. It is these that we speak of in respect to body and soul, but we certainly cannot conceptualize and know the details of these times. The period of the 6,000 years, however, is known to us and conceived quite specifically. And it is this period which our discussion will center upon in detail. The two other times we can know only in a general manner, 
as those in which the body loses its dominance and the soul ascends to its original preeminence. If so, let us then speak of what we have been permitted and are able to conceive. We must now understand man's first state in this world, the time of his divine service. The nature of this service we have already explained. The removal of any imperfection found in this creation. The evil which exists now and which is destined to be annulled. It is man's task, however, to labor to eradicate it from himself first and subsequently from the entire creation as far as is in his power. As our sages have said, and I'll quote from Sanhedrin 37 Omad Aleph, a man must say, for my sake, the world was created. Our sages have explained this in the Midrash of Yalkut Shimoni Choshea 532 on the verse in Hosea 14 verse 2, for you have stumbled in your sins. Rab Shimai said, this is analogous to a tall rock standing at the crossroads and causing the passerby to stumble. The king commands, chip it down little by little until the time comes when I will remove it from the world. What must now be explained are the details of this service and the manner in which this perfection is achieved for man and the world. What must be clarified first, however, is the idea of the existence of this evil, the cause of this entire laborious regimen, all of its delimitations, its nature and ramification, the source of its great power, the process by which it is chipped down as per the formulation of the sages, and the manner in which it is removed from the world. Evil is an entirely novel phenomenon that the Creator willed and created to try men by, so as to give them room for divine service. There was no intimation of this phenomenon, nor anything approaching it, before the Creator originated it. For the Blessed One is the essence of good and perfection. Anything which is good, though originated, is regarded as attributable to the Blessed One, and as somewhat approaching His nature. But this evil, to the contrary, is something that is entirely opposed to his nature. Neither it is, neither it nor anything approaching it having name or remembrance at all before being originated by the Creator, as we explain. But it lies within God's omnipotence to create something which is entirely contrary to his nature, to make it known and acknowledge that his power is absolutely unlimited as it is written in Yeshaya 45 verse 7. I fashion light and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these. Still, the Blessed One who created it did so only that it can be eradicated, as we indicated in the uh, previous citation of the sages. And he created it only within those limits and with that nature that he willed. For in the last analysis, the intent is only to pick from evil goodly fruits for the righteous, so that they enjoy a just reward in this world. This certainly must be thoroughly understood, for I see that it embraces many ideas. I must first set down a very fundamental preface. Please do. You must know that all, the, all that possesses being or existence does so only by virtue of the Blessed One's providence former being in direct correlation with the latter. This concept was well explained by the great sage Maimonides of blessed memory in his Guide to the Perplexed. In many chapters of the second section, including the tenth, this concept is illustrated by the influence of the stars, which we know to have engendered all the activities of this terrestrial world. As our sages have stated in Boratius Rabbah 10 verse 6, there is no blade of grass which below which does not have a star in heaven that strikes it and says grow, as he explains. These, however, act only according to the powers invested in them by the Creator and exert influence only within the bounds of what they receive from Him, for He is the source of all providence. 
It is in, the, in this respect that in chapter 12, he interprets Jeremiah 17:13, and I quote, the source of living waters, the Lord. And also in Psalms 36, 10, for with you is the source of life. This was uttered by King David, may peace be upon him, in reference to the bounty of existence. The overall idea, according to Maimonides, is that when it is clear that he is incorporeal and it has been established that all works are his, we may speak of the world as originating in his providence and of his providence as giving rise to all that occurs in it. Similarly, we speak of God as being providential of his wisdom. You have already heard that all that is wrought for us by the Creator there is not one deed that relates to his pure essence, which is exalted above all creation and praise. For he in himself is certainly elevated above all that applies to his creatures. But all of his acts are aspects of what the Blessed One had originated in his will and desire. They are varieties of providence that he willed and originated to exercise their influence within the order that he degreed in his awesome wisdom all relating to the nature of the entities that he willed into being. It is seen then that both cause and effect originate in God's will, that cause being the varieties and ways of providence and the effect of the creations. And the Blessed One originated varieties and manners of providence in accordance with the varieties of entities that he willed, for each different form of providence gives rise to a correspondingly different kind of creation. This is clear. Providence of wisdom is of one kind, that of strength is another kind, that of wealth is still another kind, and so on with all the others. This is the Holy One, blessed be He, then, not able to create all things with one form of providence? By providence is meant what comes down to the creatures, creatures from the Creator in His working, something for them. What we perceive of it is not in point of the doer, for we do not know how the Holy One better be he acts, but in point of what is done. And when power and strength come down from the Creator to the created, the providence through which they come down is the providence of strength, it having been the supreme will that the providence results in strength. When wisdom comes down, it is the providence of wisdom that it generates it. Reverting to our subject, good and evil, we see good and evil arising in this world. How do you conceive of their channels of providence? Well, isn't this obvious? What is good proceeds from the providence of good, and what is evil proceeds from that of evil. I'll tell you two things. First, there is no providence of evil, God forbid, with respect to the Holy One, blessed be He. For He is the source of good, and evil cannot proceed from the source of good. Where then does evil come from? Isn't it written in Isaiah 45 verse 7, I make peace and create evil? It is written, create evil, not make evil. He brings evil into existence, for if he did not do so, it would not exist. But he certainly does not make it actively. If so, how is it made? It is written in Psalms 30 verse 8. Lord, in your will you established my mountain of strength. You hid your face, I was confounded. Also in Psalms 104 verse 29, when you hid your face, they were confounded. And Moses, our teacher of blessed memory, stated in Deuteronomy 31 verse 17, I will hide my face from them and they will be consumed. The idea is that the Holy One, blessed be he, does good directly through his providence of good, but evil is nothing other than the absence and suspension of his providence to a lesser or a greater degree. The providence of good comes with all that is needed for the benefit of its object, and its complete suspension and absence would result in the complete nullification of its object. If, however, the providence itself is not completely suspended, but only certain aspects of its perfection, its object will reflect this imperfection, but it will not be completely eliminated. For example, the providence of existence and life, when complete, 
in all of its salutary features will produce in its object life and health and if it is completely withdrawn its object will perish if it is not completely withdrawn however but only some of its characteristics and aspects of creation perfection its object will not perish but will become ill and live a life of suffering this is clear we cannot then speak of good and evil as two varieties of providence as you thought but they are the results rather of the manifestation of providence or of its absence completely or in part this is the first point what is the second point that you were going to speak of if we look into the nature of things we will find that evils are nothing other than the lack of the corresponding goods themselves if we took all of the varieties of good in the world and gained a thorough understanding of them and so with all the varieties of evil we would find that the evils are nothing other than the absence of those goods themselves we cannot therefore speak of two varieties of providence but of providence and its absence of or suspension whether completely or incompletely as we have explained if so this world which is certainly a composite where we find good and evil we must say of it that it was created in two ways through providence and through suspension of providence is this to be wondered at is it obvious and indisputable that all that is good proceeds from the blessed one's providence and all that is evil from the absence and suspension of that providence and if we witness good and evil let us understand that the lord has wrought two things he has manifested and withdrawn his providence so that these two creations were created but this i do not understand you're saying that creations proceed from providence stands to reason but how can they proceed from absence of providence existence cannot result from non-existence we seem to be confronted with an inescapable alternative either evil was directly created by the holy one blessed be he or it could not have been created and made to exist at all when we say that the holy one blessed be he created this world we must understand that first there was general creation and then specific creation that is first nature itself and then its constituents when the blessed one wills to originate nature with good and evil there was certainly a providence emanating from him for the origination of nature and this is the good but part of this providence itself was lacking that is its positive orientations and aspects of perfection which give nature its character of good and it is this lack which originated in nature a corresponding lack of good which is the generality of evil for nature is certainly rendered defective when providence does not abide within it now after these two states were originated in nature in general its individual constituents were created some within the order of good and others within that of evil certainly these constituents too were brought into being through providence for as we established at the outset nothing has being without providence but this providence followed that mentioned previously the providence which engendered in nature as a whole existence and defect it follows therefore that there could be taken from the general creation of nature from the good and evil that had already been uh, uh, that had already been originated what was necessary for the composition of its individual constituents observe that i am not speaking here of the complete suspension of providence for this would unquestionably result in the complete elimination of its objects this being the absence i spoke of which cannot cause presence but this providence was occluded only partially in respect to some of its characteristics and the elements of perfectibility this is comparable to a man's falling ill but not dying in the same way nature in general is rendered defective by this partial withdrawal of providence whence originates evil which is nothing other than a flaw in the perfection of nature but our axiom remains in violate the holy one blessed be he does good alone he does not do evil the latter proceeds only from the absence of his providence 
I have finally understood how evil came into existence. We must now complete this subject by exploring all of its delimitations. An important preface is first necessary. Even though it foreexisted in the nature of the Blessed One to perform all of these deeds, for he is not susceptible of any change at any time, still these things cannot be referred to as having existed in potentiality and awaiting materialization in actuality. This is one of the errors stumbled into by believers of the eternity of the universe. The truth is that all that relates to God prior to the creation of the world is absolutely unfathomable to us and cannot be referred to in any of the terms that we now employ. And we cannot speak of potentiality or actuality with all of the implications that stem from a potentiality actuality relationship but when he wished to create the world he himself originated the phenomenon of potentiality and actuality and he himself made the world and all of its creatures in the beginning in potentiality and subsequently in actuality thus originating this order of potentiality and actuality for through his first command in the creation of the universe the world existed in potentiality and afterwards it materialized in actuality it is this idea that is intimated in the dictum of our sages a quote from Rosh Hashanah 32 on Rudala, in the beginning from Genesis 1.1 also constitutes a command of creation. It is different from the other commands in that at this point the universe existed in potentiality and had not yet emerged into actuality. It is when the world was created in potentiality however that all of these elements of providence that we mentioned came into being after which they emerged in actuality according to their status in potentiality, as we explained. I shall reveal to you yet another deep concept relating to this matter, the general essence of the world in all of its times. The root of all is that the Blessed One desired and willed to bequeath of his goodness to the beings that he willed to create. And to this end, he originated in an order of illumination and providence proceeding from him and adapted to the level of these beings that he willed to create. What the Blessed One desired in this providence is that it constitu constitute a providence of holiness itself, emanating from him, God being the essence and the source of holiness, and that it have consequences of holiness only, as is the case with the angels, who experience nothing but absolute holiness. In the same way, the exclusive content behind the origination of this providence is that something of the Blessed One's holiness be imparted to his creatures, so that they may ultimately bask in the splendor of his holiness. But because he willed the existence of this lowly world, he likewise decreed that his providence be of a lower order, to give rise to these lowly earthly things. This is certainly demeaning to it, for it was not originated for this purpose. It emerges then that the lowly earthy aspects of his providence that we witness constitute a diminution and the meaning of this providence itself. For it is constrained to clothe itself in these forms, which are a degradation to it, the providence of a blessed one, the source of perfection and holiness. But thus it was it conceived in the blessed one's mind to cloak his providence in these dark forms until such time as it will strip itself of all these vestments and appear in its clear, pure form, when the creation and all that relates to it will be completely consecrated to the Lord. At the time of man's divine service, this providence is enclosed in these forms, but at its conclusion, it will divest itself of them. The Blessed One has fashioned great causative mechanisms and cycles for the attainment of this end, 
Thus, the root of the variations in the world's times is the Blessed One's providence, God varying this providence from ascent to ascent until it arrives at its essential form, at which stage all that arises in the creation will be absolute holiness only, as we explained. In sum, the Blessed One has originated a form of providence channeled from himself to the creations, the essential purpose of which is the emanation of holiness from himself to them. He has further originated forms for this providence, which are lowly and inferior relative to its level of holiness. And he has originated within this providence itself the negating and obstructing factors that I have mentioned. And all of this is a function of the revelation of oneness mentioned previously. Concealment of countenance originates all of these things within the order of his providence, and the subsequent illumination will remove all of these cloaks from his providence. We shall yet speak further of this with God's help. What we must know here is that the supreme decree originated things within this providence itself which are the source of what is afterwards found in the world. For only after all of these preparations did he create this lowly world, structured on all of these grounds and composed of all of these elements, to revolve from one condition to another in accordance with the supreme will. This preface is indeed essential for an understanding of all the many prerequisites for the existence of this world, the character of which is not complete until all of these preconditions have been met. Let us now complete our subject. We have already mentioned that the, this evil was created only within the limits desired by the Supreme Will, and though the Creator originated prospective nullification for the created entities, He did so only in respect to imperfect entities. The perfect entities will not be nullified, but will exist eternally. For this reason, we now witness such nullification of the world's entities, a phenomenon which will not obtain in time to come. For it is only because the creation is now imperfect that he decreed nullification for it. In time to come, however, the new heaven and the new earth will be originated. Their creation will be perfect and they will not be subject to nullification. It is seen then that the first providence, which created nature in general and its obstruction, which created corresponding defects in nature, was not a type of providence which could create perfect things, such as the new heaven and earth that are destined to arise, for they will not undergo nullification as we explained. But this providence had in its nature to create only imperfect things, and for this reason it was invested with the instrumentality for nullification, a requisite for the existence of defect in nature. And the second providence, which engendered the individual constituents of nature, compounded of good and evil, is one that isolates the evil so that they do not obliterate the creation. They are kept within bounds by the power of God's decree and constrained by his command not to grow in strength and blot out what exists, but to obtain in such degree and bound as is necessary to establish the character of existence. And they are so adjusted as to grow in strength at such times as such intensification is needed, and to diminish in strength when necessary, all as dictated by the needs of the time in accordance with the decree of the supreme will. The result is that there are certainly imperfections and defects in nature, but they are not so great as to blot out the creation. The evils are so attuned, however, as to ultimately intensify to the degree in which its subject object will be obliterated, for all that exists is destructible, and their existence hangs on a very fine thread within the fabric of the supreme wisdom. It is to be noted that the supreme understanding which originated the first providence that we have spoken of, dictated the origination of nullification. It is for this reason that this providence was not created perfect from the beginning, so that there be, no ne there be negation and evil in the world, as we explained, and not, God forbid, 
because of any lack of ability or strength in the Creator. What is destined to be done in respect to the new heaven and earth that we mentioned could have been done from the beginning, but heaven and earth were expressly created imperfect so that they would be subject to nullification. In the second providence, however, designed to give existence to the individual creations, the intent of the supreme thought was to truly rescue them from obliteration and withhold it until the appointed time, as we explained. Accordingly, nullification was not nullified, but evils were bounded and placed within the confines necessary for the establishment of the character of the world, as we explained until the time came when all evil would be removed from existence and all of the creations would remain perfect and eternal. Remember, however, what I have already spoken of previously, that the foundations of all of the God's conducts which with us are two qualities, concealment of countenance and illumination of countenance, the results of which are perfection and defect, and proceeding from them, good and evil. The existence of evil, however, proceeds from complete concealment of the Blessed One's countenance. For the Supreme Will, in desiring to create man of soul and body, as per the soul body character of man that we witness today, equalized his, his qualities to operate conjointly. The quality of concealment of countenance and that of illumination of countenance exercising one and not relinquishing the other, to establish all the characteristics of man in due proportion, the weak and the strong, the noble and the lowly, all that is demanded by his existence in terms of its underlying purpose. Here, however, a certain preface is needed. A particular creature is not called evil simply because it is lacking perfection, for there may be an imperfection which, though it not, cannot be regarded as absolute perfection and good is not evil. For example, the angels are certainly lacking vis-à-vis -vis complete perfection, a state attributable to the Creator only, and among them there are many ranks and levels, one angel being lower than the other and lacking something in respect to him. Still, their imperfection is not so great as to create in them what is absolutely evil. For they are completely free of envy and hatred, they have no evil inclination, they are not given to sleep or fatigue, and they are not subject to sickness or health. But human beings are lower than the angels and deficient in respect to them, and their deficiency is so great that there is in them what is evil, possessing, as they do, an evil inclination and being subject to sickness and death. The animals are even more imperfect lacking in intellect or speech, and being foul and sullied. And there are destructive agents, angels of destruction, and spirits of impurity that are evil in themselves. The very opposite of good and perfection, those which the Blessed One conceals himself from completely, in keeping with Boratius Rabbah 3.6, the Holy One, blessed be he, does not ally his name with evil. It is the chain of imperfection, however, which ultimately produces evil. For when this chain extends itself and imperfection is added to imperfection, eventually it will generate what is absolutely evil. Before the Blessed One originated the special order of conduct for the purposes of his creatures, there was no room for any imperfection whatsoever. But when he originated this order, this amounted to his originating an order which, in its resolution, would produce evil. For once imperfection exists, absolute evil is bound to follow. One of the chief phenomena originated by the Blessed One in that of measurement and limit. For in his abstract state, measurement and limit do not obtain. But in, ex in accordance with his desire for an order of levels, he fashioned all with measurement and ordered all creatures by level, one beneath the other, from first to last. And on each level he measured how much there would be of imperfection and how much would remain of good imperfection. And according to this measurement, 
Thus is the nature of what is generated on each particular level, in all of its facets and modes, all operating within their own context, each within its own framework. Because the Blessed One manifests two quality conjointly, concealment of countenance and illumination of countenance, as we mentioned, there are engendered the entities of soul and body, the body being inferior in nature to the soul and containing imperfections that are absent in the latter. But this does not make it evil, since, however, the Blessed One wills to originate an entity of evil, which is the exact opposite of this perfection, as we explained. He concealed his countenance to the greatest possible extent, until, when it was completely concealed and entirely unilluminated, there arose absolutely malign entities, and he created, and I quote, the corrupter to destroy. Evil, then, is found to consist in the Blessed One's withdrawing himself from the direct governance of the universe, conducting it from afar, in the intensity of the darkness of his concealment. Investing in this nature all the excises of good, all the juridical mechanisms to execute judgment upon all that is hidden and upon the world. But the anger of the Holy One, blessed be he, is only momentary. He assumes wrath only to the degree necessary for the creation of those fiery serpents destined for Gehinnom, which, with which to smite the evildoer to the extent of his evil. After this, he reverted and set his countenance, as it were, towards the individual creation, that their rise exist and not be obliterated, though they may be susceptible of such obliteration. The Righteous One thus set his path for the perfection of the creation and not for its undoing, and he turned and shone his face upon the world uh, awaiting creation. If he had generated great illumination, the creatures would have been created in their ultimate perfection, that is, in the forms of their eternal existence. But he did not do so. Instead, he created creatures existing and enduring, but not eternally. However, he placed it within the unravelling of his ordinance to move all that he created for his honour to perfect itself in his perfection, to the end of his illuminating his universe with a great intense light the result of which will be the perfect eternal existence of the world. The evil that he created, he will remove from the earth. What is more, all creatures will acknowledge his having benefited them by what he did in his earlier epoch. As it is written in Isaiah 12 verse 1, I will thank you, O Lord, for your wrath against me. I have already discussed this previously. Please summarize what you have stated until now. The Blessed One, in his desire to originate a general creation of good and evil, so that his creatures will be compounded of both, manifested a providence creating the presence of good in nature, and that good was stamped into it. Then he turned and removed the perfection of that providence by completely concealing his countenance of his goodness as a result of which all of nature's defects were stamped into it. After that, he reverted and, through the illumination of his countenance, created creatures, the constituents of nature, in one compound of good and evil, in their present characters, existing but subject to perdition, not being eternal. And, ultimately, he will cause his countenance to shine with great light, he will remove negation from nature, and his creatures will remain perfect and eternal. I shall now explain to you the essence of man in respect of the existence of evil which we have mentioned. Please continue, I'm listening. The essence of man proceeds from profound, unfathomable wisdom. For the Creator fashioned many great creations, one greater than the other, and greater than these above them. All of them are indispensable, nothing having been created in vain, but all of them stand on a single foundation. What the Blessed One desires man to do through his service, to correct all the imperfections in the creation and to raise himself ascent after ascent until he unites himself with the Blessed One's holiness. 
To this end, he invested the universe with all of those agencies fostering removal from him, with all of their ramifications, and with all of those agencies fostering alliance with him, with all of their ramifications. All of these are awesomely profound, and all are so attuned as to resolve themselves into the universal perfection. And the Supreme Will desired that man be involved in all of them, that they all be moved by the movements and actions of man. They can be compared, as it were, to a great mechanism, a kind of clock, whose wheels are conjoined in such a way that one small wheel moves many great ones. So has the Blessed One conjoined all of his creations in great ties, and he has connected all to man, so that, through his deeds, he is the mover, and all the others are moved through him. And he has concealed all behind this earthy covering of skin and flesh, so that only this bodily layer is visible. But in truth, there are great things behind it, great mechanisms that the Holy One, blessed be he, created in his world to this end, in concourse with the great deeds and divine service of man, towards his ascent and growth in holiness, or towards his descent and falling off in it, God forbid, and all of the many other states. But this can be apprehended only by the soul in all of its parts and in all of its roots, which he included in his body. This is what King David was alluding to in Psalms 40 verse 6. You have done many things, O Lord my God, your wonders and your thoughts towards us. And also in Psalms 139 verse 14. I will thank you, for I have been singled out for wonders. Your deeds are wondrous, and my soul knows it well. For the body cannot conceive these many things, as the soul can, for they are perceptible not, er, not through earthiness, but only through spirituality. One of the aspects of this mechanism, as we explained, is evil in all of its facets, and all of those things necessary for the first stage of man in this world. And all of these serve the end of the revelation of God's oneness, as I explained earlier. The revelation of light from the midst of the darkness. From the initial concealment of countenance in all of its ramifications will follow revelation of oneness in the end. Now understand that the Supreme Will desired the active manifestation of the truth of his oneness as we explained before, and this by means of all of the cycles that he set in motion in his universe, as indicated by the verse cited previously in, from Yeshaya 43.10, so that you should know and believe me and understand that I am God, and also from Deuteronomy 32.39, see now that I, I am he, for in the beginning he desires to manifest this in actuality and sets the entire cycle in motion to resolve itself in this point. But when this has been achieved, i.e. when it has been manifested in actuality, from that point on there will, be, there will ensue unification and attainment, his creatures attaining union with him and joy in the perfection of his oneness, which will have been revealed. They will bask in the splendor of his presence and attain through this perfection states more profound than the first, without end, through all eternity. We find then two varieties of action in respect to the Blessed One. The first is what he will do after his oneness is revealed and actively believed in by human beings. This embraces the generality of reward and recompense the essence and details of which cannot now be apprehended by the body. What we know for certain, however, is that the general character of this reward can be described as, I quote, basking in the splendor of the Blessed One's holiness, as our sages stated in Barachot 17a, the righteous sit, their crowns upon their heads, and bask in the splendor of the Divine Presence. And, unquestionably, there will be many different varieties of pleasure. It's a, a fortiori that what we see in this world, which is like a fleeting shadow, and yet has many different varieties of pleasure invested in it by the Creator for human beings to enjoy, although in their generality they are pleasures of the senses only. 
How much more so in the world that is all good, though they will, will own, obtain only one type of pleasure, the only good that there being the spiritual good of understanding and of union with God. Still, the facets of that good will be highly variegated. This is what I told you of the providence of the Blessed One, that it was originated only to engender spiritual states of holiness. The second variety is what the Blessed One does while this truth is revealing itself, the process of its revelation not yet having been completed, that is, from the beginning of the creation to the ultimate redemption, may it take, take place speedily and in our days. It having been said of that time, and I quote from Zechariah 14.9, And God will be king over the earth. On that day the Lord will be one and his name will be one. But all of these mechanisms that we mentioned previously relate to the second variety, the revelation of God's oneness and this through the concealment of countenance that precedes the revelation as we have explained previously. And involved in these mechanisms is the idea of evil that we mentioned. Thus, whereas evil in itself is nothing but defect and loss and destruction, still, in conjunction with the other mechanisms, to the contrary, it is the source of man's good itself. For upon it hinges all merit and possibility of divine service. And this, by its being intended not to conquer, but to be conquered. That is, it exists only to be hewn down by man, as the stone at the crossroads in the previously mentioned parable. Evil, then, was created to be destroyed, and it may be regarded in two ways, in point of its existence or in point of its eradication, or in terms of its beginning or of its ends. In terms of its beginning, it is certainly evil, but in terms of its ends, it is all to the good. For the very time, it is asserting its power, it is acting as the precursor of goods. For this is the darkness through which the light of the supreme perfection will be recognized when it reveals itself in time to come. What is more, this is the elucidation of the truth of his oneness in all of its vividness, as we explained previously. And from this aspect, the darker it grows, the greater will be the revelation of the truth of his oneness when he destroys this evil. And what is more, this evil affords gain to the one who is tested by it, as in the parable of our sages, of the prostitute and the prince, this is quoted from Barachot 32 Omadalov. And in addition, it creates for man the opportunity for true service and action, for he perfects the creation with his own hands, removes imperfections from it, and becomes a partner in the world, as it were with the Holy One, blessed be he. An additional factor is the test of the righteous provided by the evil, not in the sense of temptation to sin, which we have already spoken of, but the test itself which arises from the Creator's concealing his countenance. For did not God declare through all of his prophets that it is he who superintends all of his creatures and that his eyes are on all the ways of man to requite each man according to his ways and is in accordance with the fruit of his actions? A God of faith without wrong? And after having told us all this, he conducts his world through deep manipulation and counsel from afar which betoken, ostensibly, the opposite of all this, God forbid. For at certain times it seems as if all is in the hands of a completely gratuitous chance, and at others as if the workers of evil have been upraised, and the men of valour, the servants of God, have not received the rewards of their efforts and labours. How many cry out and are not heard. All consider and consider all of the other situations created by God with which to try the hearts of men. This is what is alluded to by King David in Psalms 73 verse 2. And as for me, my feet also slipped, for I envied the revelers. And this is precisely the test, to see if men will remain strong in their faith and not deviate from the firm conviction in their hearts, which will enable them to say, 
He is certainly a God of faith, without wrong, even though we do not understand his ways. And it is in this respect that it is written in Habakkuk 2, verse 4, and the righteous will live in his faith, as we have already explained previously. There was a great gain to be derived then from the concealment of the supreme perfection, and God has left room for evil to darken the face of the world for a test as great as this. Consider in light of this how beloved by the Blessed One will be those righteous men who withstand such a trial, and how great will be the reward for their divine service in time to come. And it is in the realm of the Blessed One's honour that even the greater darkness of the concealment of the countenance of His goodness redounds to His glory and results in manifold reward to the righteous. This evil, however, is destined to result in good only through these mechanisms that we mentioned, the wheels of cause and effect that turn everything towards the good. We have already mentioned that this evil, in isolation from these mechanisms, is indeed evil and bitter, destruction and loss. However, within the framework of these mechanisms, it too may be regarded as one of man's needs and as one of the essential complements of his being. For though, in terms of its essential nature, it is, indeed, exclusively a force for the working of evil, yet, in combination with all of the mechanisms established by the Creator for the attainment of perfect perfection, it exists only to be vanquished, as we explained. Man must be invested with the evil inclination and with all of the evil lusts, not to be swayed by them, but to subdue them and rid himself of them. With all this, it does not lose its evil nature. But this, too, is a good that evil form part of a man's being as we explained. And this evil does not in itself affect loss and defectiveness in a man. This, by the virtue of the positive components of man's nature, as we explained. Ultimately, however, when the true fruits of these mechanisms for which they were originally established will eventually emerge, it will reveal itself as the eradication of evil itself from existence and the perfection of all imperfection. We find then that when the Creator established His world, as we explained, He invested in it all that was necessary for this first stage of man, the time of divine service. He then originated evil in the fullness of its nature and its powers, in isolation, possessing as many powers and parts as those of divine service and perfection relating to man. Afterwards, he completed his work by creating all of the mechanisms that we mentioned, designed to do all that is necessary for the removal of this evil, to lift man through his assets, and to fill all of the other needs of his perfection and good. Within this framework, evil is not given free vent to exercise all its powers, but, on the contrary, it is vulnerable to all of the forces that the Blessed One created for the eradication of evil, and it is within this context that this lowly world and humanity were subsequently created. The result is that the entire quality of good, the generality of all these heavenly mechanisms that we mentioned, as well as the quality of evil itself, both are instruments for good in the construct of man. The end result of the whole is the emergence of the fruit of the entire process, the universal perfection. But as long as this process has not been completed, although evil too is intended for man's good to be vanquished by him, it can also be to his detriment, God forbid, if he does not vanquish it. For then, evil is not perfection for then, evil and not perfection will gain the ascendancy, but at the end of the process, when evil will have been eradicated, the tranquility of the creation will be eternal, never ceasing. We have thus far spoken of evil in general. It is now necessary to be more specific. Evil divides itself into two categories. The first, lowliness and baseness. The second, the creation's sus suspectability to deterioration, which we shall speak of each in turn. As regards the first, lowliness and baseness, even the angels themselves are ranged in descending order of rank. 
In spite of this, however, they are all pure, all noble and precious. The baseness we are speaking of applies only to man's body and to what is beneath it. All this ultimately tracing itself through bodily, earthly channels to, and I quote from Genesis 2 verse 7, dust from the earth. In spite of all this, however, understand that if man were on this level appropriate for him, this bodily condition would not be accounted lowly and shameful to him. For he who is on a level appropriate to his nature is in his proper place and not really to be characterized as base, though the level itself may be a lowly one. Lowliness and baseness in the true sense are referable to one who could have attained the higher level and for whom such a level would have been appropriate and who yet remained on a lowly and inferior plane in respect to it. But I'm speaking in general terms. Let us now enter into particulars and understand the essence of man in his superiority, his inferiority and on all of his levels. You will find profound wisdom in this inquiry. For God created a great variety of conditions for man, so that he experienced all that is required in respect to divine service and reward in all times. We should explain this in detail. Man acts and his acts have consequences. For in the light of the mechanisms that we have mentioned, it is seen that man's slightest movement may, moves many great systems. The generality of all the heavenly and earthly creations, physical and spiritual, all the operant powers and the Blessed One's providence in them as we explained. And with all this, not all men are alike, nor are all acts alike. For the Blessed One has set great bounds between all of his creatures, with great infinite precision so that two men may be seated at the same table, speaking, eating and drinking, and yet the acts of one may reach the heavenly heights in their ramifications, and those of the other not ascend and not reproach them at all. I will prove this to you quite clearly, and I quote from Sukkah 28 Amadalaf, Yonathan Ben Uziel sits and learns, every bird that flies over him is burnt. Thousands and tens of thousands of others sit and learn and nothing like this happens to them. So much in respect to the doer. As regards the object acted upon, the same principle is illustrated by the instance of sanctified food, the eating of which is a great mitzvah, while the eating of non-sanctified food is not so, though they are both eaten in the same manner. The priest who eats sanctified food is performing a mitzvah, whereas a non-priest who does so incurs the death penalty. And even greater indication are the mitzvot themselves. Our sages have said in Avodah Zarah 3 Amadalev, greater is he who does when commanded than he who does when not commanded. The former perfects the entire creation, whereas the latter does not attain to this level yet they are both performing the same act with the same intent. But the truth of the matter is that the conditions of the doer and the object acted upon and everything attendant upon them are what alter and change the results of the acts because Yonatan ben Uziel was an awesomely holy man, his soul crowned with holiness and great light. Every one of his acts ascended, reached the heavenly heights and moved all of the wheels of holiness, the acts of another man, who is not that holy and not crowned with these crowns, will not undergo a similar ascent. Here there is a great variation in scale, depending upon the state of preparation of the individual, of his deeds themselves of the time, and of all the other attendant factors. This indeed is the general state of preparation with which the Holy One, blessed be he, invested his people, Israel, in the beginning to have them fulfill and perform all of Torah and Mitzvah. For without this, they could not effect through their deeds the great perfection that they achieved for the universe in general, as we shall explain. With all this, however, this variation in scale that we mentioned obtains even among them there being no comparison between the deeds of one who is not a Torah scholar and those of one who is. 
or between those of a Torah scholar himself, who is not exceptionally holy in his deeds, and those of one who is holier than he, or between those of one who is holy and those of one who is holier, one of the chosen few called upon by the Lord, and so on, until Moses, our teacher, may peace be upon him. Here you must know something of the human species in general, descending in all things from Adam, and subject to much differentiation and variety of time. For Adam, before his sin, was adorned and crowned with great adornments of holiness and preciousness, to the point where the ministering angels desired to chant holy before him, as stated by our sages in the Midrash in Bereshit Rabbah 88 verse 6, and he possessed knowledge and holiness with every noble quality in great degree, being as he was the handiwork of the Holy One, blessed be he. And being so, his deeds certainly shook all the worlds, for as he was, so were they, unquestionably more majestic and exalted than any deeds which would be wrought afterwards under the sun. And with all this, he could have ascended to even greater heights if he had only abided by the Lord's command. For this is obvious, what is destined to take place after the resurrection could have occurred in the very beginning, even without death. But note that even though he was exalted far above the human species as we know it today, he was still susceptible of deterioration, still liable to sin and to die, as was indeed borne out by the succeeding events. If he had abided by his command, he would have achieved absolute perfection, eternal existence and insuspectability to any evil. By sinning, however, not only did he gain, did he not gain what he could have gained, but even lost what he had already possessed, and became the lowly, shameful man that he is now, as stated by Scripture in Psalms 49, verse 13. Adam, not resting in preciousness, became likened to the beasts. We find then three variations in man's status: his status before the sin, his status after the sin. What could have been his status if he had not sinned, as will actually be his status in time to come? His status before the sin is a middle stage between what it became afterwards and what it could have been had he not sinned. We find in any event that man was not created complete, but underwent a preliminary lowering by the Creator, being created in a lesser state than, he was, than was appropriate for him and being subject to further lowering if he would sin and be guilty, as was the case. All of these are conditions prepared by the Blessed One, originated and created for the necessary conduct of the world. Let us now make some further discriminations in this subject so that we understand it thoroughly. Our sages have stated in Tanchuma Acharemot, the mass of Adam's heel paled the solar orb. And they enumerated six things that Adam lost through his sins. This is from the Midbar Rabbah 1311. Amongst them, height and radiance. The idea is that the Blessed One makes everything with exceedingly great precision, and all of the aspects of things are determined by the perfection residing within them. And, as it applies to our subject, even man's build and form and the form of all that relates to him are determined by his importance and significance. We have already cited the verse in Genesis uh, 1.26, Let us make a man in our image according to our likeness. Because he desired man to be superior to all creatures, he des desired likewise that his outward form be reflective of this superiority and not his form and build alone, but he desired that all that occurs within him and all that relates to him conform to his superior state. Observe how much of cleanliness and of beautiful arrangement he invested in the creation of man that he did not invest in all the creation of the beasts. And this is the context of the profundity of the great wisdom characterizing all of the Blessed One's acts is doing all in the best possible manner, everything through the establishment of parallels and interconnections within fitting relationships. 
Note that man can be in only one place at any given time and requires a period of time to move from one place to another. The angels, because they are exalted above this body, are not limited thus, but flying has been ascribed to them in their ethereality. The senses of man function only within the measure and the bounds delimiting them, not so with spiritual entities. In sum, the accidents of a thing, in all of its aspects, are always relative to the essential nature of that being. We find then that there are two discriminations we must make in relation to man and all the other creations. First, the establishment of those things that are affected by their existence and their accidents, that is, the results of their being and acting. Second, their manner and operation, that is, their form and the form of their activities. For what moves the body can also move the soul or an angel, but each in its individual manner. And these two factors are paramount considerations in the Blessed One's activities. First, the establishment of what is affected by the activity of the creatures, and this includes all of the ordinances of his conduct and orders of his mechanisms that we mentioned. Second, the establishment in the manner of the, which those creations affect those results. And in this area too, there are great orders that are proper and necessary for the fulfillment of their functions. Accordingly, we find that in the beginning, before his sin, Adam was on a very high level. First, in point of his existence, that is, in terms of the results of his deeds, which rose to the world's heights, as we wrote previously. And second, in point of his form and the form of his deeds, in the very structure of his body. For the purity of his body paralleled the nature of the angels, so that his proper habitation was the Garden of Eden, which is now, too, the habitation of the angels and the spirits. Our sages intimated this in their statements, and I quote from Voracious Rabbah 20, verse 12. In the Torah of Rabbi Meir, it was found written, vestments of light. This has already been much commented upon by our sages to the effect that it is meant to emphasize the purity of Adam's body before his sin, a body which after his sin became coarse, gross and ponderous, as at the present day. We have actually witnessed the parallel to Adam's original condition in our world, in the instances of Hanukkah and Elijah whose bodies were actually purified and exalted to the condition of the heavenly angels. And it goes without saying that his movements and acts too were certainly of a rarer, more spiritual order as those of Hanoch and Elijah in our epoch. Note then what the Garden of Eden was. It will unquestionably continue to be a rarefied spiritual abode where the spirits abide even now. And the Torah testifies concerning Adam that he dwelt there and ate and enjoyed the fruits that grew there. But since we see it to be the present habitation of the souls, it must be that its fruits were not earthy, gross things, but far more delicate, being at least as air compared to earth. And the eating of them too was not by a body coarse and gross, as at present, but by a rarefied, almost spiritual body, like that of Elijah and Hanoch, as we explained. It is as we have said, that in accordance with the nature of the results to be achieved through the deeds, so are the ways in which the deeds are executed, and there is an exact correspondence between the nature and the conditions of all of the creations in terms of deeds, results, locale and dua. This is clear. It is to be noted that the corporeality of Adam before his sin corresponded virtually to man's present spirituality. Consider then what his spirituality must have been like and what the ramifications of those deeds must have been. It is sufficient to mention what our sages stated in the aforementioned dictum in the Voracious Rabbah 8 verse 10. The ministering angels desired to chant holy before him. And from this we may deduce what he would have been had he not sinned. 
he would have achieved the great ascent intended for him. For, as we see that Adam's corporeality corresponds to the present spirituality, we, we may justifiably conclude that his corporeality, had he ascended, could have corresponded to his original spirituality. For this is the nature of these things, to progress from ascent to ascent. And this is the general idea between behind the two trees, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge. Certainly scripture is not to be divorced from its plain meaning. The trees were trees, the fruit was fruit, and the eating was eating. But the fruits were rarefied, and the eating was rarefied, to an extent inconceivable to our minds, which can picture only that which is corporeal. But do but do we not observe even mundane fruits to possess properties made use as for healing and other purposes? And do we not reap wonders from natural properties? In the same manner, the fruits of these true trees too were invested with certain properties by the Creator. The fruits of the tree of life were invested with the property of implanting in man's heart correct knowledge, union with and love for the Blessed One, and knowledge of his holy ways, and they removed physical lusts from the soul. The fruits of the tree of knowledge, to the contrary, imbued the heart with physical earthly lusts, and with all of the sins. If Adam had eaten from the tree of life, and not from the tree of knowledge, he would have grown more and more intimate with the holiness of his Creator, and would have rejoiced in it eternally without abatement. But in eating from the tree of knowledge, he became steeped in physical lusts and love of earthliness. Therefore, measure for measure, he lost the glory of his spirituality and remained material in nature for the number of days decreed him until he would have expiated his sin and repented and been healed. Within the context of the great principle quoted in Makot 23 on Madala, once he has been smitten, he is like your brother. At that time he will return to his original strength and complete all that is necessary for his perfection. So much for the first category of evil. The second category of evil is that of deterioration and destruction, as we explained. Know that deterioration is native only to this lowly earthy form, and not to any form superior to it. And when Adam himself was in a more perfect, exalted form, as we explained, he was insuspectable of sickness or injury. But all of this was certainly ordered from the beginning, and in the creation of evil itself it was implanted within the general order of nature, as we explained. And in the light of Adam's original lowering at his creation, how much more obvious it is that this has indeed been done. It emerges then that the Blessed One first originated the providence required for Adam's perfect exalted state, this constituting man's supreme existence in its potential. Subsequently, he willed to lower him, so that he not be in the exalted state appropriate for him, but in a lesser condition, so that room would be left for him to perfect himself by rising to that supreme level appropriate for him. It was the providence then which was lowered first. Its power was weakened and its status and nature lowered, so that it no longer created man in the aforementioned exalted state, but in his lowliness and defectiveness. The crucial factor here is that this providence be prevented from creating exalted perfect creatures, not by virtue of a deficiency in power, for this would have not be considered lowly, but that the impediment be outside it. That is, though in point of its nature it should produce the perfect creation, it is prevented from doing so by the originated evil, which affects this lowering within it. This is alluded to in scripture in Deuteronomy 32 verse 18, you have weakened the rock of your birth, and Numbers 14 16, because of the Lord's not being able. Interpreted by our sages in Brachot 32 on Aleph as alluding to his power being weakened as a woman's as it were. And 
In the lowering of this providence through a weakening of its power, room is provided for absolute evil, as we explained. I now come to the point I mentioned in the beginning. The Creator did not implant a negation and deterioration in the nature of perfected creatures, but in the nature of imperfect ones, so that when the creatures will have perfected themselves in time to come, they will not be subject to negation at all. What I must explain to you now is the nature of this defect in perfection which produces negation. You will find profound wisdom here in the Blessed One's ordinance and in the exceeding preciousness of Israel. My only desire is to know these things completely and thoroughly, each thing and its ramifications. I shall therefore rejoice in the knowledge you impart to me. One who superficially observes the constituents of this creation will, in the beginning, find them to be scattered and separate, that is, not all conjoined to a single end, but each one an entity in itself, serving its particular end, complete in itself and independent of its neighbouring elements. For there are so many elements amongst the inanimate objects, among the vegetative and among the animals, that, one would say, there cannot possibly be an interrelationship, an interdependence and a common goal among all of them. But each one must have been created for its own purpose, and all of its aspects must serve for the attainment of its particular end, and for nothing more. With all this, one cannot fail to notice a hierarchy of levels in nature, and one who would undertake to reflect upon the creations would find all of them represented within this hierarchy. If he began from the heavenly heights and worked downwards to the nethermost depths of the earth, reflecting all the while upon all of the creations, he would find all of them appropriately scaled one beneath the other. But one who probed further in wisdom and found all of the creations interconnected in a solid bond, all being needed to complete the purpose intended by the supreme wisdom in the creation, and all being gathered together for one end, containing a multitude of conditions and a profundity of orders, these in the form of all the con constituents of the creation. They are, therefore, all interrelated in the order willed by the Supreme Intelligence, and from all of them will emerge the goodly fruit which is worthy to emerge from the creation. I have already stated this to be a profound matter, for at this point wisdom must branch out and probe infinity to know the function of every creation and its place in this universal intent that we mentioned. Our sages have said in Okay, of verse chapter 6. All that the Holy One, blessed be He, created in this world, He created only for His honor. Now, we must understand this idea of honor, for it too was originated by the Blessed One, just like all of His other attributes, as I have explained previously. When we understand this attribute, we shall understand the purpose of all these creations and the realization of this honor how they are all needed for it, and how they are all gathered together towards this end. For the present, it is sufficient that we understand this general preface alone, that all the aspects of creation are certainly interconnected and operate conjointly towards one end. A corollary of this understanding is that their perfection is not achieved individually, but in unison with each other for the single end that we mentioned. This is, indeed, their perfection, in that it more directly serves the end for which they were created, the universal end that we mentioned. And in truth, you will see that even in his acts, there is no evil in the world except in elements in isolation, prior to their being seen as contributing elements in a complete process. But there is nothing complete that is evil. The rationale because we know that everything done by the Holy One, blessed be He, is exceedingly good. What seems to be defective in a certain aspect, in one of its conditions, is offset by a different condition, the original defect consisting in a lack of completeness in all conditions. When this completeness is supplied, what is evidenced is certainly good. 
This is borne out by each act in itself, and the universal act, the overall cycle of the world, will also confirm this in the end, with the fulfillment of the prophetic assurance in, from Isaiah 12.1, I will thank you God for your anger against me. For at that time all the aspects of each act will be complete and it will be truly recognized as entirely good. This accounts for our statement that in the beginning the Creator arranged nature as we explained, each species in itself along a graduated scale. And it is in this respect that we speak of negation and deterioration, that is, as they apply to each species in itself. But their interconnection and conjunction towards the universal end, to the contrary, is a correction for this, because by virtue of it, if by virtue of it, they leave the sphere of evil and are rescued from it. And this is what we have already mentioned, that everything created by the Holy One, blessed be He, in His world, He created only for His honor. And this honor is that the Blessed One rejoice in all His creations and provide room, as it were, for all of His creations to rejoice in His good. And the ultimate purpose behind all of His acts is to bring all to absolute perfection, so that the evil will no longer have any existence whatsoever. But this result is realized only in the conjunction of all of the acts. In sum, it is the species of nature in themselves and not in their interrelationship that negation, lowering and deterioration obtain, but in their e interrelationship is rooted their perfection and escape from evil. What you say is clear and readily acceptable, but you must still clarify the idea of Israel's preciousness as you said you would, for I do not yet see how it fits in here. I have already explained in the variations and providence which leads to corresponding variations in its results, that is, in the happenings of the world. But the first cause behind all this and the reason for the variations in providence trace themselves to Israel, as I have indicated to you. I shall now explain. The Holy One, blessed be He, vis-à-vis -vis Israel, is as a father with his son, or as a man with the wife of his youth. All of the Blessed One's desire is towards us, as it is written in Song of Songs 7 verse 11, I am for my beloved, and towards me is his desire. And also from Psalms 40 verse 6, Your wonders and your thoughts towards us. And from Leviticus 26 verse 9, and I will turn towards you, and I will multiply you. That is, the Holy One, blessed be He, lusts, as it were, to regale Himself with His creations and to rejoice in them, as it is written in Psalms 104 verse 31, the Lord will rejoice in His handiwork, and in His truly turning towards them from His love for them and from the joy He takes in them, as it were, he devises thoughts and never ceases benefiting them and multiplying them. And he constantly renews his goodness to them, providence among, upon providence in the optimum manner for their perfection and good, just as a father who turns to his son in love will devise such thoughts. The pivotal factor in all of this is Israel, for it is Israel to whom his yearning goes out, as indicated in the aforementioned verse, and I quote, I am for my beloved and towards me is his desire. And the remainder of the creation is exclusively dependent upon them, for when God turns to them in love, he will do nothing else than originate good after good for the entire world, true, perfect good. But transgression is severe in that it causes the Holy One, blessed be he, to turn, God forbid, from Israel as a husband angry with his wife, or a father with his son. Of such a state it is written in Genesis 6 verse 6, and he was sad to his heart. For in such circumstances he does not rejoice in the world and its creations, God forbid. The entire providence is withdrawn and all success departs, God forbid. It is seen then that evil is created only through concealment of countenance, the Creator not turning with love towards the terrestrial's creations and not rejoicing in them, 
this being the cause of the entire withdrawal of providence that we mentioned. In truth, the Holy One, blessed be He, foresaw the deeds of the righteous and those of the wicked. This was taught to us by our sages in the Midrash of Gracious Rabbah 2 verse 5. In the beginning of the creation of the world, the Holy One, blessed be He, foresaw the deeds of the righteous and those of the wicked. And also from Gracious Rabbah 8 4. What did the Holy One, blessed be He, do? He sundered the ways of the wicked from before his countenance, conjoined his mercy to his justice, and created the universe. That is, the entire creation of the world, from the beginning, proceeded through channels of prevision of the future, God foreseeing what was destined to be and perfecting orders for the needs of the entire future. The foreseeing of the deeds of the righteous constituted joy for the Blessed One, and through it was created the entire order of beneficial providence, and the foreseeing of the deeds of the wicked gave rise to the entire withdrawal of providence and to destructiveness. And from that point on, God's entire ordinance remains of this character. The deeds of the righteous creating joy for the Blessed One and becoming the source of all good, and the deeds of the wicked saddening his heart, as it were, and becoming the source of all evil. It is noted that if the Creator had concentrated upon the foreseen deeds of the wicked, the world could not endure. But he looked away from the deeds of the wicked, by virtue of their not being eternal, but to the contrary, transitory and evanescent, and seized upon the deeds of the righteous, which are destined to endure forever, and on the strength of these deeds he created the world and caused it to endure. And he also implanted in it the dynamics of the universe that good grow stronger and gain the ascendancy, until evil is removed and entirely nullified from the universe. It is seen then in truth that all of the orders of the supreme governance and all of its ramifications are founded exclusively upon Israel, upon God's turning his goods to them in love, or turning away from them, God forbid. They alone, then, emerge as the foundation of the entire creation, with all of the others dependent upon them. I shall not expatiate upon this now, but what we need for our discussion is what I mentioned in the beginning, that all of the perfections of providence arrive from the Blessed One's turning in love to the terrestrial creatures and the opposite from his turning away from them. At this point, we have completed all that we need to know about the creation of evil. We shall now explain what the Creator arranged for his amendment and removal from the creation, so that all, the, all of the creations will be perfected in the quintessential perfection of time to come. What must first be understood is that although the Supreme Will originated defectiveness, as previously explained, the intent was not that it be allowed to remain, but that it be removed and supplanted by complete perfection. He therefore decreed that this defectiveness not require utter obliteration, so that no memory remain of what was obliterated, but that there be defects which are susceptible of amendment, and that the essence of the creations endure even in the midst of defectiveness until it returned to its original strength, as a sick person who is cured. Observe the truth of this in all the occurrences of the world. Defectiveness was not instituted to destroy good, but to corrode it, after which it will be removed and good will return to its original strength. Observe that even death, the greatest negation in the world, is not complete negation, for there is resurrection, so that even though the body returns to dust, there remains, as we know, in a quote from Baikor Rabbah, 18 verse 1, a bone called Luz, from which that same body is reconstructed. What is less than death, then, is certainly not complete negation, but defectiveness subject to amendment. Israel in exile has been brought down to the dust, it being written about them in Lamentations chapter 3 verse 6, He has seated me in darkness as the dead of the world. With all this, however, it is written in Leviticus 26 44, 
And in spite of this, when they are in the land of their enemies, I will not despise them, and I will not abhor them to destroy them. And also quoting from Malachi chapter 3 verse 6, For I am God, I have not changed, and you, O sons of Jacob, I have not destroyed. The Holy One, blessed be he, does not repent of his goodly creations to despise them. And though he leaves them vulnerable to defect, he does not forsake them and utterly reject them, God forbid, but he allows them to suffer what he knows will be to their ultimate good. For this reason, he sustains their existence but lets them be refined in the crucible of the trials of many sore afflictions. Afterwards, they will bloom as the vine and sprout anew, as the earth sprouting forth its produce and the garden its plants. This is born out of the action of the seeds themselves. Although they are worn away in the earth, they are not completely lost, but they sprout again from the dust. We find then that the Blessed One did not desire irrevocable negation for his creatures, his creations, but defectiveness subject to correction. And just as we explained that the Blessed One does not ally his name with negation, in that he does not associate his name with evil, so conversely it is the nature of his perfection to sustain all good things, even in the midst of defectiveness at the time of deterioration, and he does not leave off hovering over them in order to sustain the good, that it not be entirely lost. This is well seen in the case of man, as we explained before in the parallel between the processes of man and the supreme ordinance. When a man dies, his soul leaves him and his body returns to the earth whence it came. The illusions and the idea are one. Man is constituted of the darkness of earthiness. The dark body originated through the concealment of the Blessed One's countenance, as we explained and of spirituality that animates and refines him, the result of the Blessed One's illumination of countenance towards the amendment of the imperfection of his creations, as we likewise explained. As long as the Creator pursues this ordinance with man, man lives in his world. But when the Creator leaves off shining his countenance upon him, so that only the darkness of his nature remains, the soul will leave that body, which will be as dead as a lifeless stone. It will also be subject to dissolution and decay, the Blessed One having removed his countenance from it. And it is written in Psalms 104.29, You hide your face, they are confounded. You take their spirits, they perish and return to their dust. But because the Creator will not completely conceal the countenance of his goodness forever, for some spark of his light will illuminate the darkness of the concealment of his countenance for the continuance of the universe. This body too will not undergo complete dissolution and the soul will not leave it completely. But there will occur what our holy teachers have re received through tradition. There is found amongst the bones in the grave of life, life-giving element termed osseous vapor which sustains the dead for purposes of resurrection, so that those who are resurrected are not new creations, but the very ones who have died, as it is written in Yeshaya 58 and heaven, and he will say to your bones with purity and will invigorate your bones. This certainly stands to reason, for the Creator will certainly not despise his handiwork, but he will sustain the good and free it of evil in the resolution of his devices. We shall now begin discussing the order of the universal perfection. We have already stated that when the Blessed One originated the providence for this nature in the beginning, when the negation of this providence was yet awaiting origination, the intent in truth in the origination of this providence was not that it endure, but that it be negated, as we explained previously. However, in wishing to originate a perfect enduring providence, which would produce those results required for the universe, the intent in truth was to keep from it the evil that had already been originated for it, the very opposite of the first intent as we explained. And this is the mainspring of the perfecting of creation, the reversion of intent to doing and sustaining of good and protecting that good from evil. 
the Creator then originated in all of the aspects of His providence and its levels, each level with its corresponding perfection, the entire intent being to produce good and ward off evil, that is, the negation of that had already been originated to operate in respect to that level. In this manner, he ordered all of the levels of his providence, having to do the same on each level. First, to revert intent to perfecting of good only for the creation of, his, of the creatures, as we explained. Second, to ward off the already created negation so that it's not to revert and affect negation. In truth, the Creator did not wish to negate evil, but only to ward it off, so that it exists and endure as long as was necessary for the creations. Subsistence of evil too, then, is possible only through the power of the Blessed One, He alone, unquestionably, being the Creator of good and evil. But this is the most mundane function attributable to his providence and supervision. We find then that the Blessed One ordered all the levels of his providence in accordance with the demands of the universe, level after level, after which he correspondingly provided for the production of evil and for all of its components and aspects. There exists in this evil that which parallels all of the components of the pro positive providence, negation having been originated for each of the latter, and likewise having been warded off from each component to which it was assigned, but not having been completely negated. However, all of the negations assigned to all of the components of positive providence are of one type only, general evil, and this entire category is attributable to the Blessed One's providence only on the nethermost stratum of all that it contains. Therefore, for example, when the highest level of providence has received its perfections, its negation has been isolated and warded off from it. Still, however, it has not been negated entirely, but it has been rendered ex existential and operable only on the next lowest level attributable to his providence. When this second level, in turn, has received its perfection, its negation has been isolated and it becomes existential on through the orders in succession until it reaches the lowest as we explained. But in respect of providence, it becomes more liable of materialization in successive levels than in the beginning, on the third level more so than on the second, and so on, until the very last level. Therefore, it may be stated that the Creator, at once wishing to invest his providence with complete perfection, undertook to arrange the orders of good and evil, those of good being perfected on their various levels, but evil being in a state of suspension from the apex of the order of providence until its lowest level, where all of its characteristics reside in their details. For the, for the intent is to force evil downwards, so that it become the least significant of all of the elements of creation, this lowering of evil constituting one of the great forces for perfection in the universe, causing the quality of good to achieve great ascendancy over that of evil. It is for this reason that at the very establishments establishment of the orders, the Creator isolated the orders of good for arrangement and perfection, and those for evil for progressive descent from level to level. For to the extent that any one of the orders of good is perfected, to that extent one of the orders of evil is correspondingly lowered, so that when the orders of good have attained their complete perfection, evil will have been entirely reduced and the world will have achieved its intended perfection. This provides a great entrance for the understanding of Ezekiel 26 verse 2. I shall be filled by the desolate one. As explained by our sages in Megillah 6 on Madala, holiness is full to the extent that evil is desolate. For this is the sum of man's divine service. God having created good and evil, and the descent of evil hinging entirely 
on the essential good, and vice versa, God forbid. The Holy One, blessed be He, has made known to us the deeds necessary for the ascendancy of good in all of its orders, from which there will naturally flow the descent of evil in all of its orders, and the ultimate, complete perfection of the universe. All of these things are now clear to me, and this is, indeed, a most appropriate order for the understanding of the Creator's modes of conduct rooted in the depths of His wisdom, revealing, as it does, that the features of the world and its occurrences are not adventitious and arbitrary, but that all is perfected in profound wisdom for a perfect end. Let us complete the exposition of the Blessed One's ordinance by saying that once the Supreme Will fixed the boundary of evil, establishing and delimiting its province, it reverted and established a beneficial ordinance, appropriate for the world once evil had come into existence. But what the Supreme Will desires in some is the existence of this evil, is that it exists the amount of time accorded it and then vanish from existence, and from the very beginning of the world he has been conducting it towards its providential end, wherein evil shall be completely eradicated from it. This constitutes a particular ordinance that we have already mentioned previously in reference to the revelation of the Blessed One's holiness. But as long as he desires the existence of evil, another ordinance is necessary, for its creation was not in vain, but in furtherance of the divine service of man. There is therefore need of an ordinance appropriate to such service in all of its aspects. Know for a certainty that virtuous acts are of no benefit at all to the Blessed One, nor are wicked acts detrimental to Him. It has already been stated in Job 35 verse 6, If you sin, what do you do to Him? If you are righteous, what do you give Him? But the Blessed One has originated a kind of ordinance with particular characteristics and ways that He knew to be conducive to this end. In it, there is established a system of merit and liability for man, whereby it is possible to designate as benefit man's keeping of the mitzvot and detriment his transgression of them. Not benefit or detriment to the Blessed One himself, but to what he wishes to work in us. This is the intent of, and I quote, when Israel does the will of the Creator, it as adds power to the strength in heaven, which our sages have explained in Yalkut Shimoni on Ha'azinu 945. Here, too, the meaning is not that he can only act through the actions of the terrestrial creatures, but that he does not will to act otherwise. And it is for this reason that virtuous deeds are termed the Blessed One's honor, and wicked deeds to the contrary, God forbid. It is seen then, that what the Creator originated in the beginning in this ordinance, subserving divine service, is the possibility for benefit through the performance of virtuous acts, and for the detriment through the performance of wicked acts. All this having been originated by and being dependent solely upon the Blessed One's will, as we explain. And this is called the ordinance of good and evil. Good referring to all of the perfected orders, and all of the benefits result in one virtuous deed, and evil the opposite of this, all of the detriments resulting from transgression. After this, it is necessary to set forth the elements of reward and punishment, that is, the good that will be accorded to the doers of a mitzvah and the punishment that will be meted out to its transgressors. And this reward and punishment must be of two types, that is, the reward and punishment of this world and the true recompense of the world to come. There must also be originated a hierarchical order of statuses for human beings, the status of good and of the evil, relative to nearness or to distance from the Blessed One, in strict correlative order with their deeds. Provisions must also be made for the amendment of defects the institution of repentance, as and for the experiencing of suffering in this world or in the next. All this is found to be a requisite ordinance for the entire period of the existence of evil. It can be seen then, however, 
how much profound wisdom is necessary for the proper ordering of all of these things. All this aside from the profound ordinance directing the generality of existence to complete perfection, to the complete eradication of evil from the creation, and all that this ordinance requires. This is the ordinance founded upon the concealment of this supreme perfection and its subsequent revelation. And the term of this ordinance is the term of this cycle. That is, the entire cycle from the concealment of the supreme perfection until its revelation, as we explained previously. It is these ordinances which we must elucidate, if not their details, for they are infinite, at least their general principles, as far as we are able. These are two exceedingly great foundations, and unquestionably, great wisdom and profound knowledge must underlie them. We shall first explain the ordinance of reward and punishment, for it is more apparent to us. Speak, for I am listening. I shall first tell you of two, which are three, chief foundations of this ordinance, after which we shall discuss their details individually, so that the path will be paved before you. In the acts which the Holy One, blessed be He, works in us through the particular orders and avenues that He desires, we must discern two varieties of governance. The first relates to all that concerns the Blessed One's acts and includes all of the ways and characteristics of His providence. The second relates to all that concerns the effect upon us of this providence and includes all of the ways and characteristics of our being affected thus by the Blessed One. The first variety, that of his providence, is also divisible into two parts, for it is written in Deuteronomy 8 verse 5, As a man chastises his son, so does the Lord your God chastise you. That is, God's chastisement of Israel is not motivated by revenge, is not the blow of an enemy, but proceeds from his love for them as the love of a father for a son, as it is written in Proverbs 13 verse 24. He who spares the rod hates his son, and he who loves him visits chastisement upon him. Chastisement, then, is born of real love, and it is recognized that open chastisement proceeds from hidden love. Two positive results spring from this root. The first, that chastisement itself, even when administered, will not be administered with great wrath, but with great attenuation because of the hidden love which does not allow the anger to rule and to range in full cruelty. The second, since even when the Holy One Blessed Be He brings His creatures into judgment, the hidden intent is only to be merciful and good. Sometimes, if he finds that they do not have the strength to bear his judgment, he will turn to them in mercy and remove his hand from judgment entirely. As it is stated in Avodah Zohar 3 Omid Base, he rises from the throne of judgments and sits on that of mercy. We are now in a position to understand all three of these and to explain their details and the conditions which complement them. I must first present a preface that is necessary for all that is to follow, a very evident preface to those who are versed in wisdom. Say on. The great master Maimonides of blessed memory remarked about the term to bear, applied in scripture to situations unrelated to the bearing of children. And I quote this from the Guide to the Perplexed, chapter 1. Section 7. The word to bear was used figuratively in respect to the creation of natural objects. And also, I quote from Psalms 90 verse 2, before the mountains were born. It is similarly used in this figurative sense in respect to the origination of thoughts and to the views and conclusions that are necessarily to be drawn from them, as in Psalms chapter 7 verse 15 and give birth to falsehood and in Yeshaya 2 verse 6 and in the offspring of strangers they delight. This term and all terms similar to it can be used figuratively in respect to thought. That is, just as something which has been originated can be referred to as being born, 
In the same way, something in a state of potentiality awaiting fruition can be referred to by the term conception, as illustrated by scripture itself in Psalm 715. He conceived the deceit and gave birth to falsehood. For whatever can have the one term attributed to it can likewise have attributed to it all of its aspects. Now we know that every validly drawn conclusion has its progenitors, that is, its original premises. The generated thought is in a state of potentiality in its progenitor before it is generated, and when it is generated, it emerges from potentiality to actuality. Furthermore, since in every perfected object, its perfection is superadded to its existence, in that it can exist without that perfection, still, the generative cause of that object contains two factors, its existence and its perfection. For the cause for existence is the cause for perfection, and the cause for endurance of existence, the perfection of the effect being nothing more than the perfection implicit in the generative cause. When it generates all that is in its nature to generate, the generated object will be found to be completely perfect. All this is evidence to those who have trodden, trodden the paths of wisdom. It has already been explained above all aspects of the creation are interrelated, interrelated all issuing from one another, being generated by one another, all together forming one bond and one general creation which is not complete except in all of these details, and in this inheres the beauty and perfection of the world, as we have explained previously. This gives us extremely broad scope for the contemplation and analysis of the Creator's wisdom in His creation. But let us know that every factor of the Blessed One's ordinance has, in this ordinance itself, an interior factor from which it must necessarily flow, and which can be regarded as its cause and progenitor. And it is this cause which generates and perfects the factor which is of necessity generated by it. All of this is subsumed in the mechanisms <coughs> referred to previously, rotating in the universe from the heavenly height to the nethermost depths, all of the celestial and terrestrial creations, superior and inferior, being connected with each other, being generated by each other and proceeding necessarily from each other. So that when the Blessed One actuates one of his providences, there is to be discerned in it not alone what it affects in the world, but also any additional factor that it is in its nature to inexorably generate. What issues from it in the creation will always be a reflection of that same thing within its nature. However, if the Blessed One so desires and brings that inexorable factor from potentiality to actuality, then in this world too it will produce a more pronounced, more clearly delineated effect, resulting from its having originated from providence actively. For for in the beginning it will have only been a reflection of what was included in the first providence, but now its essence will originate in actuality. And in this too, its essence will be discriminated in imperfection and in perfection. All of these considerations are obvious to those versed in empirical wisdom. When we stop to reflect upon the Blessed One's creations in these ways, we will discover great profound wisdom. Many of the Torah's secrets will be understood by us, and there will be resolved many doubts and questions as to God's ordinance and faith in general, in general entertained by those unfamiliar with these things. There is no question in my mind that it's impossible to attain even that modicum of knowledge attainable by man of the wisdom of the Blessed One's deeds except through the paths of learning and wisdom, and that one who wishes to enter into these inquiries without the necessary preparation and learning is entirely irresponsible and cannot succeed. Let us now speak of our present epoch, 
that of the Blessed One's just and perfect judgment. The existence of this world at this time, the entire time of man's divine service and all of its aspects and ramifications hinges entirely upon the Blessed One's justice. For this is the world and the time ordered by the Blessed One for the revelation of the justness of his judgment. And the end of this world is attained only through the proper execution of this judgment. As it is written in Psalms 9 verse 17, the Lord is known through the judgment he has wrought. And from Yeshaya 5.16, And the Lord of hosts rose in the judgment. And also from Proverbs 29 verse 4, The king in judgment will establish the earth. That is, it is not to the world's benefit at all that the Holy One, blessed be he, allows the wicked to revel and to gain the ascendancy, while the righteous are oppressed and evil prevails. This is certainly not good for the world, but bad. Good, to the contrary, consists in God's executing judgment, humbling the wicked and lowering the proud, uplifting the righteous and raising their honour, as it is written in Proverbs 21.15, the doing of judgment is joy for the righteous. And also from Proverbs 11 verse 10, at the destruction of the wicked there is rejoicing. We find then that the time during which the Holy One blessed be he plays out rope to the wicked, the time in which they grow stronger in the world and destroy justice and righteousness may be regarded as sleep, as it were, in respect to him. And of the time that he awakens from this sleep, it is written in Psalms 78 verses 65 to 66. And the Lord arose as from a sleep, and he smote his enemies back. For if the Holy One, blessed be he, had truly desired to conduct his world only in complete loving kindness and benefaction, so that there would be no evil in the world but only good, this would have been considered perfection for the world. But this would require that there be no place for transgression whatsoever, and that no deeds being done be done which assailed and undermined good, as will indeed be the case from time to in the time to come, of which it is written in Psalms 104 verse 35, sins will cease from the earth. Our sages stressing in Brachot 10 Ahmad Aleph that it is sins which is written and not sinners. At this time, the world will be regarded as being conducted through love and kindness alone. That is, there will be no evil inclination, but men will perforce serve the Lord, as it is written in Ezekiel 36, 27, and I shall call, cause them to walk in my statutes. But for the Holy One, blessed be he, to wait until the cup of the wicked has flowed over, for in any case the world is destined to come to nothingness and the wicked to be destroyed, this would certainly not be loving kindness, but extremely severe judgment. For, to the contrary, as we have indicated in an aforementioned verse in Proverbs 13.24, And he who loves him visits chastisement upon him. And also Amos verse th chapter 3 verse 2, Only you have I known from all the families of the earth, therefore I shall visit your sins upon you. Our sages explaining in Avodah Zohar 4a that the Holy One, blessed be he, exacts payment from Israel little by little, so that evil not mount upon them and cause their decimation, God forbid. To the contrary, he desires their amendment as we explained. It is seen then that when the Holy One, blessed be he, is positively inclined towards his world, he enthrones himself, as it were, to conduct it in constant judgment, to cleanse it, little by little, of every evil that appears in it. Under such a regimen, the elements of the world are perfected and blessed, and all prosper greatly. But if, God forbid, there is no merit in the world and wickedness increases greatly, the Holy One, blessed be he, says, and I quote from Deuteronomy 32.20, I shall conceal my countenance from them. And also from Deuteronomy 31.18, I shall conceal my countenance on that day. Whereupon, immediately, the darkness, wickedness and ignorance increases. 
Wisdom is brought low and truth cast out and all of the world's elements succumb to defect and deterioration. Our sages have stated in this regard in Sota 49a, there is no day whose blessings, which is a euphemism for curse, is not greater than, the day, than that of the day before. Even the flavor of fruits is lost. That's also from Sota 48a. And there is no success, neither material nor spiritual. Now, if the sole intent of the Holy One, blessed be he, were indeed to, to chastise the wicked, the world would already have been destroyed because of them. But since his intent is only to do good, his chastisement and rebuke proceeding only from love, as we explained, he wills to establish an enduring existence for the world, even in the absence of merit, which would neither change nor be undermined. He avails himself to this end of his exalted majesty and sovereignty, his complete independence of any law or force, which enables him to maintain the universe even when men are not deserving. But you must understand this well, for many discriminations must be made. For on the surface it would seem that the sinner stands to gain, the world enjoying without need of merit, enjoying through God's love and kindness and love in the very midst of the sins of the wicked. But if you make all the necessary discriminations, you will find, find profound wisdom in the workings of the Blessed One's ordinance. For you have already heard that it was the Creator Himself who originated, through His will alone, even the phenomenon of defects produced by transgressions and that of benefits produced by virtuous acts, and who established perfect and just ordinances centering around this pole. It is upon these that the success of this world, in all of its aspects, depends. When God exercises his judgment through all of these ordinances, the world will prosper in all of its parts. But if transgressions lead the Holy One, blessed be he, God forbid, to despise, as it were, the creatures of the world and to draw away from them, these ordinances will be thrown into disorder, for the Blessed One will not abide by them, and all the workings of the world will be undermined, God forbid. If he does abide by them, however, in full measure, all of the creations will achieve fulfillment. However, there is a different ordinance and a different time when Israel will be extremely meritorious, as we explained previously, and when the world will achieve absolute perfection. That is, the Holy One, blessed be He, will alter the condition of the world to good and eradicate all evil from it. There will be no evil inclination in the souls of men, nor defect or loss in any creature, and the world will be conducted in great perfection. And this will indeed be perfection for the world, for it will be fit for such an ordinance. For evil will have been eradicated from it, and there will be no further need for judgment, but the world will be conducted through absolute mercy and complete benefaction. And all that is now concealed from the dwellers of the earth because of God's so ordering it for them that the earth will be a place of mounting darkness for purposes of divine service, that is, to provide trials for men, as we have explained, in time to come, all this will be revealed as it is written in the Ishaya 40 verse 5, and the glory of God will be revealed. However, there is a time when the Holy One, blessed be He, withdraws, as it were, from His world, when His judgment is not done and His sovereignty not revealed, and when the world would deserve destruction. But even at such a time, the Holy One, blessed be He, wills the existence of the world and sustains it through the power of His sovereignty alone. For by the criterion of justice, it is not worthy of existence, but he avails himself of his majesty, which is not assailed nor undermined by the transgressions of men, to sustain the world that it not be lost. He does not, however, heap good and increase upon it, but to the contrary gives it constricted existence alone, providing only what it cannot do without, so that it may subsist. The world has not been perfected so that it merits being conducted 
through this benefaction. To the contrary, not only his evil not departed from it, but it has even grown an intensity. It is just that the Holy One, blessed be he, wills that his handiwork not be destroyed and he sustains the world, albeit in great constriction, through the power of his unique sovereignty, through justice, though justice dictates that it be destroyed. It will then be acknowledged that it is to the world's benefit to be conducted through the Blessed One's judgment and that its perfection is dependent upon it. This being borne out by this constriction that we have mentioned and by the increase in wickedness. For nature does not of itself ascend to goodness, as will be the case in time to come, but to the contrary remains within the boundaries fixed for it by the Blessed One in keeping with his ordinance of judgment. But when the Holy One, blessed be he, withdraws and is concealed from the world, judgment is not executed. The world becomes empty and void, and wicked reign in the world in all of their audacity as wild beasts in the jungle. There is no demanding or accounting. All is distorted and defective, and only the Holy One, blessed be he, through the strength of his will that is insubservient to any law, sustains his world bare sustenance alone, until his judgment comes to light. As it is written in Yeshaya 51 verse 4, And in the light of my judgments the nations will find rest. In examining all of the varying states of the world, in respect to the revelation or the concealment of the Blessed One's judgment, we find them arranged in levels in exact order. There are five such levels, as I shall explain, all of them in their times, as they were and as they will be, until the ultimate perfection of the universe in time to come. The first time was all the 2,000 years of desolation, uh, as uh, in Sanhedrin 97a, uh, as we see uh, especially in the exile of Egypt. This is the time when the Holy One, blessed be he, conceals himself entirely from his world, as if, God forbid, he had abandoned the earth and did not see or hear the deeds of men. In this condition, the quality of justice is regarded as not acting in the world at all, but being only in a state of potential, needed for the existence of the world, demanded by the order according to which the Creator has established his ordinance. For in his love for his creations, he looks upon them and contemplates them, as it were, to know what to do with them and to bring them to complete perfection. However, he only thinks but does not do, concealing his perfect judgment and leaving the world in emptiness and vacuity. I must interrupt you so that this does not become confused in my mind, for you have stated and repeated something that I just can't understand. What may that be? You stated that when the Holy One, blessed be he, conceals his judgment, the world moves in defectiveness, emptiness and vacuity. Tell me one of two things. Do not do more. The, ordin the ordinance in either one of love and kindness or one of justice. If it is one of loving kindness, there must be good for all. And how can there be a root of being or existence for evil? If it is one of justice, how can you say that judgment is concealed? Are not all of the defects found in the world the result of God's judgment and his attribute of justice? And I'll substantiate this on two counts. First, evil and defect can proceed only from the attribute of God's justice and the concealment of his good. You've already explained this to me at length. Second, do you not attribute this concealment to transgressions which caused the Holy One, blessed is he, to conceal his countenance from the universe? If so, this is certainly justice. You have certainly questioned well, and I will resolve all of these questions to your satisfaction. I have already explained to you that the root of the entire existence of good and evil in this world is to the Creator's concealment of the countenance of his goodness and his abiding by this attribute, which allows room for evil 
through the concealment of his countenance. As it is written in Psalms 18 verse 12, he has made darkness his covering. There are two manifestations of this attribute. The first allows evil to grow in strength and to achieve great dominion without God's justice rising against them and ridding the world of them by bringing punishment upon the wicked, in which case, and I quote from Makot 23a, once he has been smitten, he is as your brother. But it is a consequence of this concealment of countenance to allow the even of evil of the world to increase and not to be healed. The second manifestation is also a function of the Blessed One's concealment of countenance, but it is beneficial for the world and its inhabitants. This is an order of which the workings of the Blessed One's ordinance are channeled in righteous judgment, by virtue of which the world will be cleansed of evils, not, however, through the agency of love and kindness, erasing sins and returning them to nothingness but through the agency of justice dispelling all evil through punishment. For as long as that time has not arrived, when the Holy One, blessed be He, will erase sins, there is no way for the purging of the world except through the righteousness of judgment. When I speak to you then of the attributes of justice, I am referring to that righteous justice which purges the world of evil. But the concealment of justice is an aspect of defect and not one of perfection, whereby sins are not erased, but to the contrary, the world is, as it were, despised and evil mounts within it. This ordinance is a function of the greatest concealment of the Creator's countenance from His creations, as a result of which the world is relegated to emptiness and vacuity. However, here you need an important preface. In truth, the Holy One, blessed be He, never despises His handiwork, God forbid, and He has never abandoned and leave the world. But at the very time that the world seems to have been abandoned by Him, He is devising good for His world, and His wonders and thoughts are constantly directed towards the perfection of the universe and not to its undoing. But he conceals his counsel to such a great extent that the world seems to be abandoned and men suffer punishment for their sins. And thus have our sages stated in respect to our father Jacob of blessed memory in Bereshit Rabbah 91.10 on Genesis 43.6. And Israel said, Why did you do evil unto me? Rabbi Levi stated in the name of Rabbi Chama ben Chanina. Our father Jacob never spoke a vain thing except here. The Holy One, blessed be he, said, I am occupied with making his son king of Egypt. And he says, why did you do evil to me? This is the intent of when Ishaya said in Ishaya 40.27, my way is hidden from the Lord. That is, all of the time that Jacob, our father, was in despair, Over Joseph's separation from him, the Holy One, blessed be he, was turning the wheels to make Joseph king and enable Jacob to live in tranquility. But because this was shrouded in deep counsel, grief descended upon Jacob. And this is axiomatic. In respect to any ascent that the Holy One, blessed be he, wishes to accord an individual or the world, all of the time that the good is in the process of materializing, it is generated only within the depths of hidden counsel, for which reason it is preceded by suffering. It is our sages who have stated in Brachot 5a, three goodly gifts were given by the Holy One Blessed Be He to Israel, and all were given only through suffering. Let us return to our subject. The first level of the conditions of this world is the concealment of the Blessed One's judgment. It's not revealing itself to cleanse evils from the land. And that time the Holy One, Blessed Be He, is not known in His world. And we have already indicated when that time was, the time of the evil, the the exile into Egypt, the exile in Egypt. The second condition is a time such as ours, in which there is no prophet or visionary 
nor any signs or wonders to compel all men to recognize the Blessed One's greatness. Still, there is a greater revelation than in the preceding state and some knowledge of the Blessed One's greatness. You will note that there was never an exile like that in Egypt, neither before nor after, when the Jews were steeped in servitude, when there was no Torah, and Israel was not a nation distinct in its laws and mitzvot as it is today. There were no men who recognized the Blessed One's name at all. Today at least we have Torah, so that even though we are in exile, the time cannot be called one of emptiness, as is in the case with the first 2,000 years. For we have the Torah, as we explained, it's already having been given from heaven and being in our hands for all eternity, praise God, and the Blessed One's name has been made known amongst the nations. The third condition is a time in which the Holy One, blessed be He, exercises His reign over His universe with signs and wonders, manifests to all of the nations, to know that the Lord God is in Israel, and in the entire time of the first and second temples. Know, however, that even this revelation is only a superficial one. That is, it is a revelation by virtue of acts alone, by way of visible wonders, in which absence the true faith would not be manifest. But this is not the essential revelation. God's desiring that his glory be revealed in his universe. The fourth condition is God's being revealed to all of his creation by way of knowledge and conceptualization, not by way of wonders, but by God's glory being seen and attained through an abundance of knowledge and wisdom. This is the intent when Isaiah quotes 11.19, And the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Also from Yeshaya 52.8, For eye to eye shall they see when the Lord returns to Zion. And also from Yeshaya 40 verse 5, And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For then signs and wonders shall not be needed to substantiate the faith, but it shall be confirmed through knowledge and perception, as is the case with all of the prophets and all of the angels, who recognize God through their powers of perception. And this is a clear, true knowledge, which is not subject to any doubt. This indeed was the perception of all of Israel at Mount Sinai. It being written in Deuteronomy 5 verse 4, Face to face did the Lord speak with you on the mountain from the midst of the fire. And from Exodus 20 verse 19, For from heaven did I speak with you. Also from Exodus 19 9, So that the people will hear when I speak to you, and in you too they will believe forever. So, that belief will not depend upon wonders, a state in which some doubt concerning the wonders breeds confusion in the belief itself. But the knowledge will be clear, the result of vision and perception, and not subject to any doubt whatsoever. But there are ascents in the nature of man, and in accordance with the ascent of his nature and its refinement, so will he grow in perception and knowledge. This is evident, and this, in general, is the fifth condition. The time of the ascent, the ascent of man's nature and his perception. For as long as the Blessed One's ordinance and his reign have not been revealed in perfect clarity, that is, by the way of knowledge, even once, on the first level, this justice is considered as not having yet been revealed and God's reign has not been clearly established. For once they have been revealed, this justice has been recognized. From that point on, there is only addition and ascent. These ascents taking place after the first revelation. For the Holy One, blessed be He, will then refine the nature of man. And in accordance with that refinement, there will be revealed to them additional revelations of the Blessed One's glory and greatness. 
This then is the order of levels that the Creator has established for the attribute of His justice, from its beginning until its completion. In the beginning it is only in a state of potentiality, but not of actuality. Afterwards it is slightly revealed, but not yet regarded as being revealed, still requiring the addition of elements that would testify to its presence, namely signs and wonders. The revelation through signs completes what is necessary for revelation of justice, but only in respect to what is external to him. There is an additional completion of revelation in respect to God in himself, that is, through the knowledge and perception whereby he himself is perceived and there is yet an addition of increased revelations of him in accordance with the ascent of the nature of those aspiring to perceive him. I will now show you a beautiful thing, how each of these levels has a counterpart in the world. I would certainly very much like to hear that. Observe the formation of man on its various levels. The Holy One, blessed be he, would certainly have created man completely formed in every respect if he had desired to do so, for there is none to deter him. He did not do so, however, but how unfinished is man on the day of his birth, going on to develop little by little. You will find this to be a precise analogue to the Blessed One's glory and his ordinance in the revelation of his sovereignty corresponding to his directing and conducting the world in these five conditions that we have mentioned, which correspond in turn to the growth of the world, paralleling the, development, the developmental growth of man. The Blessed One's glory unfolds in revelation within this great order of levels. The very beginning of man results from a conjunction of those who are partners in him his father and his mother, corresponding to the progenitors of any generated object. But he is concealed in his mother's womb all of the months of his gestation. He is then born and enters the environs of the world, continuing his gradual process of growth. He is not complete, however, neither in stature nor in intellect, until the growth process will have been completed. He first develops intellectually until it is incumbent upon him to perform mitzvot at age 13. With all this, he is not yet complete, but still a youth. The developmental process then continues until it has been entirely realized. From that point on, he, is, he, has, he experiences ascent upon ascent as he grows older, the glory of the goal of the old, the grey of the crown of greyness, the wisdom of the elders, who in abundance of years impart wisdom. All this is a counterpart of the order of his deeds according to the aforementioned levels. It is seen then that man himself, who is guided by the Blessed One, reflects this guidance in himself as we have mentioned previously. It certainly stands to reason that the form of man should reflect supreme mysteries of the Blessed One's deeds. The same holds true for all of the other creations of the world. Each one of them corresponds to one of the mysteries of the Blessed One's ordinance. The supreme intelligence devised for each of the orders of its ordinances counterparts in this world. This is the source of the multitude of creations each reflecting one of the orders of his ordinance, and all of the accidents of a particular creation in all of its forms and properties are judged in relation to the aspects of that order which is intended, that order which it is intended to reflect, so that all of the Blessed One's attributes are, as it were, like roots, and the creations add branchings of them, the essence of those creations deriving from the essence of these attributes. And this is the basis of prophetic visions, 
in which when the Blessed One desired to reveal any of his attributes to the prophets, he showed them in a prophetic vision a lion or an ox or any other such images characteristic of these visions. This is evidence. We shall now complete our subject. From what we have explained, we find that for every quality of God's conduct, there is an es the essence of that quality and the actuation of that quality. That is, the agency through which the e essence is revealed. For judgment, the generality of reward and punishment, whether for loving kindness or for the rod, is subsumed under three headings. The attribute of loving kindness, the attribute of justice, and the attribute of mercy. But the actuation of this judgment in its various respects varies from time to time, increasing or diminishing, so that the revelation is either less or more. This is comparable to the case of men who, through alike and all of their limbs, yet evidence great variations in strength from one to the next, so that one man can do what his neighbor cannot, and in one individual himself there is a variation in strength from one time to the next. This is evidence here too. The Blessed One conducts this world constantly through his quality of judgment and maintains all the laws of creation rooted in the ways of his judgment, but through greater revelation or in concealment as we explained. And in this, in here the differences between the various days of the year the holy days and the non-holy days, the difference between them consisting in the greater or lesser revelation of the Blessed One's providence in the agency of His Holiness, as we shall explain further with God's help. But since all of the aspects of His ordinance are so established, each effect and its cause, it is obvious that the causes must contain within themselves all that may be discriminated in the effects. We must therefore understand in detail the nature of the causes and the manner in which they produce their efforts so that we may understand the varying states of the effects. But in order to understand this well, we must go more deeply into it, as you shall hear now. Is what we have said until now not sufficient? Do not these ideas suffice for an understanding of the conduct of the creation? What we have said is indeed correct, but we must understand that it is the supreme guidance that determines the essence of the guided creatures, and this is the required additional depth that I alluded to, namely the knowledge of the essence of the creations and all their varying accidents as functions of this ordinance. We have already discussed the subject of this lowly world, a dark defective place, all of whose accidents are dark and defective. We have also explained that all that exists originates from His will and is entirely dependent upon His decree and His word. This world's darkness, then, is certainly a result of the Blessed One's word that establishes it in this character. If He has had so desired, he would certainly have greatly illuminated this darkness and elevated and ennobled the world. This is obvious. But as regards the essence of the world and of man, whether higher or lower, we have very wide scope for observation or reflection, for there is profound wisdom in the understanding of the degrees of ascent and descent that are possible for man in his world. In truth, there is no end to the particular details of this subject, but the general principles are not that numerous, and they can serve as great keys for the understanding of deep mysteries in the Blessed One's deeds. Let us say now that the Blessed One's deciding to govern His world through the quality of judgment, the agency of reward and punishment, necessitated the presence in the world of good and evil, and, as a natural consequence, man's being formed of such a nature and subject to such an ordinance as is susceptible of both good and evil in equal measure. The converse would be true if the Creator had desired to govern the world in His goodness 
and the light of the countenance of his loving kindness. In that event, all of the creations would have to be complete and perfect by virtue of the illumination of the Blessed One's countenance. There would be no evil in the world, and man's nature would be so pure as to be insuspectable of evil, but susceptible only of good, glory, illumination and wisdom. It is seen then that man's nature, whether in its ascent or in its degradation, is dependent entirely upon the ordinance established for man by the Blessed One, willing in man's essence what he wills in his ordinance. It is in the quality of judgment then that the lowliness of the world inheres, the fact that the world and its accidents are lowly and defective. This is what I have already explained to you above in regard to the Blessed One's providence, that in the light of its being, the Blessed One's providence, it should have been a providence only of great holiness and of precious, noble manifestations. But the Holy One, blessed be He, willed to clothe it in lowly vestments inappropriate to it, this being required by the lowly world for the end intended for it. But though this world be lowly and dark, we find, when we observe it closely, that it is not so dark as to possess no light at all, but that there are aspects of luminescence within it. That is, the corporeal earthiness attributable to the beastliness that reigns in this world is the darkness that we recognize in it. But it is not entirely devoid of all aspects of light, that is, what is not earthiness but spirituality. For in any event there is knowledge and wisdom in men, and even more there is Torah, there is Holy Spirit, all things which are not of the nature of earthiness. All of these teach us that there is in this world an intermixture of darkness and light, and that by understanding its levels of darkness and light in all places and times, and its levels of darkness and levels of light in isolation, we shall reach an understanding of the nature of all of its varying states. We have already spoken of the nature and source in darkness and source of darkness and of illumination. Darkness is all of earthiness and of natural corporeality. Illumination is all of spirituality. This being what separates all of the terrestrial, lowly, unholy creatures from the celestial holy ones, who are all illumination without earthiness. The source of darkness is God's manifesting the spiritual providence not as would befit divine providence, but on the level of this lowly world. The source of illumination is God's manifesting divine providence itself, spiritual and holy. When the Blessed One desires to conduct his world in judgment, he makes his providence subservient, as it were, to the deeds of the terrestrial creatures, so that their virtuous deeds activate his providence for the good and their wicked deeds exclude benefaction from his providence, as we have already explained previously. And when he desires to conduct his world in love alone, he will avail himself of his sovereignty, which is not subservient to any law or completely independent of the creations, as it is said in Yeshaya 48 verse 11, For my sake, for my sake I will do. In that event, there is no place for evil at all, but for good alone. Therefore, when he will conduct the world in his love and in his sovereignty, as we explained, he will project a godly, holy providence upon all creatures, through which they will become sanctified. And it is written in Yeshaya chapter 4, verse 3, And as the remnant of Zion and what is left in Jerusalem holy will be said of it. But when he desires to conduct the world in judgment, he will not project a spiritual providence, but what is appropriate to corporeality alone. We find then three levels in the Blessed One's providence. First, a providence of corporeality 
which creates lowly objects. Second, a providence of complete spirituality, that is, a providence which moves the entire universe in the path of holiness, completely, in all of its aspects. Third, a providence which combines luminescence with earthiness, that is, which allows for the existence of spiritual essences even within this time of corporeality. These essences do not alter the corporeal, as in the second level, but they join luminescence to it according to their respective levels. This third providence, then, is not of the second kind, for the second kind removes the darkness of earthiness, whereas the third does not. It is lesser, then, than the second kind and merely derived from it, the province, its province too being spirituality and illumination. But the Creator, who originated all of the states of existence, originated all of these varieties within a providence. That is, a variety of providence which entirely sanctifies its objects, from which, in turn, is derived a second variety which sanctifies its object, but not entirely. In addition, he originated the first variety that we mentioned, a providence of corporeality alone. He also combined the two varieties, the second and the first, in the particular combinations that he desired, and in alternating combinations, increasing at one time and decreasing at another and producing correspondingly alternating results in the fabric of this world. It is from this combination that there are produced, even within corporeal man, entities of luminescence. Vis-à-vis uh, -vis the Torah is the universe and the Holy Spirit within man, as we have explained, and herein especially lies the alternation of times from holy to unholy, for with the increase of the intermixture of spiritual providence within the corporeal providence, there will follow an increase of luminescence over earthiness in men. And the Holy Sabbath is holier than all of the other days, in that the Blessed One increased within it the spiritual, spiritual and godly providences that we mentioned. And all of the other festivals, according to their levels, are similar in this respect. They are all days in which the spiritual providence is greater in accordance with their respective levels. Another essential preface. I have already explained to you the original lowering in the nature of man and the subsequent lowering after Adam's sin. The original corporeality correspondingly to the spirituality after the lowering. Now the world must ascend from its lowerings. And it is upon this that God's ordinance turns, as we have already explained. But the world must first perfect itself in its lowest condition, by amassing for itself all of the abundance of luminescence to which that condition lends itself, after which it will experience an ascent from that condition and acquire all to which that ascent lends itself, and so on, from ascent to ascent. All of these prefaces are certainly necessary for an understanding of the conditions of man in his world, and of what has been decreed for him in all of his times. We shall now return to the subject of judgment and love that we mentioned previously. You have already heard that there are two things we must consider in the Blessed One's acts, one being connected to the other, the attributes of the ordinance, and the essence and conditions of the subject to its guidance, the characteristics of the one being conjoined and interrelated with those of the other, as we have explained previously. We shall now complete the subject of this ordinance. You have already heard how chastisement itself is born of love, as indicated in the aforementioned verse from Proverbs 13, 24, and he who loves him visits chastisement upon him. For the father who loves his son will not want him to become full of bad qualities, but in his love for him will map out for himself a plan of conduct which will enable him to deal with his son with great understanding until he will have corrected his ways. And from that point on, 
And I quote from Proverbs 23, 24, he will beget a wise son and rejoice in him. He will be a gracious father to his son and the son will implore favors from his father and have his will. It is seen then that his love for his son will certainly move him to deal affectionately with him when he pursues a righteous path and to bestow great reward upon him and by virtue of his love in itself which desires his good and not his evil he will desire to chastise him if he corrupts his path and by virtue of his love itself he will desire to follow a middle course with him the left hand rejecting him and the right hand drawing him closer as we learn in Sota 47a. It is from the fount of love itself then that there flow the three qualities of requital, loving kindness, justice, and the middle path of mercy. And it is of the workings of love to season chastisement, even at the time of its execution, with attenuation, and not with cruel anger and surging wrath and to be aroused with difficulty and conciliated with ease. And it is likewise of its workings and of its acts to sometimes exercise complete indulgence and be absolutely charitable, paying no heed whatsoever to the scales of judgment, but multiplying goodness in the desire for love and kindness. In analysing the activity of this love, then, we find two elements characterised in it. The first is the love of love and kindness and the desire for blessing and goodness, which is its major characteristics. This, in turn, branches out into two headings. The first, the orientation towards the attenuation of justice and chastisement, even at the times of execution, so that the fire of envy and the wrath of the Lord will not burn fiercely, God forbid and the world not be consumed through it. The second, a complete overlooking of justice when the world requires it, as alluded to many times before, a quote from Brachot 7a, and I shall be gracious to whom I shall be gracious, even if he is not worthy of it. This is the idea of the 13 attributes of mercy, which are never activated in vain we learn in Rosh Hashanah 17b, as attested to by scripture itself from Exodus 34.6, and the Lord passed by his countenance, his countenance of anger, as it is stated in Rachot 7a, and from Exodus 33.14, my countenance shall pass, this is the countenance of anger. The second element is to be discriminated in the nature of his love is that from his love, from this love itself flows his judgment in all of its general orders, love and kindness, justice and mercy, and in its specific orders, which complement these three, as we have mentioned. And it is the, the, the decree for an attribute of love which allows room for this attribute of judgment, and in whose power it lies to execute this judgment too, as we explain. However, had the decree not contained within itself the manifestation in actuality of this attribute of judgment, such manifestation need not have resulted at all, for there is no compulsion with respect to the Blessed One, but all is pure will. However, because the decree itself dictated such manifestation of judgment from potentiality to actuality, the manifestation was effected. Know that for everything that is done, there are specific, unique orders and conditions needed to complete it. There is an attribute of love and its orders which complete it. There is an attribute of judgment and its orders which likewise complete it. And even this phenomenon of judgment manifesting itself in actuality from within love has orders that complete it. That is, which affect this manifestation. Wisdom proceeds through minute discriminations to the degree of a hair's breadth, and all who multiply these discriminations are to be commended. A 
and though we cannot know all of the specific discriminations because of their infinite number, it is possible for us to recognize the general principles behind them. The decree for the manifestation of judgment in actuality necessitates consideration for all the creations in themselves to determine what is needed relative to their natures and what kind of judgment must be established for their needs. Here too, there are established first the chief orders of judgment in general, after which all of its ways are discriminated individually, one following from the other, and all of them requiring consideration for their proper establishment. And this is obvious, that there is nothing specific without its anterior general principle, and after this complete consideration, the judgments are established within their orders, for there are certainly no judgments without sufficient reason in all of their details. However, the judgments are one thing and their reasons another, and we must not confuse them with each other. But let us know that all of the judgments which God established for all of the hosts of heaven and earth and the entire ordinance by which he governs them are the result of his having contemplated all of his creations in his wisdom and understanding to decree what is needed for them and to establish that decree in his ordinance. And it is in this contemplation that all of the reasons for these judgments are included. He who knows what the Blessed One contemplated and upon what he reflected in establishing his judgment will know the reasons for his judgment. And in revealing his secrets to his prophets and apprising them of his judgments, he apprises them first of what was contemplated by him and upon what he reflected in establishing all of the orders of these judgments. It is seen then that... It is this contemplation, in the mass and in detail, which gives rise to judgment in all of its orders, with everything that is attendant upon it, and that upon it hinges the alteration of judgment and its orders as dictated by all of the ascents and descents required by the world, as well as every new amendment required by it in the passage of time. This contemplation will never fade. It gives the world its existence in all periods and times, and at every moment, all in proper time and season. It also originates for the world a sense and increases in strength as is necessary for its perfection. But we must probe more deeply into these things to understand them well. There is certainly no end to wisdom and much is needed to know things completely. Concerning this it is written in Ecclesiastes 7.23 I said I will become wise, but it is far from me. But let us return to our subject. What emerges from all we have said until now is that the Blessed One is completely beyond comprehension in all of his creations, and that his nature is completely devoid of anything conceived by our minds or construed by our thoughts. But he wills to project from himself certain providences which are relevant and beneficial to us, and by virtue of which we ascribe to him all of his many attributes and recounts, his prayers by our poor powers alone. And we have already explained this previously, that the Blessed One originated for his acts and his providence certain attributes and ordinances which are ascribed to him, just as he invested the soul with certain qualities and characteristics. But we already know the great difference between these and the characteristics of the soul, for the soul is invested with these characteristics, they having been super added to its essence, whereas the same cannot be said with respect to the Blessed One, God forbid. We know only that he acts through these characteristics, but not that they are characteristics inherent within him or accidents superadded to him, God forbid. But we know him to be insusceptible of any accident or discrimination attributable to his creations, and we attribute these qualities to him only by way of expressing the effect upon us 
of his providence and supervision, but in no way do we ascribe them to his nature. We have already explained this in its place, and the paragon of writers, the great master Maimonides, has already expatiated upon this in his Guide to the Perplexed. We know then for certainty that even those qualities that we do discriminate in his acts have been originated for us alone and are representative of our level only and not of his at all. And the generality of his qualities that he originated for his acts are the sources of all that is done with his creations at all times. They comprise an excellent order of ordinance towards the perfection of all the creations, all arranged according to level, one higher than the other, until the apex of all that is subsumed in these qualities. However, the discrimination of this hierarchy is perceived through his acts alone. That is, when we collate all that is done by the Blessed One with his creations and define everything correctly and appraise all of these acts against one another, we arrive at a state of affairs whereby one act may be termed nobler than another and therefore above it in a hierarchy. And we ascribe attributes to the Blessed One according to the acts that issue from him and in accordance with the order of the acts. We ascribe order and value to the attributes. And we know of sages who were versed in these orders and the ordinances and who were therefore able to pronounce certain qualities and consequently the acts issuing from them as interrelated with each other in many ways and forms. For although each quality is certainly an entity unto itself, Blessed One willed and made the generality of qualities interrelated with each other, so that the completion of one factor would require the assistance of another to the degree and extent necessary. There is profound wisdom in this subject of interrelationships, the knowledge of the conjunction of all the aspects of his ordinance as links on the chain, one inserted in the other. And Maimonides of Blessed Memory says in his Guide to the Perplex, in chapter 1, section 54, All my goodness, as quoted from Exodus 13, 19, refers to God's showing him, referring to Moses, all of the creations. That is, showing them to him in such a way that he would apprehend their natures and interrelationships. For among these qualities there are those who may be interrelated by way of cause and effect, and there will be perceived in their linkage all that is necessary for the determination of their cause and effect relationship. And there are those qualities that may be related by way of conjunction in an adjunct capacity to a greater or lesser extent, or they may be related by way of projection and reception. That is, a certain factor may be originated by one of the qualities and be received by the next. For example, a man who considers something he sees, who wishes to understand its nature, may first draw upon the image of faculty and construe that object in his mind. However, if he draws upon no other faculty, only an image will have been projected into his mind. But if he wishes to understand it, the faculty of reflection will be aroused within him and it will take that thing, divide it, dissect it and again reunite its parts, dividing what is divisible and joining what must be conjoined until complete cognition will have been achieved. And all of these things must certainly occur in a man's soul before the desired end can be achieved. Although these activities are not corporeal but spiritual, they must occur. And here we find the object construed by the faculty of imaging issuing from that faculty and being passed onto the faculty of reflection to do with it as it will, as we explained. This then is an instance of the conjunction of qualities by way of projection and reception.
This is evident. We find then in the orders of the ordinance that each lower level is brought about by the one above it, and it is also in need of it, their entering into the completion of the lower level itself in hidden ways, something of what has entered from the higher levels. We may discriminate in the lower level itself then as an immediate cause from the level immediately preceding it and a distance cause from the levels anterior to that immediately preceding. And all this with the most exacting refinement, in the exactitude of the profoundest wisdom. In sum, the Blessed One originated varieties of providence, gauged in character, order and level, from the generality of which, according to the nature of each, their multifarious interrelationships and all of their stages, there emerges the perfect ordinance, the ordinance through which the Creator governs His world from the day of its creation until the ultimate end is achieved. And we must understand in respect to all of these what is a function of the order of the levels of their hierarchical, hierarchical arrangement and what is a function of discriminations within their character. For there are qualities and providences within the order of reward and punishment which give existence to good and evil and others within that of the Blessed One's sovereignty which perfect all defects. And amongst the qualities of reward and punishment themselves there are those within the framework of His loving kindness, others within the framework of His justice, and yet others within a mediating framework of mercy. And all of these two operating in many different combinations. There are varieties of providence within the framework in the darkness of earthiness, the nature of which is to darken and make gross whatever arises in the world. And there are those within the framework of spiritual godly illumination, the nature of which is to brighten the darkness and shed luminescence upon the creations. And within this framework there are many levels, one higher than the next. One who seeks to understand, as far as humanly possible, the ordinance of the Blessed One, we must consider all of these things. He must understand the roots and the branches, that is, these varieties of providence and their orders and their ramifications, both in the creations themselves and their accidents. And all of these things will become clear to you when you have assimilated all I have explained to you until now. And the most important thing I have mentioned, aside from the operations of the ordinance in terms of the deeds wrought in this world, is the knowledge of the essential level of the creations, whether in terms of their refinement and spirituality or their coarseness and corporeality, their exaltedness and glory or their defectiveness and lowliness all proceeding from the workings of these varieties of providence originated by the Blessed One. For, in respect of His perfection, all creations would be alike in the essence of glory and sublime refinement. But He originated these varieties of providence, the reflection of which is all the corresponding levels and differences found in creation. All is found to be dependent then on these originated providences in their orders. I shall say somewhat more about this later. What I have told you thus so far, however, is sufficient to settle your mind in respect to the profound dynamics in the first variety of the laws of the ordinance of reward and punishment, i.e. the laws of his providence. We come now to the second variety, the laws of the reception of this providence. I have heard until now great cogent prefaces which have certainly settled my mind and which have extracted me from the perplexity of many confusing doubts. I am now prepared to hear the rest of your words which will provide complete resolution for all that I must know. Until now we have spoken of the Blessed One's providence which gives rise in the world to all of the acts which originate within it. We must now explain the essence of the terrestrial creations, with all of the changes that occur within them, and with all of the laws of their nature. Now this too 
is certainly a function of one of the Blessed One's providences, but even so is a species in itself. For the other providences are what the Holy One Blessed Be He projects upon creation, whereas this one resides in the nature of the creations themselves. Although this too certainly hinges upon the Blessed One's word and follows the pattern of the other providences as we explained previously. We shall yet speak of this further with God's help. What we must understand now is that further with God's help, what we must understand now is that these deeds performed in the world by the Blessed Ones constitute one category and the evidence of the creations in relations with these are performed constitutes another. By probing the first category, we gain an understanding of the Blessed One's providence, and by probing the second of all the orders of change in the essence of the creations, or ascent or descent, in all of the details inherent in this source. We shall now explain. I have already stated that the existence of these creations too derives from his world, there being no existence for them except through his providence and his superintendence. If the Creator were, God forbid, to suspend this providence and superintendence, <clears throat> all of the creations would vanish into nothingness in an instant. But there is certainly a power emanating from him to the creations, which gives them existence. By way of analogy, it is stated, just as the soul sustains the body, which would be lost without it, in the same way the Creator's providence sustains all of his creations, who would go lost without it. It is for this reason that our sages termed the Creator's providence the soul of the souls. And I have already stated that this is a phenomenon which must be discriminated in itself aside from all of the other providences which he projects upon the world. For the only end of this providence is the existence of the creatures, not to the accidents that arise and are acted in them. What must be understood in respect to this category is only the difference in the time periods of the creations and the changes in their states, from ascent to descent as we explained. For all of these are certainly aspects of the Blessed One's words, implicit in the laws he established for the essence of the created beings, who cannot rise above or descend below what has been implanted in their nature. Let us now understand what we can of this essence, all of it being attributable but to this, es to this providence and superintendence from the Blessed One to it. Chief among the creations is man, and chief among man is the congregation of Israel. Our sages have stated in Yerushalmi Shabbos 6, the ministering angels sit outside and Israel within, as it is written in Numbers 23, 23. Now it shall be said to Jacob and to Israel, what has God wrought? But we must discriminate two opposite conditions in man, as our sages have stated in Vayikra Rabbah 14a. If he is worthy, he is told, you preceded all the acts of creation. If he is not worthy, he is told, a gnat preceded you. This, because there is no creature more susceptible of evil than man, in that it is possible for him to sin and rebel, God forbid, and the inclination of man's heart is evil from his youth, which is not so in respect to any other creature. On the other hand, when he is perfect and complete, he is superior to all. It is he who achieves union with the Blessed One, and all of the other creatures are subservient to him, as intimated in the aforementioned statement of our sages, and they would have similarly stated concerning Israel, quote from Megillah 16a, that they are as the stars of the heavens and sands of the earth in height and depth. For in truth, the supreme wisdom decreed the true essence of man to be extremely noble and exalted, but he lowered them first 
so that this evil might take hold of in him. And when he is low, he is lower than all of creations, evil holding sway in him and not in any other creature. But when he achieves perfection and completeness, he returns to his truly preeminent status and is raised and elevated above all, ascending to a level unattainable by any other creature. The ultimate ends of the world cycle is the revelation of the Supreme Oneness, evil itself testifying to the Blessed One's Oneness, and in transformation to good, as it is written in Yeshaya 12 verse 1, I shall thank you, O Lord, for your anger against me, which I have already explained previously. Nothing then is done except through this lowering of the essence of man. For though its evil holds sway in him, and when he perfects himself and ascends, evil is transformed to good. For it is the evil inclination itself which secures this merit for him. It emerges then that his defect is his perfection. For if he were always in a state of sublimity, insusceptible of evil, he would not achieve the perfection of transforming evil to good, which is the chief perfection of the creation. The Holy One, blessed be He, in truth, made man's essence great, but did not plant His goodness within him so that he would be in a constant state of glory. Instead, He made him like the moon, which is dark and must receive its light from the sun, after which it is luminescent. In the same way, man is not in his strength by virtue of himself, but is perfected in his strength by virtue of his union with the Blessed One, who illuminates him in the light of his countenance and renders him perfect. The Blessed One's sole object in all of these orders of his providence is the congregation of Israel. His intent is constantly towards it, as it is written in Psalms 40 verse 6, your wonders and your thoughts towards us. Therefore, the orders of his providence and those of the existence of Israel certainly run parallel to each other, so that in every order of his providence there is implanted the union of the Blessed One with the congregation of Israel in accordance with that order, according to the ascents projected for it. However, you must know a great principle governing the service devolving upon man. All of the creations are dependent upon the Creator and are nothing but what is projected upon them by Him. There are, therefore, no, not masters of their acts and deeds, but all of their deeds are determined by His providence towards them. Only man possesses this special faculty of free choice having the power to act of his own free will without compulsion, as our sages have stated in Brachot 33b, all is in the hands of heaven except the fear of heaven. We find then that man too is certainly dependent upon the Creator, just as all other creatures, but that in respect to divine service, he is invested with a quality in which he is not dependent Upon the Creator at all, but upon His own free will. This is as we have said, all is in the hands of heaven except the fear of heaven. And the souls themselves, before they descend into the body, are just as all the other creations, dependent on the Creator, having, in their prior state, no divine service and free will. It is only when they descend into the body that they are invested with free will and in this respect become self-dependent and not dependent upon the Creator. But in all the respects there is no question that man too is completely dependent upon Him. As our sages have stated, all is in the hands of heaven. Now observe how great an honour the Creator has accorded the righteous by considering them partners with Him in the universe. As our sages have stated in Zohar, you are my nation and you are with me. For in truth, he has given them a part in the perfection of the world and in the enhancement of the creation, as we've explained previously, so that the perfection of the creation is found as it were 
to be divided between the Holy One, blessed be He, and the righteous. It's been completed only through both of them, so that the congregation of Israel is, as it were, on familiar terms with the Holy One, blessed be He, as a woman with her husband and this in point of its having a share in the perfection of the world itself as we have explained and this and for this reason it can speak up before god and hold its head high not as one who eats of what is not his and is ashamed as in regard to the face of his provider as explained in your shall me all at chapter 1 verse 3 but they bask in the radiance of the divine presence, in joy, and with head held high, which is not the case with souls before entering the body of this world. For they are, at that time, like servants who shuffle after their master, certainly a part of the Lord on high, and united with him, but receiving charity shamefacedly, as we explain. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai has provided us with a very fine analogy for this. In respect to prayer, he stated that there is one who is a servant, not much loved by the king, who will raise his voice to petition the king for something when his back is turned. The king will decree that his servant's request be granted, but he will not turn his face towards his servant and he will not look upon him. There is another servant who is beloved by the king who will receive him cordially, turn his face towards him and speak to him as long as he desires. This is what is stated in respect to Moses and Israel. And he quotes from Deuteronomy 5.4, face to face did the Lord speak. And from Exodus 33.11, and the Lord spoke with Moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend. And, as in the priestly blessing in Numbers 6.25, the Lord caused his countenance to shine upon you. But elsewhere it is stated in Exodus 33.23, And you will see the back of me, but my face shall not be seen. And all this is natural. Two friends who incline to each other in love turn their faces towards each other, thus manifesting their closeness. And if two male men feel distant from each other, one turns his face to one side and the other turns his face to the other side. For facing always expresses inclination and the turning of the back estrangement. And all of these conditions may obtain in respect to the union of the terrestrial creatures with the Creator. For when they have perfected themselves on the level appropriate for them, they are strongly reunited with the Creator in an absolute bond of love, as two friends, as it were, who turn their faces towards each other. But not having reached this level and being unprepared, they are certainly born and tolerated by Him, as we explained, for in any event the souls are a part of the Lord on high, and they constantly cleave to Him, their root and source, not familiarly and proudly, However, but as two who turn their faces to opposite sides, demonstrating their estrangement, each withdrawing into himself and shunning the other. So, with, so with these souls, they are born by him, but as something which is not greatly beloved. They have no face with which to regard him, and he does not turn his face towards them. When they will have perfected themselves, however, they will regard one another with love, as it is written and in Song of Songs 2.14. Show me your countenance, and your countenance is beautiful. From what we have said, you will understand that though there is certainly no body or form on high, there are forms of superintendence and providence which can be referred to figuratively as face and others which can be referred to as back, as in the aforementioned verse, and you will see the back of me, but my face shall not be seen. It is understood that the types of providence referred to as face will correspond to a man's face, expressing closeness and love, and those referred to as back to a man's back, expressing estrangement. 
By reference to these attributes, we discriminate the state of closeness or distance vis-à-vis -vis Israel and the Blessed One. And what we must further know is that although Israel is prepared in themselves for divine service and acts of their own free will, without any compulsion whatsoever, as we explained, the power for this service itself is given to them only by the Blessed One. This is what he gave them at the time of the giving of the Torah and what he sustains and renews in each of them constantly. Note that this is the difference between one who is commanded by God and does what he is commanded and one who does without being commanded. The one who is commanded possesses power according to him by the Blessed One to effect through his deeds the perfection required by the creation, unlike the one who is not commanded. This can be illustrated by the institution of the priesthood. The priest who officiates perfects the entire universe, whereas the non-priest who does so is guilty of desecration and incurs the death penalty. What is more, the priest himself who officiates without the priestly garments is accounted as a non-priest, all being dependent upon the heavenly power, the king's mandate, which only the commanded receives. However, this power is accorded only him who is fit, in himself to receive it. It is given neither to beasts nor to angels, but only to the children of Israel, who were ready for it from the beginning. It is to be noted that this is what God did with Israel at the time. He did not give them all of the Torah at that time, but the event served as a general preparation for the entire service of the mitzvot. For there he first perfected for them all of the graces and qualities appropriate for one designated to serve as creator. For in the beginning he had lowered the stature of man to render him susceptible of an evil inclination, as we explained. At that point he could be compared to the beasts, but when Israel came to Mount Sinai, the Creator accorded them all the grandeur demanded for their perfection, so that they would have the power to serve Him. He then drew them close to Him in love. As we read in the Haggadah, the Passover Haggadah, he drew us close at Mount Sinai, and as we say every day, and you drew us close to your great name. And he united them with, his, with him and his love. It was then that he first gave them the power to observe all of the mitzvot and provided for their deeds in his service to result in the goodly fruit required for the perfection of the creation. This is the intent of in Exodus 19.6 And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. From that point on, Israel remains distinct from all of the nations and graced with the heavenly power to observe all the mitzvot and perfect all of the creation through them, as we explained. And this phenomenon is constantly renewing itself and never ceasing from Israel, as it is written in Deuteronomy 27.9. This day you have become a people, every Jew being required to see himself as receiving the Torah from Mount Sinai, the grandeur renewing itself for Israel each day and in the proper season. We shall now explain the nature of the partnership that we mentioned above between the righteous and the Holy One, blessed be He, in the perfection of the creation. The Creator originated the phenomenon of darkness implanted in terrestrial beings and constituted the source of evil, as well as the possibility for its removal and transformation to good, as we have explained. Now the Blessed One is providential to the terrestrial creatures only in accordance with their state of readiness. It therefore falls to the lot of the righteous to perfect this dark nature little by little. For to the extent that they perfect it, to the extent will the Creator manifest new beneficial providences, 
in correspondence with the cultivation and perfection affected in the nature of the terrestrial beings. The righteous, therefore, set before the Blessed One a new readiness and perfection in this dark nature that we mentioned. And the Holy One, blessed be He, responds to them with an ameliorative providence corresponding to that readiness. It befits the righteous then to multiply in the terrestrial beings preparation upon preparation and perfection upon perfection in correspondence with which the Creator will project providence upon providence, embodying ascents upon ascents. After the sin of Adam, the world descended greatly, as we explained, and defect upon defect was added to the nature of terrestrial beings. What must first be corrected then are the added defects, and this is what is indeed being done until the time of the redemption. For this is the ultimate end of the several exiles, to perfect what has been rendered defective and to regain what we have lost, so that we may realize subsequently the good that is to follow just as it would have come to Adam had he not sinned, as we have explained previously. And when this process would have been completed, we shall experience the complete redemption. Our task then is to drive back evil from its expanded boundaries subsequent to Adam's sin and recoup the good that we have lost. And to the extent that advances in this direction are constantly being made through the deeds of the righteous, in the cultivation of the natures of the terrestrial creatures, to that extent the Blessed One is providential towards them. The Holy One, blessed be He, then divides His ordinance itself with the congregation of Israel, making them partners in the perfection of creation. He perfecting on one hand and they on the other, complete perfection being affected between them. It is in this respect that our sages have said in the Midrash of Shea Shea and Rabbah and Yalkut Shimoni 2.5, my dove, my innocent one, my twin. And in scripture we find this idea of the conjunction of providence and of receptivity for the creations, perfection of the creations it's being written in Yeshaya 48.13, My left hand too established the earth, and my right hand perfected the heavens I call to them. They shall stand together. The heavens manifest providence and the earth receives it, but they are both equal in respect to, the perf to perfection being affected between both of them. This is what is intended in the aforementioned Yalkut Shmoni. And I quote, even so, I am not greater than it, nor is it greater than I. However, providence is referred to as the right hand, in that it is dominant, and needs and reception are referred to as the left hand, in that it is secondary to the right. You have already heard how all terrestrial currencies depend upon God's command. The root, however, therefore, of all of these things is the existence of a supreme power which sustains them in all of their conditions and the elements of this power correspond with and are relative to the blessed one's providences in all of their orders as i explained to you previously in interpretations of the verse from exodus thirty three twenty three, and you will see the back of me but my face shall not be seen for there are varieties of providence through which may be gauged the relative closeness and distance between Israel and their Father in heaven, and the condition of the terrestrial beings in all their aspects will vary in accordance with the relation and correspondence of the terrestrial power to the varieties of the Blessed One's providences. For I have already explained to you how they all formed one bond, the branches of but one tree. Well, it certainly stands to reason that there be something behind the changing of the essence of the terrestrial beings from condition to condition. That is, some changing source which in accordance with its change 
affects corresponding visible changes in the terrestrial beings and which is associated with corresponding changes in the variety. There is room for additional discrimination in the relationship between this power and the terrestrial beings themselves. That is, man is constituted of body and soul, and we know that all bodily movements originate in the soul. But we must also understand how the soul resides in the body and how it functions within it to initiate those movements within it. We must similarly understand the idea of the power of the terrestrial beings as it relates to these beings themselves. I shall apprise you of something very deep in this regard. This supreme glory is omnipresent and it is that which gives life to all of the creations as scripture testifies and I quote from Nehemiah 9 verse 6 and you give life to all. And in this respect it is written in Yeshaya 6 verse 3 the whole earth is full of his glory. However, man's sins cause this glory to depart from the terrestrial beings, as it is written also in the Yeshaya 59 verse 2, but your sins separate you from your God. Conversely, merits esconce God's glory amongst them, as it is written in Exodus 25 8, and I will dwell in their midst. And this glory itself is exalted and elevated in residing amongst the terrestrial beings, as our sages have stated in Yoma 38a, all that the Holy One blessedly He created in His world, He created only for His glory. And in respect to exile, it is written in Lamentations 1 verse 6, and they went without strength before the pursuer, because the supreme power was distant from them. As it is written also in Numbers 14 verse 9, their protection has departed from them. In respect to Israel's redemption, however, it is written in Yeshaya 60 verse 1, and the glory of God will shine upon you. At that time, this glory itself will be uplifted. This is evident. Know that this phenomenon is essential in respect to the angels and their activities. The Creator willed to perform His deeds through intermediaries, the holy angels, for which reason He willed and reposited His presence among these angels, His messengers who carry out all of His decrees, and His Lordship is always with, within them, as our sages have stated in Yaakov Shimoni chapter 2, 797, the Lord is with them. His Lordship is within them, and, quoting from Tanakhuan Mishpatim 18, the name of the Holy One, blessed be He, is conjoined with every angel, and this glory presides over all of the hosts and clings to them constantly, but in proportion to the level and significance of the angel, for they too are arranged in rank order, each according to his level. And know too that though the glory of God is omnipresent, it reveals itself in one place more than in another, a place consecrated to his glory, where he is besought by those who desire to unite themselves with him, as it is written in Deuteronomy 12 verse 5, Seek out his dwelling place and come there. And also from Exodus 34, 23, Let all your males be seen in the presence of the Lord God, the God of Israel. And many orders and arrangements are necessary in great gradations before this unity with the holiness of the Blessed One may be achieved. And upon this foundation rests the entire structure of the tabernacle of the sanctuary, a place within a place, until the inner sanctum, where the glory of the Lord resides, to be besought and found by those desiring union with him. And there is a sanctuary above, corresponding to that below, as I quote from Tan Chumam Mishpatim 18, And all the hosts of heaven exalt the excellence of this glory, saying, as in Isaiah 6 verse 3, The whole earth is full of his glory. And Ezekiel 3 verse 12, Blessed is the glory of God from his place. For he alone is the power of all created beings, as we explain. And this is the intent of Psalms 104 verse 31. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. Let the Lord rejoice in his creations. 
his glory being exalted through the praise of his creations. It is in this respect that our sages stated in Chulin 60a, this verse was proclaimed by the regent of the world. This elevation of God's glory results from the workings of all the various creations, each one according to the function unique to it. And this was the meditation of the priest in the sacrificial service, especially in that of the daily offering, concerning which it is written, and I quote from Numbers 28 verse 2, My sacrifice, my bread. For this was sacrificed before the Blessed One every day for the benefit of the entire creation, its signification being the elevation of God's glory through the collocation of all of the species in existence, each in its own domain. And this, indeed, required great wisdom on the part of the priests, so that they could approach the Lord on behalf of all of Israel with service that was truly acceptable. In this regard it is written, and I quote from Malachi 2 verse 7, for the lips of the priest will guard knowledge, and they will seek Torah from his mouth. For they would concentrate upon uniting all of the creations with the Creator, knowing what was required for the attainment of this condition. And they would likewise perform within this context all of the necessary specific operations of the sacrificial ritual, such as the sprinkling of the blood and the burning of the incense, all corresponding to profound mysteries in the perfection of the entire creation in unity with the Blessed One. There is much to be expiated upon in this regard, but this is not its place. The general intent, however, is to unite all of the creations, the lower ones and those above them, in the supreme glory, as it is written in Jeremiah 23 verse 24, do I not fill heaven and earth? And this, through those orders, designed for that purpose and in the capacity of servants gathered in the shelter of their master. The righteous, however, perform a special function in this area as we have explained, to effect amendment in the creation itself as I have indicated to you, by establishing a new perfection every day within the province of their powers, by virtue of which the Creator manifests towards them a providence of blessing, corresponding to their awakening and readiness. You have already heard that all of the defects in creation are results of the concealment of His perfection and oneness. For His oneness, when it dominates, has the effect of perfecting the creation completely, and removing every impediment between the Creator and the creations, as we explained, in relation to the verse, and I quote from Yeshaya 59 verse 2, for your transgressions separated. But when the righteous perform this service, the supreme oneness awakens and is partially revealed in accordance with the amendment affected by it, so that perfection is added to the creation in proportion to that service. For there is no service that does not add perfection to the universe through the revelation of the Blessed One's oneness, which removes what separates the creations and the Creator, and unites the creations with the Supreme Glory. And the terrestrial beings will be united with the Blessed One's holiness through all of the agencies that He ordered for conferring His holiness upon them, through the varieties of His ordinance, the varieties of blessing through which He blesses His creation. In the beginning of the service, there will be a strengthening of the union between the souls and the Blessed One's holiness, as a part unites with its whole. As in the analogy of Scripture from Deuteronomy 32 verse 9, for a part of the Lord is His people. And as elaborated upon in the beginning of the Song of Songs, chapter 1 verse 2, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, which connotes the strength of the union. It is a kind of firm union which may be forged between the Holy One, Blessed be He, and the congregation of Israel, for which the human kiss may serve as an image. And through the strength of this union, the Holy One, Blessed be He, will project upon the congregation of Israel and upon all within its orbit an effluence of holiness, that is, a godly spiritual effluence, an effluence of blessing, serving for success even in this world. And when the terrestrial beings are united with the Blessed One in a union of love, 
The Holy One, blessed be he, will awaken love between himself and them and will desire their service, as in the formulation of our sages, and I quote, who chooses his people Israel in love, and desire, O Lord our God, your people Israel and their prayers. For it is through this desire that their service avails for the perfection of the creation, as we have already explained previously. For it is only the power of the supreme command and will that renders the mitzvot effective and perfective. It is a power of this will which invests divine service with whatever effectiveness it possesses, elicits the effluence of blessing through all of the agencies established to this end, brings blessing to the terrestrial creation as a whole and confers it subsequently upon each individual in particular in accordance with his deserts. These are the ways of the Blessed One. The ways of the Lord are righteous in his conduct with the terrestrial creatures for their pleasure and good. And he who looks into them will find them wonderfully cogent. Let him probe the entire range of Torah and mitzvot, but one of them will be found wanting. I shall now reveal to you another central principle. The congregation of Israel possesses a root of holiness, which is universal within this holy nation by virtue of their being Israel, and which exists even in the evildoers amongst them. As our sages have stated in Sanhedrin 44a, even though he has sinned, he is part of Israel. And though this is rooted in extremely exalted origins in Israel's issuing from the Blessed One, as it is written in Lamentations 3 verse 24, My portion is the Lord, said the, my soul, therefore I shall have hope in him. Still, the preponderantly great and broad ordinance of the world, in all of the orders of the creations for good or evil, hinges not upon this, but upon the deeds of men, each being judged in accordance with his deeds. There it seems, there it seemed to be then a type of existence for the congregation of Israel, a general existence, without many results or ramifications, an existence which is not extremely crucial, but which is extremely exalted. Then there is its ex essential existence, its existence in respect to the divine service devolving upon it, upon which hinge all of the aspects of the great profound ordinance. You should know further that the phenomenon of day and week constitutes a particular continuous cycle, as we shall explain further with God's help. The core of the week is in the Sabbath, the rest of the week only completing what is implicit in the Sabbath itself. On the Sabbath there originates an effluence, which, on the remaining days of the week, produces what is required for all of the creations, day by day, in accordance with its magnitude and the orders of the cycle. The core of the day is the morning, the remainder of its times completing what was originated then. The essential providence will be adduced by the terrestrial beings in their essential capacity, and the other secondary aspects of the providence in their non-essential capacity. This is self-evident, for everything proceeds in parallels and in correspondence, the providence with its objects and the acts with those acted upon. Understand that the Creator, elevated, exalted, completely unfathomable, originated varieties of holiness emanating from him into the terrestrial beings. And even this holiness is not like his own concealed unfathomable holiness, but corresponds to the state of readiness of its recipients. And even this is subject to gradation, for one holiness may be greater than another, as there are lesser sanctities and greater sanctities. This is evidence. Now, the Blessed One continuously originates new perfections in the generality of the creation according to the awakening of the terrestrial creatures, as we explained. And every perfection requires all of the conditions necessary for its completion and for the completion of all of the results that are to follow from it. And all of this is affected through the union of the creations with him. However, the origination of one of the essential perfections requires the union of the creations, and especially the congregation of Israel, 
with gods in the essential capacity of their existence, in the more exalted capacity upon which the entire creation hinges. Only then will they educe from him the great essential effluence required for the perfection originated in them. But the completion of the aspects of that perfection requires union only in the capacity corresponding to the level of the completing conditions. This stands to reason in terms of the concepts of parallelism and gradation. All of these things had to be known by the priests who offered the sacrifice of the Lord, the daily sacrifices according to their orders, and the supplementary sacrifices in accordance with their laws, according to the divisions of the times, as we explained. They had to know, concerning this union of the creations with the Creator, on which the various levels this union would take place, which revelation of the supreme will would be experienced by them, and which effluence would issue forth for them, all according to the time and exigencies of the hour. Upon, up to this point, God had helped me to explain to you what you needed to know concerning the ordinance of reward and punishment. We now come to the explanation of the secondary, second ordinance, we have mentioned the hidden ordinance, which is working towards the end of the universal perfection. And in this connection, there will be explained the concept of all is dependent upon mazal, literally the constellations mentioned by our sages. You've mentioned something that I greatly desire to understand. It is one of those things that I find very difficult and I'm eager to have it resolved. But involved in all of this is the concept of the evil who prosper and the righteous who suffer, which it is not possible to understand. Why then did you broach it if you cannot explain it? There is a limit to our understanding beyond which we must cease probing. I should explain to you what is sufficient to resolve the matter in our minds when we have seen the rationale of the subject, but what does not lend itself to the comprehension we shall not pursue. But know that what cannot be comprehended does not at all undermine our belief, nor does it confuse our thoughts. For you will satisfy yourself that it is only added knowledge which is not indispensable to us. But what is needed for settling our minds and clarifying our faith we certainly possess. The Lord God did not create a condition whereby belief would be undermined through inability to resolve a matter. It is thusly written, in Deuteronomy 4 verse 39 and you should know today and return it to your heart that the Lord he is God if so tell me what you think I need to know once the Blessed One has established an order of reward and punishment everyone will receive the fruits of his deeds good for the good evil for the evil however it is of the deep counsel of the Blessed One to so orient things that they will resolve themselves into an ordinance of good alone, with no existence whatsoever for evil in the world. This is referred to as the perfection and refinement of the ordinance itself. But this universal perfection must be effected by way of the root of the existence of good and evil. For one who wishes to effect a complete cure for an illness must seek out its cause, after which he is in a position to remove the effect. Here too, in order to bring about an ordinance of good alone, with no place for evil whatsoever, it is necessary to know the cause of evil in the present ordinance, and in relation to that cause, to so orient things that this result follows, the elimination of evil from the ordinance. And this is obvious. The Holy One, blessed be He, does not wish to recant as one who regrets his earlier deeds, and to forsake one way for another, but on the basis of the original premise itself, he so orients things as to have them result in the perfection he, he desires. Now, the root of the existence of evil in the ordinance we have already explained, as inhering in the ultimate re revelation of the Blessed One's oneness, it being necessary for him to reveal evil and to allow it to do all that it is in its nature to do so, as to subsequently reveal his sovereignty in transforming it to good, 
And for this reason, as long as the countenance of the Blessed One is concealed and hidden, and he allows evil to intensify itself to its fullest possible extent, that is, until, but not including, the destruction of the universe, this will serve as an additional reason for the truth of the Blessed One's oneness to be subsequently revealed and beheld by his perfecting those defects through the power of his reign light being recognized from the depths of the darkness as we have explained previously therefore the blessed one in desiring to establish his world in the ordinance of good had to order his ordinance according to this root consideration of the revelation of oneness that we mentioned from which derived the present existence of good and evil Reward and punishment, however, does not constitute intensification of evil, for in any event, under this ordinance, evil visits only the wicked, and those who forsake the Lord go lost, whereas those who seek him are granted his favour. The intensification of evil consists, rather, in God's completely concealing his countenance from the universe, as it is written in Proverbs 1 verse 28. They, then they call me and I will not answer. And also from Yeshaya 59 verse 15, and truth was lacking, and the forsaker was evil and accounted senseless. This is referred to as complete concealment, the purpose of which is only the subsequent complete perfection, as indicated in the verse that follows. And I also quote from Yeshaya uh, uh, 59 16, and he was saved by his right hand, and his righteousness sustained him. In this order and ordinance, he does not pay to merit or guilt, but the ordinance proceeds according to its orders, that is, by allowing evil to intensify in order to reveal afterwards the reign of good. And all the time that evil is intensifying, the righteous too must abide its oppression, not because this is just, but because the time requires it. For in any event, they will afterwards receive full reward uh, when the good is revealed and reassumes its reign in accordance with the evil that they had suffered in the beginning. As it is written in Psalms 90 verse 15, cause us to rejoice according to the days that you oppressed us. But in the entire period of the intensification of the evil, their merits will not avail to save them from it. As it is written in Amos 5:13. Therefore the wise one on that day will remain silent, for it is a time of evil. What is more, in that every defect and undermining of order is of the nature of evil, not only will merit the merit of the righteous not avail them to escape them from evil, but to the contrary, wicked men will prosper and fortune will smile upon them, while the righteous will be tortured and oppressed, as our sages have stated in Sota 49a, in the footsteps of the Messiah, audacity will prevail, the wisdom of the scribes will be despised, and as the scripture itself states in Yeshaya 59.15, and truth was lacking, and the forsaker of evil was accounted senseless. It is seen then that if the Blessed One desires to conduct the world according to the ordinance of oneness, whereby light is recognized from the midst of darkness, and evil itself is transformed to good, he must allow evil to intensify without regards to the merits of the righteous. To the contrary, at that time, the doers of evil are built up and the heads of the righteous are lowered to the ground. After this, he will reveal his kingdom, the fruit of that revelation being the transformation of evil itself to good. And that time there will be no longer any evil, but good only in the world. And only then, and not before, will the righteous receive their reward. If he conducted the universe according to the ordinance of reward and punishment, however, there would be only good for the good and evil for the evil. But there is nothing here which would bring about the complete perfection of an ordinance through the removal of evil. For why should it be removed if it visits only the wicked and is kept within bounds so that it cannot act within the full range of its nature but only within properly prescribed limits? 
But because the Holy One, blessed be He, truly desires the complete perfection of the universe and the complete removal of evil, He desires to conduct Himself with the righteous according to the ordinance of oneness that we put mentioned, whereby their righteousness will not avail to spare them from the sufferings of this world. And this is certainly not within the framework of reward and punishment, but only within that of the universal perfection being realized by way of them. And this is certainly to their benefit, for in the end they will receive a greater reward than they would have been received by virtue of their merit alone. And it is to the benefit of the world as well, for if he conducted himself towards them according to the ordinance of reward and punishment, no fruit would result from their deeds except rewards for their deeds, but not elimination of evil from the world. But since what they are bearing is not virtue by virtue of their acts, but by virtue of the ordinance, the benefit will not be particular to give them reward, but general in terms of the ordinance to reveal through their merit the supreme oneness and to remove evil from the ordinance itself. And you will note an additional advantage in this. <clears throat> that even the revelation of the supreme oneness will be reward and merit, reward for merit and not complete charity. For though it may be charity as far as other men are concerned, to the righteous it is a reward for merit and their goodness creates benefaction for the world at large so that the entire congregation of Israel is found to gain. But according to this, all of the righteous would know nothing but suffering, but reality shows this not to be so. There is a deep-rooted reason for this. The Blessed One created evil with that character and with those limitations which he designed, and he has set things in motion to eradicate it from creation entirely, as we explained. But he must conduct this process according to the nature of evil and the orders that he created for it. This is obvious. Now then, the Blessed One, having created the world imperfect, is so regulating things as to bring about the perfection of the creation through the elimination of its defects. And he alone knows the basis for all of the things he desires to do, and the reasons for all of his decrees, which are hidden from his creations. For his creations have knowledge only of the decrees of the Supreme Will and onwards, but of what transcends that, that is, the reasons for these decrees, they have been granted no knowledge at all. And these constitute the inquiries that are forbidden to us, for they are rooted in the majesty of the will that desired them, something that we cannot fathom. Now the Blessed One knows that the perfection of the creation requires two things. The intensification of illumination, that is, the intensification and magnification of providence, and its concealment and diminution. For there are some things which are perfected through an intensification of illumination and providence, and others, to the contrary, through its concealment and diminution, in allowing evil its great intensification, as we explain. And this will be apparent to whoever puts his heart to all that occurs in the universe. He will find nothing to occur, neither good nor bad, which does not result in benefits and good to the world. As our sages have stated in Brachot 68, all that is done by heaven is for the good. But the Lord has many ways, some proceeding in one direction and others in other directions, these things being dependent not upon deed and merit, but upon the character and essence of the creation. And the Blessed One, alone, who truly knows the essence of the creation, knows also what is needed for it. Only this we know. There is that in the essence of the creation, the perfection of which inquires increase and diminution. This is the nature of the 28 times mentioned in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, corresponding to which there is a witness in the heavens, the moon, the waxing and waning of which images this concept. And there are profound understandings in this regard possessed by those who are wise in the ways and motions of the moon and in its relationship with the sun in all of its states. For these serve as counterparts of all of the general aspects of the ordinance resolving itself 
into the perfection of the creation in accordance with this characteristic that it possesses, which requires increase and diminution for its perfection, as we explained. It is for this reason that the congregation of Israel was compared to the moon. Our sages say in Sanhedrin 42a, for they, Israel, are destined to be renewed as it's like the moon. The details of the subject are numerous and profound, but basically the idea is that the generality of the aspects of the ordinance resolving itself for Israel and the creation as a whole towards the realization of their perfection in terms of the nature of the creation and not in terms of the acts of the terrestrial creatures, the generality of these aspects is, related, is reflected in the moon in all that can be discriminated within it. But the Creator apportioned the perfection of the creation amongst all of the souls that He created to serve Him, in accordance with what He knew to be appropriate for each soul relative to the purpose for which it was created. This knowledge is of the greatest profundity, never having been perceived by any prophet or seer, for it is included in the category of the reasons for the decrees that we mentioned a category entirely outside the province of the creations, only the results of the decrees being known to them, so that there may be one man who, in, term, in terms of his root purpose, is designated for a profusion of divine providence, which is one of the ways in which the universe is perfected, as we explained, and there be, may be another whose root purpose dictates for him a diminution of providence, the second means required for the perfection of the creation. And all of this relates not to the deeds of these men, but to the Blessed One's distribution of the perfection of creation among the creations, each of them being perfected in its own way. But a judgment is the Lord's, so that in the end, goodly reward will be given to the righteous, who were indeed righteous, but who were singled out by the supreme ordinance for oppression and affliction, both for the sufferings they underwent in this world and for all of their virtuous deeds. The generality of this ordinance, which is oriented not in respect to merit and guilt, but in respect to what is required for the perfection of the universe in terms of its essence, and sages, refer to this as mazal, or literally the constellations, for its nature is decree and it is not dependent upon man's free will and upon his merits. As I have already said, however, this ordinance is operative only in this world, but in the world to come there is a reward only for deeds, measure for measure, even as far as for the proper choice of words. If so, let us say, then, that there is no reward and punishment in this world, but only in the world to come. This is not so. But here you need a fundamental preface. Our sages have stated in Voracious Rabbah 25 verse 3, and there was a hunger in the days of David. It should, be, it should have prevailed not in the days of David, but in the days of Saul. But because Saul would not have been able to tolerate it, the Holy One, blessed be he, caused it to occur in the days of David. And similarly, in the, from Boratius Rabbah 55 verse 2, the flax merchant, when he tests his flax, subject only to the strongest and the strongest test, we then find that the Creator does not always implement mazal, but only when he knows that it is desirable to do so. For the Creator devised perfect orders for the perfection of the creation, as we explained, and he established two ordinances, reward and punishment and mazal. And he is the decisor, resorting sometimes to one and sometimes to the other, in accordance with his knowledge of what better furthers the good of his universe. However, when he operates through reward and punishment, all the results will be in accordance with the orders and laws of reward and punishment. And when he operates through Mazal, all of the results will be in accordance and with the ordinance of Mazal and the character of creation, as we explained. And this too will result in greater merit for the righteous. For if the Creator always afflicted only the righteous, this would still be a test for free will, but not a very great one. 
but they could console themselves in the knowledge that they were unquestionably righteous, in that they were interminably afflicted. And any sensible person would gladly suffer these afflictions, for there would be confirmation of his righteousness, the wicked not being afflicted in this manner. But the Creator desired an area of greater trial, in which men could not clearly understand how the Holy One, blessed be He, conducted Himself with each man in His world, but in which, on the surface of things, the ordinance seems to be, and I quote from Ecclesiastes verse 9, chapter 9, verse 2, all unto all, one happening to the righteous and to the wicked. This was explained by our sages in the Midrash, Yalkut Shimoni or Kohelet 989, Solomon looks down the corridor of the generations and sees the same thing happening to the wicked and the righteous alike. That is, the Holy One, blessed be He, sees that a, that a particular happening which befalls a wicked person who commits a particular transgression to which the punishment is attributed, befalls righteous men too, who are absolutely scrupulous in their shunning of that same transgression. And this truth is incontestably brought out through the examples of Abraham and Nimrod and all of the others mentioned in that Midrash. And all is ordered in this manner to result in goodly reward for the righteous who strengthen themselves in their faith as it is written in Habakkuk 2 verse 4 and the righteous one will live in his faith. For it is impossible for anyone to plumb the depths of what the Holy One, blessed be He, is doing with him. For at any time he may be conducting himself with him through the ordinance of reward and punishment, and at another through that of Mazal, as we explained. And with respect to anything that befalls a man, there is no one who can determine whether it is an aspect of reward and punishment based on his deeds or an aspect of Mazal decreed upon him. And in everything there is an aspect of both, so that any attempt to reach such a determination can only set one's thoughts into a turmoil. But one who is faithful to the Lord must anchor his pole of faith firmly, unswervingly, in the knowledge that every one of the Lord's deeds, whatever form it may take, is unquestionably just and fitting, and not wrong, God forbid. He must not be like the wicked and say, the way of God is not right, but must remain steadfast, serving his Creator with a pure service, accepting with an equal grace every measure meted out to him. If he does so, he will be accounted truly pure. In sum, there are two ways, the way of reward and punishment and the way of mazal, and the Creator utilized them in accordance with his knowledge of what is beneficial for the world. In the Midrash of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, there appears, appears a statement which, through dealing with the profoundest truths in the mysteries of the heavenly attributes, seems very strange, on a superficial level, to one who is unfamiliar with the foregoing prefaces. Uh, and I quote from Tikkunay Zohar 70, And when the Lord arises from the thrones of justice and from the throne of mercy, there is found neither reward nor punishment. The implication seeming to be that there is no reward or punishment, God forbid. The true meaning, however, is that there is a time in which the Creator does not conduct His world according to the ordinance of reward or punishment, but according to that of Mazal, as we explained. Good and evil manifesting themselves in accordance with the ordinance serving the end of the universal perfection. Certainly reward and punishment will obtain in the world to come, each man receiving the fruits of his ways and deeds. But we are being told that in the straits of the footsteps of the Messiah, we should not find it insupportable if the righteous are greatly demeaned and men cry out and are not answered. And all of those other things occur which our sages speak of within the context of, and I quote from Sotar 49b, in the footsteps of the Messiah, audacity will prevail. For all of this arises from the fact that the righteous, in all of their merits, cannot remedy these defects, 
for the time ushers them in towards the end of the subsequent universal perfection through the revelation of the Blessed One's oneness, as we explained. <clears throat> but here a preface is needed for the resolution of many doubts. Even when the Creator wills to conduct his world through the ordinance of Mazal that we mentioned, he so orients and directs things that even what is decreed by Mazal materializes within the ordinance of reward and punishment, as we find in respect to the afflictions of Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Yehuda Anasi, our sages saying in this regard, and I quote from Baba Matiya 85a, through an act, a negative act of Rabbi, they arrived, and through an act, a positive act, they departed. In truth, these afflictions were nothing other than the afflictions of the righteous, but such is the divine attribute. The Holy One, blessed be He, combines these two ordinances so that even the decrees of Mazal materialize only through the agency of something which is attributable to reward and punishment, which is the catalyst of all that must ensue, even though it be relatively insignificant in itself. In sum, the root of God's ordinance, in truth, is the universal perfection of the entire creation, which turns on the poles of nature, of the creations themselves, so fashioned by the Creator. And all of the convolu convolutions of this ordinance <clears throat> are oriented to the end of the universal perfection that we mentioned, through the removal of all of the imperfections of these creations. <clears throat> and there are implicit in this ordinance, profound laws and orders, which are completely unfathomable. And in the midst of the turning of these wheels is found the ordinance of reward and punishment, the revealed ordinance upon which all of the laws of heaven and earth depend. However, the core of all of the orders and laws that we mentioned is in the universal perfection that we mentioned. But these are not two opposite, mutually exclusive ordinances, but to the contrary, the basis is the ordinance of the universal perfection. It is just that the Creator, in His exalted wisdom, contrived to order laws of reward and punishment appropriate to the entire period of the resolution of this ordinance. These laws relating, conforming and corresponding to the governing cycles of this perfection. Therefore, the ordinance of reward and punishment does not depart from the center of the ordinance of the universal perfection, but to the contrary, it corresponds to it and is conjoined to it, and the workings of the ordinance of perfection itself materialize within the ordinance of reward and punishment, as we explained. But the Creator concealed from His creations the workings of this majestic ordinance, so that neither it nor its facets nor the relationship between it and the ordinance of reward and punishment are revealed or known. Nor did any prophet or seer ever arrive at an understanding of it, but they saw what they saw and never completely understood it, but remained beset with a multitude of doubts. As our sages stated concerning the verse and I quote from Exodus 33, verse 19, And I shall be gracious to whom I shall be gracious, and I shall be merciful to whom I shall be merciful. And you should know that the fruit of the virtuous deeds performed by the righteous is what they enjoy in time to come in the world of reward, the eternal world. However, there is in these virtuous deeds themselves the perfection which they affect in the creation according to the order which characterizes it. And there is the reward which the righteous merit because of the perfection which they affect. Therefore, the Creator must take the deeds of man as they are and judge them in terms of their results. In fact, in accordance with what the Holy One, blessed be He, left to man to perfect in the entire creation. And this must be effected in accordance with the essence of the creation, as wrought by the Blessed One, and in accordance with all the discriminations inherent in its structure. But know that nothing is forgotten before the throne of His glory, and nothing is overlooked by Him in the execution of this judgment. That is, 
It is not to be said that if something once perfect became defective and then it was perfected, he remembers only the perfection and forgets, forgets the defect. Or conversely, that the past perfection is something which is which became defective is no longer remembered. This is not so. There was no forgetting before the throne of glory. But there is no comparison between what is affected by the perfection coming after defect or perfection coming after a different perfection, perfection coming after two defects, and so on, ad infinitum. For in terms of the cycle of the entire creation, each act must be judged in terms of its past, present, and future. Creation as a whole being perfected only through the totality of the cyclical elements of all the 6,000 years of this world. And the Creator, in His omniscience, will judge everything on the basis of these three times that we mentioned. But the result of any deed can be measured only in terms of what preceded it, what is in the present, and what will follow it. It is only after all of these are taken into consideration that reward can be prescribed for the doer in time to come, reward appropriate to his actions. This is evident, and on the great day of judgment, the Creator will lay bare the garment of all that was done from the day that God created man upon earth until that day before each creation. And he will see the justness of his judgment in every act, small or great, and what was decreed for him according to his true judgment for the time of receiving reward in time to come, and that the righteous will come forward for the receiving of their reward, each according to his deeds. I've certainly learnt a great deal. I at least have a rationale that sets my mind at rest in, in relation to his providence. I've seen great scope for the divine service of man. I've learnt what it is and what its benefits are. I've seen those things which occur in time and their various sources, the attribute of God's justice and that of his mercy, the ordinance of Mazal and the ultimate end of all these. I've understood the essence of man in the present and his ascents in time to come. I have understood the idea of the coming of the Mashiach, the resurrection and the world of reward, what they are and what their purpose is. And above all, I have strengthened my belief in the knowledge that all proceeds from the Blessed One in depth of counsel, that there is nothing accidental or in vain, whether small or great, that everything is part of a world cycle, tending towards the complete perfection of the entire creation and that this universal perfection will be attained with the resolution of this cycle. I understand these to be the principles of wisdom. The rest is commentary. The understanding of all the particulars in the world, each under its proper category. It is enough for me that I have the roots in hand so that I am at least clearly resolved in my belief. I have yet to explain you, to you the idea of time affecting all men equally, our finding differences within a certain time itself, that is, not in points of acts originating within it, but in point of its being that period itself, as it is written in Ecclesiastes 3 verse 1, For all there is a time, and there is a period for everything. There is certainly a cogent root source for this too. This too is something that I would desire to know well. Each of the stars and constellations exerts an influence on some specific entity in this terrestrial world. One who is influenced by one star is not influenced by another, and all recipients of such influence are recipients in all times and in all places. However, aside from this specific function, the stars have sovereignty and dominion within the cycle of time, each one exercising dominion in the time and period assigned to it. This is well known. There was a great difference, however, between these two dominions, for the dominion that they exercise over the objects specifically assigned them attaches to the essence of the recipients. All that these recipients are is dependent upon them and their innermost essences are affected by the influence that they exert upon them. 
but the broad dominion is universal, a sovereign being sovereign over the entire universe, both in respect to those creations specifically assigned to it and in respect to those not so assigned. But, on the other hand, this sovereignty is not absolute sovereignty in respect to any one of them, their being affected in a general way only. This dominion will certainly leave a definite impression upon the creation, for none of the Blessed One's workings is in vain, but the essence of their activities is in respect to those creations specifically assigned them, as we explained. This is the prototype for the most exalted mysterious operations, for the Creator originated many different varieties of providence for His creations, each variety perfected, adapted to, perfectly adapted to its object. And in addition to this, He decreed an all-encompassing cycle for these varieties of providence within which to exercise their dominion over the world, the order of their sovereignty and activity positioned within the time cycle. Every day there reigns within the ordinance one of the varieties of providence. Its reign is universal, encompassing the entire creation, but its activity within its reign is not its essential activity, this being limited to the specific recipients of its influence. Even so, things will originate in all of the creation in accordance with that providence as a result of this dominion. In this, too, in his the immemorial sanctity of the festival days and all of the other time-conditioned phenomena. But the distinction I have mentioned must be made. There is a difference between the specific function of each providence, irrespective of time, and the cyclical function which is not so fundamental as to penetrate the innermost core of the recipient. This is the pattern for the creation of man on all of his times, which, as you have already heard, parallel the orders of the Supreme Providence. For it is a certain that in each of his times he will be governed in accordance with them, the orders of Providence corresponding to that time, not through the specific effects of those Providences. However, through the disposition of his body and limbs in relation to that order. I have told you what should suffice to put your mind at rest in respect to the truth of those essential principles that you inquired about. We shall go no further in this area. There is one more subject I would like you to clarify for me. It is not too long and also not one of the things ignorant, ignorance of which confounds the mind unlike those things we have discussed until now, but it is something which I would very much like to understand clearly. What may this subject be? It is the subject of prophecy, its nature, its mode of operation, and its benefit. Prophecy is a knowledge and conception of the Blessed One's glory given by the Holy One, Blessed Be He, to the Prophets. You have already heard, however, that the truth of the Blessed One's essence and perfection in itself is entirely unfathomable to us, and that He can be perceived only in terms of His acts and in terms of the attributes He established for Himself, for the governance of His world, as we explained. The prophets will perceive Him then as a bestowing good, punishing, being merciful, judging, giving life, healing, and in terms of all the other attributes ascribed to him in points of his acts. And he will reveal to them all his providences in all of their manifestations, and they will see all of their workings, upon which hinge the laws of heaven and earth and all of their hosts, in all of their details. They will therefore know the past and the future of the workings of the Holy One, blessed be he, in the world. For when they perceive him as acting through a particular attribute, they will perceive all of the results deriving from this in all of the creations. They will perceive him as acting through the attribute preceding this, and they will perceive him in, as acting through the attribute following this, in the totality of its details. But they will not perceive his pure essence, and even the perception that they are granted will not be perfectly clear, but characteristics of them 
nature of prophetic visions. This is what I want to know. What is the nature of such visions? It is stated explicitly in Hosea 12, 11. I have spoken in similarities to the prophets. In respect to Moses, our teacher, may peace be upon him. It is written in Numbers 12, verse 8, by sight and not through riddles, from which it may be inferred that the others were spoken to through riddles, as it is in fact written also from Numbers. I shall speak to him, any prophet other than Moses, in a dream, to wit, the tradition of our sages, uh, and I quote from Brachot 57b, a dream is one sixtieth of a prophetic vision. That is, the prophets were not permitted to witness the supreme glory openly, but that glory which was revealed to them aroused in their hearts prophetic visions, which were like cloaks and riddles in respect to those things they were to be made cognizant of, as in as is the case with parables and riddles in general. The manner of their perfection, perception, however, does not correspond to the natural intellectual perception of man, but their perception is a kind of influx, an engraved cognition, which is not subject to doubt, and which does not demand reflection or empirical reinforcement. But it is clear to them beyond any doubt that what is being revealed to them is what is communicating with them is the glory of the Blessed One, and that it is He who is awakening these prophetic visions in their hearts, and there is etched into their hearts likewise the knowledge whereby they will unravel the vision and the riddle, and whereby they will perceive what the Creator wishes to reveal to them. This was stated in effect by Maimonides of Blessed Memory, in Mishnah Torah, Yesodeh Torah, chapter 7, verse 3, Mishnah 3, prophecy comes to the prophets by way of simile, the meaning of the simile being immediately etched into his heart along with the prophetic vision, so that he knows what it purports. <clears throat> A distinction is to be made between similes of attributes and similes of results. That is, there are some similes in which the supreme glory is figured, in terms of its attributes and acts, and there are others which prefigure what will be done by the Lord. For example, when the Blessed One desires to reveal His glory to the Prophet in respect to His goodness and mercy, He may appear to him as an old man, as it is written in Daniel 7 verse 9, and the Ancient of Days was sitting. <coughs> And when he desires to manifest himself as a hero victorious over his enemies, he may appear as a youthful warrior, as our sages have stated in the Mechilta Nitro 20 verse 2. He appeared at the sea as a youth, and at Mount Sinai as an old man. For a youth is fit for war, and an old man is for presiding, as interpreted in Chagiga 14a. But the similes of prefigured acts are of the nature and the, of the almond staff of Jeremiah, and the seething cauldron, the ladder of Jacob, the scroll of Ezekiel, the measure of Zechariah, and the golden candelabra. With respect to the similes of attributes, as soon as the supreme glory appears to the prophet in its particular form, he perceives the meaning of the vision, but with respect to the similes of prefigured acts, it is possible for their meaning not to be perceived until it is revealed. As it is written in Zechariah 4 verse 5, Do you not know what these are? And I said, No, my master. In these visions, it is possible for a multiplicity of figures to appear, even simultaneous, mutually contradictory figures, as our sages teach us in Sophrim 16 verse 2, face to face did the Lord speak with you. Face two and two faces, four faces together, an awesome face for scripture, an ordinary face, for Mishnah, a smiling face, for Talmud, an ingratiating face, for Agada, and similarly, Yalkut Shimoni, Yithro 28, 6, I am the Lord your God. Rab Chama ben Papa said, 
the Holy One, blessed be he, showed them an angry face, an ingratiating face. He said to them, Though you see all of these figures, I am the Lord your God. This corresponds to what the sages stated in reference to speech. And I quote from Yushalmi Nadarim 3.2, The nakedness of your brother's wife and her husband's brother shall live with her was stated in one pronouncement. Remember and observe were stated in one pronouncement. The reason is apparent. Since these figures are not aspects of reality, but created prophetic revelations, it inheres in the will of the king, who said, and it came into being, that these figures impress themselves upon the prophet's soul. He can certainly create figures as he wills, and is completely independent of those material natural laws which were made for corporeal entities alone. But this is certain, none of the Lord's words are in vain, God forbid, but every figure he reveals to the prophet is designed to re represent one of the blessed one's attributes or one of the aspects of these attributes. And when he desires to reveal to him a variety of aspects, he will reveal to him a variety of figures, though they will be mutually contradictory, the end of the prophecy being not the revealed figure, but the meaning extracted by the prophet from that figure. But the verse in Deuteronomy 4 verse 15 says, For you did not see any form. This creates great difficulty for me. For it goes against all that you have said. And even without what I have said, it is not difficult that verses contradict each other. One verse states, and I quote, For you did not see any form. And another, from Numbers 12.8, I quote, And he looks upon the form of the Lord. And yet another, from Ezekiel 1 verse 26, A figure as that of man above him, and the like. Answer both questions. It is written in Yeshaya 40 verse 25, And to whom will you liken and compare me, says the Lord? And also from Yeshaya, And to whom will you liken God, and what figure will you invest him with? The understanding is that the Holy One, blessed be he, certainly does not lead the prophet astray, but makes him wise and apprises him of the truth. For the Holy One, blessed be he, to show him figures where, to the contrary, figures should be shunned, would constitute the greatest of stumbling blocks. But the truth is that the soul of the prophet perceives the truth clearly. As you have already heard, the perception and knowledge of the prophet do not correspond to natural perception and knowledge, but they are implanted and engraved in him in such a way that his knowledge is absolutely clear and free of any doubt. It is a kind of knowledge that is completely unfathomable by a natural man. Accordingly, the soul of the prophet grasps every prophetic message according to its truth. That is, it is clear that it is the Creator who is appearing to him and revealing to it whatever he is revealing. And it is equally clear to it that he cannot be seen, not alone by the natural eye, but even through spiritual perception, which is nothing more than apprehension and understanding, for the soul cannot fathom the Blessed One. And it is clear to it that the revealed glory originates in it, a created prophetic figure from which it extracts the knowledge that it must receive, as in the aforementioned verse, and I quote from Hosea 12 verse 11, I have spoken in similes by the prophets. The truth is perfectly clear then to the soul of the prophets, and there is no room for error, for the true knowledge is engraved in it, and all this truth is apparent in it, so that the soul will not perceive a prophetic figure without perceiving at the same time that it is only a prophetic figure and not the essence of the Creator himself. Therefore, though it is written, I have spoken in similes by the prophets, the exhortation is always, and what figure will you invest him with? For the pro prophet does not see a figure without also seeing that it is a prophetic figure, not a real essence, adapted to the understanding of the prophet, which understanding cannot conceive of the pure essence of the Blessed One.
completely abstracted of all likeness. Accordingly, Moses, our teacher of blessed memory, exhorts Israel, and I quote from Deuteronomy 4.15, for you did not see any form. For he is speaking there of the pure essence of the Creator and is telling them, take extreme heed, for you have already perceived this truth. You have seen that you did not see any form in the Blessed One, but to the contrary, you saw, because of his pure essence is free of all form, that you could not perceive him until he created prophetic figures for you. The verse is slightly abbreviated, but not more so than the others. And to whom will you liken and compare me? And what figure will you invest him with? For Moses, our teacher of blessed memory, was speaking with Israel, who had witnessed this entire truth, and he was reminding them of what they had seen in truth. You have explained, for you did not see any form, but not, and he looks upon the form of the Lord. Even that figure that appears to the soul of the prophet is aptly termed the form of the Lord. But there is no doubt in the minds of the prophets that what is revealed to them this is disguised in that figure is none other than the one creator, blessed be he, and blessed be his name. And for this reason they can say with full conviction, and I quote from Ezekiel 1 verse 28, it is the figure of the glory of the Lord. And also in Isaiah 6 verse 1, and I saw the Lord. For in their influx of perception it is clear to them that the figure they are seeing originates in the revelation to them of the supreme glory and that the form is only the means by which they attain this revelation of the Blessed One. To what may this be compared? To one seeing his friend in a mirror. Though he, the essence of his friend is not in that mirror, what he sees is indeed only his friend who appears to him through the agency of the mirror. A corollary of this is that if the mirror is distorted, the image of his friend will be correspondingly distorted. Now, there will be no doubt in the mind of the viewer that the body he sees in the mirror is not the body of his friend standing there, but he will know that when he sees his friend stand before that distorted mirror and he looks in the mirror, such an image will present itself to him. The same is true in our case. The prophet knows that it is the Creator who is revealing himself to him in that vision, even though that vision materializes before his eyes, before the eyes of the prophet through the agency of his soul itself, or through whatever agency he is caused to perceive that figure. He can, therefore, justly refer to it as the form of the Lord, and it may be said of him, and he looks upon the form of the Lord. But this creates a difficulty. For according to what you say, there is no difference between the prophecy of Moses, our teacher, and that of the other prophets. All seeing this form, and all seeing that the Blessed One has no form, in terms of his true essence. I shall tell you the difference between Moses, our teacher, and the other prophets. The other prophets could not behold even this figure completely, it being visible to them only as behind walls or as being reflected in many mirrors, or as in an unpolished mirror. As our sages explained this in relation to this verse itself, and I quote from Midrash Rabbah on Vayikra 1 verse 14, what is the difference between Moses and the other prophets? Rabbi Yehuda said, all of the prophets saw through nine mirrors, and Moses saw, saw through one. And the rabbis say, all of the prophets saw through a besmirched mirror, and Moses saw through a polished mirror. In view of the fact that even the figures seen by them could not see well, they could not assimilate it completely, and so their comprehension of its meaning too was imperfect. And this stands to reason, the Holy One, blessed be He, revealed those figures to them only for the sake of the idea implicit in the prophetic figure so that when they saw the figure they would perceive the idea comprehended in it in all of its parts. But if they could perceive only a little of the figure itself, it is certain that its corresponding idea could not be perfectly perceived by them in all of its parts, but only in a little of it, corresponding to the little that they observed of the figure. 
Moses, however, at least perceived the prophetic figure clearly. His knowledge was therefore perfect in terms of the possibilities of human cognition, and he attained the highest possible level of prophetic knowledge. But he too perceived only what was, he was permitted to perceive. This is evident. I should apprise you of yet another facet of the prophetic vision that we find that prophets see these prophetic figures, they are not required to see them through the vision of the physical eye, but through spiritual vision. One object may be seen both to the physical eye and by the spirit abstracted from the body, and both may confirm it as being that object, although each sees it in its own way. For the spirit can see what is in the cask and what is within the wall whereas the physical eye cannot, because of the nature of its vision, which enables it to perceive things only within the limits prescribed by the Creator. But the cask itself will be seen by the physical eye in its way and confirmed as a cask, and by the spirit in its own way, and likewise confirmed as a cask. The same is true here. The prophets need not see the image called lion and the image called the eagle, as quoted from Ezekiel 10.14 and the like, and as the eye of the flesh sees them, but through the agency of spiritual vision. This is evidence. I still would like to know why these forms are needed at all. What will be lacking if the Holy One, blessed be He, revealed whatever He desired of knowledge or of future states without resorting to a figure at all. I could answer you quite simply by saying that the Holy One, blessed be He, desired, desired to reveal Himself to men in the ways of men, as we have already explained. For the creations in their very form reflect heavenly providences and attributes, being actual exemplars of them. The Holy One, blessed be He, therefore reveals his glory to the prophet in the figure created by it for the image below is but an example of the corresponding providence and attribute above and note that this too is one of the blessed one's attributes the embodiment of the aspects of his providence and attributes within terrestrial forms in such a way that the form may serve as, as an exemplar of these aspects and the Creator established an entire order whereby the created images could adequately serve as exemplars of the heavenly aspects they were designed to reflect, so that there is a proper integral reason for all of the parts of the image of the creations, none of them being arbitrary, but all growing out of this root, that heavenly spiritual factors be reflected in the lowly forms of the creations themselves, and it is of the majesty of the supreme glory that the prophets see these heavenly factors only as they are related to the creations themselves and reflected in them as we explained. There is something even deeper here, however, and that is the order and the agency resorted to by the Creator for the embodiment of the aspects of providence within terrestrial forms, as we explained contribute largely to the existence of these creations in all of their forms. For example, because the Holy One desired to embody the idea of his providence in the configuration of an eye, man therefore has an eye, and because he wished to embody the attributes of his providence, love and kindness, justice and mercy, in the color conf configurations of white, red and green, respectively man's eyes therefore possess these three colors. And if he had not desired to embody these factors in this way, man would not possess these organs and parts, but others. This is evident. Likewise, with respect to all of the other characteristics of the creations and their qualities, and their assertion at one time in one manner and at another in another, creating the variation and condition in all created objects, all of this is the function of the manner in which the Creator desires to embody heavenly factors in the forms and structure of the creations. This emerges then as a root principle for the creations and their accidents. Therefore, the Creator reveals His glory to the Prophet through these figures, 
so that he may understand the corresponding providential attributes and he embodied them likewise in terrestrial forms so that he might perceive and understand well the effect of the heavenly providences upon the terrestrial creatures through the composite images orders of the image and through its distinctive elements so that the prophets may see through spiritual vision as we explained a figure of great and small lights descending or descending mobile or stationary and many figures corresponding to terrestrial forms as we find in scripture and through these they will reflect upon and gain a knowledge of the orders of the heavenly providence and the governance in all of their orders and the nature of the attribute to which the figures relate is derived from an understanding of the form itself. For example, a circular, all-encompassing form, possessing neither right nor left, neither top nor bottom, will allude to a general idea embracing in equal measure all that is subsumed within it, whereas a straight form, delimited as to right, left and middle, and possessing a head and a base will allude to a specific structured idea embracing those affected by it in a top to bottom gradation and similarly with respect to distinctive elements it will allude to an orientation towards the right or towards the left and so with all of the other forms that is this entire lowly world is supervised by the supreme will through a general providence which forwards its existence and in this respect of existence there is no difference between the species and, spe and other species or between one man and another the highest spheres require existence as much as the tiniest insects the blessed one's providence then embraces all of the creations equally all being sustained by him and maintained through his power but the judicial providence relating to divine service is a multi is multi detailed for the blessed one weighs everything in just scales for good or evil each according to its specific nature so that when the creator desires to reveal to his prophets his great power which maintains the entire creation and his all encompassing providence which embraces all equally none ignored by or hidden from his all-seeing eye he will show the prophet a light as it were emanating from himself and encompassing the entire universe as the firmament encompasses the earth on all of its sides and as it is written in ezekiel 1 verse 22 and a figure above the heads of the beast a firmament and when he desires to reveal his justice to them he will appear to them as a king seated upon his throne righteousness as his right hand and justice in his left to judge all of his creations in the justice of his righteousness and if he desires to reveal to them the specific forces regulating the universe one in conjunction with the other as our sages have stated in Chagiga 12b on what does the earth stand on the pillars and the pillars on the water and all are held in the arms of the holy one blessed be he he will show the prophet many spheres one within another each outer sphere turning its inner and the world at its center and he the blessed one superintending and maintaining all and when he desires to reveal to him the graded interrelationship of all the forces one issuing from another and the lowly world assuming from issuing from all as we explained he will show him many levels one beneath the other and the world under all and when he desired to reveal to him the contrast between the levels of those closer to the blessed one and those removed from him in the order of their levels and according to those qualities themselves that are closer to his perfection and those which are more removed from him which relate more to the terrestrial plane he will show him many levels one contained within the other as a chamber within a chamber or one garment atop another 
and the lowly world outside all, further removed from than all. What is more, he will show him all of these visions simultaneously, if he desires to reveal to him all of these things that we have mentioned and their ramifications at one time, though they contradict one another, as the aforementioned quote from Yerushalmi Nidarim 3 verse 2, the nakedness of your brother's wife and her husband's brother shall live with her. Remember and observe, which were stated in one pronouncement. For what is above nature is not restricted by the laws of nature. And even in a dream, which is likewise a kind of prophecy, as our stages have stated in Brachot 57b, a dream is one sixtieth of a prophetic vision. Something of this nature occurs, forms being visualized in a manner which bears no relationship to the visualization of waking hours and the dream images replacing each other in an instant, the mode of transition being entirely unperceived, so that one may construe a figure in his dream as, I quote, Reuven, and the next instant as a house or a stone. In short, configurations will be formed in a manner entirely foreign to the normal processes of vision. How much more so will it obtain in prophecy, which is completely outside the realm of nature, that the Holy One, blessed be He, will cause His prophets to see what He wills, as we explained previously. You have greatly satisfied me with these words. Before we conclude, however, let me ask you a small thing which is not absolutely crucial, but which it will give me great pleasure to understand. Ask. The idea of creation, is it or is it not possible to understand how something emerged from nothing? I have already told you that it is impossible for us to understand how the Holy One, blessed be He, acts. That is, the manner in which He performs His acts. We can only inquire as to what He acts upon as and to the order in which he acts. Now, as to your question, this matter that he originated an absolute original, created by him in his exalted omnipotence, is in a manner which we cannot fathom. What we can understand is the order in which he acted to originate it, for in understanding this we understand only the stages of the act. Let us say then, as to the creation of this matter, that it certainly pre-existed in the essence of the Blessed One, that He could create it and that He would create it. For we cannot ascribe to the Blessed One any addition or alteration at all, as in saying that He originated something that did not exist in Him before, but the creation of this matter pre-existed in His will. This, however, cannot even be regarded as the existence of the world in potential, for there is no relation between the Blessed One's pure essence and His creation. Or cre creation. All that can be attributable to Him, His creations, Him being entirely attributable to His essence. It is only when He actually willed to originate this matter that He originated varieties of providence in whose nature was implicit the materialization of this matter and which bore a relationship to this matter, having been originated only in the magnitude sufficient for the materialization of this matter. Now, as to these varieties of providence, I have already indicated to you that they, ma that they manifest themselves in successive gradation, and that the only level of providence that can be considered the immediate cause of this matter, as we know it today, is the very last and most inferior of all. I have already explained this to you in detail. It is seen then that at the very inception of the first providence there existed in its nature the materialization of matter. Matter then can be regarded as being included within it, for it was implicit in its nature and it was originated only for the sake of matter, but it was still a distant cause being far more noble and exalted than what was required for the existence of lowly matter. The second providence was a more immediate cause, matter being implicit in its nature and nearer to materialization than in the first providence, and so on, through all of the providences originated for it. 
emerging finally from the very last. The first providence then is nothing other than the existence of this matter projected by the Blessed One with greater intensity than is necessary for its actual materialization. The second providence likewise is the existence of this matter projected with less intensity than the first, for the providences are nothing other than the existence of entities emanating from and projected upon the, by the Blessed One. As long as it is an emanation from Him and has not materialized in actuality, it is referred to as providence from Him. And when the providence materializes in actuality in the form of a creation, it is referred to as a result. It is seen then that the providences and the results are essentially one and the same. It is just that the providences are the generality of his ordinance and the results, the creations proceeding from this ordinance, but his ordinance itself is of the nature of all his other attributes which are inscrutable in themselves such as his knowledge his remembering and his mercy all of these are not distinct from his essence unlike our knowledge remembering and mercy but they are providences which we perceive through their effects these effects being none other than the origination of these creations and their emergence into interdependent existence from the Blessed One's emanation. This should suffice for your question. I greatly rejoice in my lot in having acquired from you great profound ideas which have solidified my conviction in the true perfect faith in respect to all those things that every adherent of the faith of Moses and Israel must be resolved in. Peace unto Israel. Praised is the Lord forever. Amen. Amen.